Dreams. A Fay Fantasy Romance. Written by Misha Quinn. All Rights Reserved, 2023. Book Cover by Misha Quinn and Book Brush Templates, 2023. Auto narrated audio files created on Mike Monster's resource by using Pro Max license, 2023. Scene 1. Running. I ran through the dark forest. My hair fluttered around my shoulders, my breath coming out of my open mouth like the breath of a hunted doe. The trees reached out their branches toward me, trying to grab and hold me. Their leaves, wet from the recent rain, whipped at my cheeks, and I tried unsuccessfully to shield my face with my hands. My thin, soaked dress was clinging to my body, making moving difficult. The hem of the dress was torn to shreds. The light leather boots that clung tightly to my feet were soaked with dew, and my footsteps on the mossy forest grounds, where tree roots and boulders were intricately intertwined, were problematic. I felt like I was no longer breathing but sobbing, choking on tears of pain and despair. How did I get here? Where shall I run to? Where could I hide from my pursuer in this enchanted forest, where everything seemed to want to stop me? I looked around and noticed a beam of light. It was ahead and a little away from the direction I had just run. It gave me strength. I lifted the hem of my dress with one hand, turned that way, and, careful not to step on tree roots and moss-covered rocks, ran forward, toward the gap between the tree trunks, toward the clearing. I hoped there would be a clearing. I ran there, toward the light, with all my fading strength, one hand holding the hem of my dress and the other pulling apart the branches of the bushes that were tearing the remains of my dress and leaving bloody scratches on my body. But the forest behind me was not silent. The intermittent breathing of something vast and incomprehensible, inspiring me with inexpressible terror, still followed me as it had at the beginning of my escape. This heavy breathing behind me was heard nearer and nearer, and the footsteps of my pursuer grew louder and louder. The forest crackled with his movement, and nothing in this forest hindered his advance in the hunt for me. I turned and sprinted forward toward the light. I ran, stumbling over the mossy bumps, falling, rising, and rushing forward again. But my legs suddenly felt like cotton. I thought I was running as fast as possible, but my pursuer was approaching me quicker and faster. I could hear his footsteps and his breathing so close that he would catch up with me in a few seconds. As I ran out into the clearing, I stopped and clutched both hands to my chest, trying to keep my breath from whooshing out of my chest. The sound of my pursuer was gone, and there was a faint hope in my soul that I could escape him. Behind the clearing was the same dark wall of the forest that I could no longer be in. There was no one to be seen at the edge of the woods, only bushes and tall, centuries-old trees, spruces, pines, and shrubs. Suddenly, a thin ray of light penetrated through the trees, the setting sun touching my cheek to say goodbye. A ray of sunlight illuminated the clearing, and even though my life was in danger, I could not hold back a sigh of delight, or was it a sob of increased hope of getting out of there? The middle of the clearing was filled with unusually bright blue-purple flowers. They carpeted the entire space, leaving no room for any other color. The green of the forest around the clearing was dark, almost black. But here, there was an unusually bright blue color. It seemed as if someone had lit a blue fire here as this carpet of blue colors blazed in the forest's darkness. That picture gave me strength. If I'm to die, let it be in the light. Let it be in the light. I want to see the one who is after me. I deserve to see my murderer. I'm not afraid of him now. 
What made me think that whoever was chasing me would kill me? I did not know. Fear and survival instinct drove me through the woods, taking all the logic out of my mind. I looked back and stared deep into the dark forest, then turned and stepped carefully through the carpet of blue flowers to the middle of the clearing. I stopped and slowly turned to face the forest the direction I had come from. In the forest's darkness, breaking branches could be heard again, as if some powerful beast were charging through the thicket. Yes, the beast was getting closer to its target. His prey, I was right here, in the middle of this magical clearing. The beast was coming toward me through the thicket of this enchanted forest, and there was nothing more I could do to save my life and perhaps the lives of those I loved. I straightened to my petite stature, proudly shook my red hair mane, and squared my shoulders. What will be will be. You cannot escape your fate, so face it with an open mind and a smile. No one and nothing can break me, especially now that I have this key to open my secret casket. I touched a small iron key, its handle intricately decorated with filigree. The key hung from a simple hemp rope, but it was much heavier than it looked and felt like a heavy necklace on my chest. I clenched my hand with the key into a fist and, with the back of my other palm, ran the back of my hand over my face as if to brush away the veil of fear and despair. I knew there was no turning back now. I stepped on this path without realizing what my life would become. So I must go all the way and endure all the trials. I must take them. Either I can handle them, or now my life is over. And then the thicket at the edge of the forest parted, and a monster emerged into the clearing I could not bear to see. It was a massive man with muscles that seemed sculpted from twisted tree roots. I realized what awaited me if I fell into his terrible hands, would not live. I took a step back, and he was already at my side. I did not have the strength to run anymore, so I just closed my eyes. I had been so brave just a few seconds ago. Still, now that he was standing before me, my courage evaporated, and I was left with just an animal desire to live. I won't give in to his hands, no. I touched the key again and squeezed it in my palm, trying to do it discreetly. After that, I just froze in front of the giant. This monster had won the race. The tree-molded giant stood before me, his breath blowing a stream of hot air downward through my hair. Oddly, besides that hot breath, he did not smell disgusting, which did not fit how horrible he looked. I opened my eyes, unsure of what he was waiting for, and I saw his hand or, what you might call a hand in front of me. He held out his hand, more like an oak branch, and waited for me to put my hand in his. What else is he up to? Does he want to torture me more before he dies? I thought frantically, trying to find a way out of this situation. I could not run anymore. I did not have the strength for it. However, I was not willing to surrender to this creature. And who does he serve? He'll probably kill me for breaking my treaty with the magician. Or, at the very least, take me to the thunder, and I'll go straight to the dungeon of his castle. I did not see any dungeons in the castle. Still, they had to be there, they had some means of punishment other than magically transforming into an undesirable creature like a frog, did not they? The sarcasm was out of place, but it just asked for my reasoning, which seemed to drag on forever. These intense musings did not take more than a few seconds. But even those seconds were seconds of my life or a relatively free part. For now, I was still free from the presence of that abhorrent husband, the supreme fay named Thunder. Still clutching my key, I took another step backward, stumbled on a wet, slippery bump, and fell back into a sea of blue flowers. That's it. I'm done.
That was the last thought I remembered. The stupefying smell of those flowers came over me. My ears rumbled, and I saw a bright tunnel of light twisting and narrowing before my eyes. My eyes closed, and I fell into darkness as if slowly falling into an abyss. I woke up and opened my eyes. I was in bed, many stories above the metropolis and its park, in the center of my supermodern city. I sat on the bed, threw back the blanket, stood up, and walked over to the park window. The yellow lights of the nighttime street lamps glowed soothingly in the alleys and streets around the garden below. Yellow cabs passed by occasionally, appearing like small boxes from my height. There were hardly any passers-by on the streets. That meant it was early morning, and the pre-dawn silence of the vast city was filled with the anticipation of its awakening. At this time, only I was awake. Glancing at the clock on the wall, in the light from the street lamps on the room wall, I could see that it was four o'clock in the morning. No wonder there were no passers-by downstairs, all ordinary people were asleep. The tall houses on the opposite side of the park had no glowing windows. I stepped away from the window and stared thoughtfully at my bed. The memories of my recent love came flooding back, and everything in this world is transitory. Even though many songs talk about eternal love, there is nothing eternal in my world. And so my first husband and my happiness passed. My favorite man, a billionaire and an agent of special services, disappeared from my life. Or rather, I decided that we have no future with him. It was excruciating, but I needed to regain my respect and self-confidence. Since my husband and I separated and divorced, I have rebuilt my life. But I will talk about that some other time because it was all still painful. So these strange dreams kept me going, and I did not know the reason for them and wrote it all off to my nerves, upset after my husband and I broke up. Scene 2. Strange Dreams I started having these weird dreams a couple of weeks ago. In one dream, I was being chased by some horrible satyr. He tried grabbing me with his greedy hands and carrying me into the dark forest. In another dream, I stood in the dark over a mountain precipice. Then I fell into its bottomless abyss, spreading my arms apart like a bird. This falling in the dream was repeated repeatedly, driving me crazy. The feeling of flying was almost as real as when I was a teenager. Back then, doctors attributed these dream flights to the active growth of the body. But now I am an adult. Why such dreams and these strange sensations? I did not bother my parents that my sleep had become intermittent and restless. I just tried to get some sleep during the day, without them noticing. My dad and mom visited me regularly, and I saw their house. I do not know if mom caught anything, but she did not ask me anything, and I could talk to her without fear of giving away my secret my nightmares. Two other beings, very close to me, indeed saw my torment. They were my dogs, Maddie and Tommy. The little furballs, two Pomeranians, lay on the sofa with me during the day and quietly snoozed, guarding my daytime sleep. I did not have nightmares during the day. However, daytime sleep was no substitute for a good night's sleep, and dark circles formed under my eyes. But fortunately, after a few days, my dreams finally became more regular, increasingly lucid, and lucid. The chasing stopped, and soon, I was sleeping better. But I still had a bad feeling about it. Something was changing in the world or myself, and I did not know what it was. Thinking about the changes in my life in recent months, the separation from my husband that I started, my apartment in one of the most prestigious neighborhoods of our city, and my new business, I often remembered my grandmother Lily. She was my favorite grandmother and taught me a lot. 
Besides her reputation as the fairest grandmother in the world, Grandma Lily had the gift of foreseeing events. It was likely that other relatives said that she was a witch. However, I did not believe in it and considered such conversations fiction. Just Grandmother Lily was by nature an excellent psychologist and understood people well. I thought she had no magic and no special powers. Grandma Lily was careful not to touch the subject when discussing this topic. She told me. When you grow up, it will come to you if you have some ability or gift. You don't have to do anything. Just try to live so that your conscience is always clear. Fortunately, live in full accordance with your beliefs, which in our family are strict. I wanted to know if I could become a good witch like my grandmother Lily. Some relatives told me these peculiarities were passed on in our family through the female line but only to some women. I noticed nothing like that in my mom. She was terrific, understanding, loving, and caring, but I did not see any witchy qualities in her. So it was Grandma Lily that I needed right now. It was a pity that she was so far away now, she had left to live in her mansion, far away from here, in a remote suburb of our metropolis. My grandmother did not use a cell phone on principle, who can imagine that nowadays? She said she did not need it. Grandma already knew her relatives and friends so well over the decades that she did not need every second contact through all these modern communication channels. When we needed support or advice, she always appeared as if from the ground and listened to our sorrows and achievements. Immersed in thoughts of my strange dreams, Grandma Lily, and my ex-husband, I returned to bed. I fell into it, burrowing my face into the pillow before I realized I had fallen asleep. When I woke up, I thought I would start this new day with a clean slate and that my strange dreams would finally leave me alone. But that very day, an event happened that changed my whole life. Dreams Scene 3 Stranger at the Door It was a beautiful summer morning. The sun rose above the horizon, and bright yellow-orange light flooded everything around us, the skyscrapers, the park below our balcony, and the beautiful view of the sea bay beyond. I was having breakfast on the balcony of my luxury apartment, where my dogs and I lived. The dogs sat beside me at the table, their pink tongues sticking out, watching lustfully as I slowly buttered the hot croissants, then added leaf lettuce, thinly sliced sausage, a slice of cheese, and a piece of paprika to the butter. I prepared all this for breakfast but not for Maddie and Tony. But there was never a time when my pets left breakfast without a slice of such a treat. No one could withstand their pleading looks of interest. They knew the sight of them would not deter me and would undoubtedly give them slices of our croissant. The sun was shining, and there were no clouds in the sky. I thought this was how every day with my ex-husband should start, it should be bright, clear, and sunny, and everything on the table should be delicious, food, drinks, and coffee. I relaxed, looked at the rising sun, and breathed the fresh morning air, not yet tainted by the exhaust fumes of many cars. As I thought about the ordeal my ex-husband and I had been through, I remembered what he looked like. I felt like he was sitting right there next to me, watching me tease our dogs with a slice of sausage. Yes, Pomeranians were supposed to be our dogs, not just my dogs. I saw my ex like it was real. He was still just as gorgeous as he was when I first saw him. He was the CEO of a vast corporation and my boss back then. And I was just a girl who came to them looking for a summer job. That was how it all began. Now, it seemed like a long time ago. But here he was, sitting in front of me, and even now, 
I could not believe he was not there. In my mind, he was still with me forever. I mean, my ex-husband was so attractive. Many women would have given a lot to get his attention. And they did not understand what he found in me, such an ordinary-looking, unremarkable young woman. However, that was a long time ago. A dull woman turned into a glamorous businesswoman, and now no one noticed any difference in our social status. So, as I sat on the vast open terrace as if floating above the metropolis, the intercom at the front door of my apartment rang. I was not expecting anyone, but our porter, Matthew, called me occasionally. I got up from my chair nonchalantly, walked to the intercom in the hallway, and asked. Hey Matthew, what's up? Even though I had heard no voice on the intercom yet, I assumed our porter was ringing it. His small office was on the first floor of our house. Matthew usually sat behind a handsome desk in the massive hallway by the elevators during his office hours, from 9 to 6. Yes, it has to be said that I have never been a fan of elevator rides. I was not afraid of heights, but riding in a transparent box to the height of the tenth floor was not one of my favorites. Since my apartment was at that height, I was forced to use the elevator because of the dogs. I wanted to choose it after a while. Still, when I walked in and saw the vastness that opened in front of me from its windows and terrace, my prejudice against the high floor evaporated. And, of course, even if I had chosen an apartment, for example, on the third floor, it would not have helped me to walk the dogs without problems. After all, our little pets could not jump from step to step on many floors up and down, and even several times a day. I wanted to find out what our porter wanted to report on and continue with my breakfast. But Matthew's voice, which greeted me cheerfully on the intercom, sounded a little unusual. Something had agitated him. The receptionist asked. Dear Mrs. Ella, are you expecting someone to visit? You have a visitor. But I could not make out his name, though I asked twice. This gentleman wishes to speak only to you and immediately. What shall I do, send him away, or will you come down and find out who he is and what he wants? When I answered, I sounded an understanding of Matthew's problems and mild irritation. I was used to the idea that visitors had to give advance notice of their visit. I could not stand people who showed up without agreeing on a time and place to meet, even more so at my house. Of course, my address was not a secret. It could be found out from official sources, after all, I was the founder of a business that had grown from zero to a solid size. And now, I regret not having classified my data when I sold my business. But I could not change my place every time I changed jobs. I gathered my feelings into a fist and answered more calmly. I'm not expecting anyone. But of course, I'll go downstairs since this gentleman is insistent on seeing me. Wait a little while. I'll be down in the hall in a moment. With those words, I got up and walked to the hallway. I wore decent home clothes, college-type sweatpants and a loose cotton t-shirt. The tank top was my ex-husband's. I had bought it for him once, but he did not like white clothes, except for business shirts, which he had stopped wearing long ago because he had sold his company and moved on to work for our government's secret service. So I got a white t-shirt and was happy to wear it at home. It was nice to know that I was wearing something that belonged to him at least his shirt. I could provide everything else, housing, income, and cars. But my husband's things, which had touched his body and were now mine, were more precious to me than all the other delights of a comfortable and well-off life. So, in a t-shirt and sweatpants, wearing cozy knitted home Japanese flip-flops, I went to the elevator. The dogs broke from their seats and ran toward me with a little squeal. 
They were not as excited as they usually were when I left the house, and they stayed. Something about their whining seemed unnecessary to me. They were unusually keen as if they knew I was going for a walk without them. But I dismissed such thoughts, chalking them up to my morning sleepiness and lack of coffee to sharpen my perception of reality. Looking at the dogs, I told them affectionately. Now, 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 don't you worry so much, I'll be right back. I turned and walked out of the apartment. Yes, a stranger's visit messed up my morning plans. But who could it be? I thought, pressing the button to call the elevator car. I said it to myself, but aloud. I often spoke my thoughts aloud. If someone caught me doing it, many people would be surprised but then blame it on my introversion. I stepped into the elevator, pressed the first floor button, and the elevator car slid downward, gently gaining momentum. I felt like I was flying low, like in my recent nightmares. Yes, I forgot to say that when I used this elevator alone, whose transparent walls and its sliding caused me an unpleasant sensation, I would close my eyes and stand like that in its cabin until I felt it stop. Even dogs in it helped chase away this unpleasant feeling, not to mention people, neighbors, my family, or friends. When I used this transparent elevator alone, for example, when I arrived at my floor, I would linger inside the elevator for a couple of seconds, trying to recover and ensure the doors had opened and I was safe. Yeah, maybe I'm just afraid of heights. I have to admit it after all, I thought, closing my eyes and listening to the noise of the air in the elevator shaft that flowed around the elevator cabin. Finally, the elevator stopped, and I opened my eyes. The doors opened, and I saw the stranger who had been so eager to talk to me. A tall, elderly man stood in the center of my building's foyer hallway, right in front of the elevator doors. He wore a light gray overcoat with a gray jacket and a steel-colored gray tie tied at the collar of a white shirt. In one hand, he held an elegant cane with a gilded pommel. He had a wide-brimmed hat, something like a white Stetson, only with a slightly shorter brim, more suited to the city. The cane stick was made of mahogany, and it was custom-made. Made of metal, the head of the cane was adorned with the head of a monster resembling a fairy dragon. The part of the cane that rested on the floor was made like a crocodile's paw, its surface was decorated with scales or a pattern like the scales or armor of a crocodile. The unexpected visitor looked like a character from a movie screen of the fifties of the last century, the twentieth. His pants were also light gray, and their cut was rather loose, emphasizing his thinness. A massive leather belt supported the pants. Like the Highlanders, a strange metal buckle on the belt was made in the national dress style. Or so it seemed to me. This belt buckle was dissonant with the look of a city dandy. Yes, the man was wearing expensive-looking leather shoes. The stranger's hair was long, almost to his shoulders, slightly wavy, and completely white. The man looked relatively thin, almost haggard. Dark shadows beneath his gray eyes were covered by gray eyebrows raised in surprise, showing that he was tired and troubled. I regarded the guest and became increasingly amazed. I don't know who is standing in front of me. What does he want with me? I thought, still hesitant to speak to him first. I used to have one acquaintance who looked a bit like this man, the chief, but it was not him. That is right. It was not the chief. Neither I nor, as I remembered, my ex-husband had been in a relationship with the chief for a long time, though we often reminisced about him. The chief was the so-called grey general of the corporation my husband owned and operated when we met. Nothing and no one escaped the attention of the wise and experienced in corporate games and intrigue chief, who had worked for this corporation for over thirty years. 
the chief was the best advisor to my then boss. And to me, the chief became a mentor who wanted to use me to his advantage to influence his boss. The chief, intelligent and experienced in life, was the first person in my future husband's entourage to realize that he had fallen in love with me, a simple corporate employee who had just joined their company. According to his philosophy, this information had to be used for his purposes, one of which was to know everything that lives and breathes his boss. Because then the boss could be manipulated a bit to his advantage. These memories kept me in their nets, even though I should have said hello to my guest long ago, if only out of simple courtesy. Finally, the man stopped looking at me, his scrutinizing gaze becoming focused. He was the first to break the long silence. I'm happy to see you, Ella, he said in a thick baritone, at the same time taking off his hat and bowing to me as if he were at a reception at some royal court. I had seen such behavior only in movies about the Middle Ages, with the obligatory scenery of fortified castles of noble knights, their retinues, and kings. The man stared at me expectantly, his eyes seeming to bore into me. I had to wake up from my thoughts and answer him. Good afternoon, uh, what's your name? I said, looking up at the man in surprise. My name is Voldemar, he said, with absolutely no intention of adding any last name to his name. If that's the case, I won't ask his last name. It's not like he's here for my past business, I decided and did not ask him anything further. Let him explain to himself how he knows me and what he wants from me. I continued the conversation. I don't recall us meeting before, I began my tirade to hurry, end this unnecessary meeting, and get home to my dogs. You don't know me, that's certain, my dear, replied Voldemar decisively. And now is your chance to find out who I am. I understood nothing from such an answer, only opened my eyes wide and frowned. He's playing some game with me. What a joke. Anger boiled up in me. I don't need to waste my time on some stranger. No sooner had I finished my thought than Voldemar, who had been staring at me, suddenly said, now looking up at the ceiling as if reading the words of a play. My time, and no stranger claiming my time, is useless to me right now. I was stunned. He had said out loud exactly what I was thinking, word for word. How is that possible? Is he a real magician? A lightning thought flashed through my head. No, he's some kind of passerby probably, or more likely just a charlatan, I continued to think. Or just a charlatan who should be kicked out of here, the man said again, looking me straight in the eye and grinning condescendingly. Then he added. Dear Ella, you mustn't think of me that way. I'm not a charlatan. However, I can read the minds of some interested people. Can you read people's minds? Who are only the ones you're interested in? I replied caustically, still unable to cope with my surprise and disbelief at his ability to read my mind. He's just suggesting I might think of him in advance, that's the trick. But how could he have known exactly what I would think of him? I continued to ponder, standing in front of him hesitantly. I did not know whether to turn and walk away or listen to the stranger. That he had introduced himself as some Voldemar did not make him any nicer or more familiar to me. Dear Ella, don't worry. I will explain everything to you as soon as we get to our urgent business, said Voldemar, putting his hand on my shoulder in a fatherly way and turning me to face the elevator. As he said this, he leaned slightly toward me and added, whispering directly into my ear. Now, you will enter the elevator and press the button for your floor. Everything after that will explain why our meeting is important and what the near future holds for you. Soon, you and I will meet. 
Trust me and fear nothing. With these words, the man gently nudged me, completely dumbfounded by this conversation, toward the elevator and pressed its call button. The elevator doors opened, and I slid into the elevator car with unusual relief, trying to hide from the strange man who claimed to know me and to read my mind. I had nowhere to get away from him but back into the elevator. Goodbye, Ella. Remember that you must find me and why I wanted to see you. Then you will know the reason for my visit, and we will agree with you that must never be broken, Voldemar said, waving goodbye. Hearing such a speech, I quickly and relievedly jabbed my finger at the elevator button for our floor. I turned to the elevator doors to ensure the strange man had left me alone. He's just some kind of crazy person, I thought as the elevator doors did not wait for me to press my floor button and just closed on their own. Through the transparent material of the elevator doors, I could see that Voldemar was still standing at the same place in front of the elevator, with both hands on the pommel of his stick, with which he was resting on the floor in front of him. His gaze was directed somewhere in the distance, outside our hallway, and even more so outside of the space of this previously unloved, transparent elevator. The old man named Voldemar reminded me now of a statue, frozen in anticipation of something I could see far away. The elevator finally carried me upward, away from that strange type. There, at home, my favorite dogs were waiting for me. I sighed with relief and turned away from the elevator doors to admire the view of the sea bay and the skyscrapers on its opposite shore. And suddenly, in that same instant, the world around me changed. Everything around me blurred and spun, and the view of the bay disappeared. Only the walls of the elevator cabin were around me, and they became completely opaque. A wave of colors of all shades ran from the floor to the ceiling of the elevator cabin. I did not realize what was happening, but my legs trembled treacherously. My fears about high places, which I had been afraid of since childhood, had been discovered. I looked down at the floor, trying not to notice how far below my feet I could see the streets and the park through the elevator's transparent floor, but I could see nothing down there. The surrounding landscape became blurry and blended into one solid rainbow. I instinctively squeezed my eyes shut and rubbed them with the back of both palms, trying to press my eyes so the strange picture would disappear. Then, when I opened them again, the typical view of my reality would return. When I opened my eyes, I realized things had only worsened. The transparent walls of the elevator car refracted the view from it as if I were looking at the world through a quartz crystal. Everything around me multiplied. There were many horizons, many gulf coasts, and a myriad of skyscrapers all around me. Everywhere I looked except because I could see nothing else below it, all swirled and multiplied. Panic gripped me. I hate this elevator. Why is this happening to me? When is the elevator going to get to our floor? Thoughts swirled around in my head. Then, I suddenly felt my body rise into the air and hover in the middle of the elevator car. My feet did not touch its floor, my relaxed arms rose by themselves, as if in water, to the sides and slightly upward. It felt like I was floating in the water of some lake made of liquid quartz crystals and rainbows. What's happening to me? Am I flying? All I could think was, and everything went dark. I was completely unaware of where I was and what was happening around me. Scene 4 Phase World Sounds came into my world. It seemed as if someone was talking to me, but he was not talking to me, but to someone else. I could not even move my fingers, let alone move or speak. My whole body was restrained by force squeezing me like a press. It was hard to breathe, 
but still possible. The voices were quite close, a low, chesty baritone and a higher but similarly masculine voice. It was impossible to make out what they were saying. Trying not to hold back my labored breathing, I lay there and did not move. After a while, the voices drifted away and disappeared somewhere in the distance. I was still trying to pretend, without realizing why, that I had not woken up from my forgetfulness. I felt like I could move soon anyway, but I did not want to because it would be dangerous. I did not know where the feeling came from, that it was dangerous to move and that I should lie low, like a doe in a thicket of bushes hiding from a forest predator. It was just a natural sensation that had arisen inside of me without my will. Finally, I tried to open my eyes. It was difficult for me to do so. After I opened my eyes, I saw the light. An unusually bright blue light was shining through the glass walls of my sarcophagus. What? A sarcophagus? It can't be. It's not like I'm sleeping in a museum. A thought ran through my head. When I pulled myself together, I could turn my head a little and open my eyes fully. The world around me glowed all shades of blue. This light was coming at me everywhere in the sarcophagus, where I was, from above, below, in front, and behind. Where am I? My thoughts could not get in order. I can't be in a transparent sarcophagus, and it's like sleeping beauty. There's no such thing. I turned slightly and noticed a massive shadow on the room's wall. Yes, I was in a room with walls emitting that magical blue light. What's that shadow over there? Who is it? I thought, trying to move at least the fingers of my right hand and then my left. Finally, I succeeded and could bring my right hand to my face to touch my lips, parched with thirst. Suddenly, the light was again obscured by a shadow, as if someone's huge hand or paw was reaching for me. Still unable to move in my sarcophagus, I shrank inwardly with horror. That shadow in the blue room seemed like a source of evil. I was as scared as I had ever been in my life. I could not remember when I was scared, though. I could remember nothing. It was such a strange feeling, I knew I was me, a grown young woman, but everything else was somewhere so far away in my memory that I did not even realize what I looked like. Meanwhile, a shadow moved closer to where I was, and the same thick baritone I had heard a while ago sounded. I still could not make out the words, but I was sure that this shadow was a flesh and blood creature, and this creature spoke in a language I understood. A second later, my sarcophagus opened. Or rather, it was opened by the creature talking next to me. At first, I squeezed my eyes shut from the intolerably bright light, but then I slowly opened my eyes and looked at my surroundings. The walls, the ceiling, the furniture, and my bed seemed pierced with blue light. I was not in a sarcophagus but on a massive bed with white sheets adorned with delicate lace around the edges. The blue light made the splendor of it all seem very transparent, almost ethereal. A canopy was placed over my bed, and light lace curtains were attached to the top, wholly drawn so I could see only the narrow strip of unpainted wooden floor in front of the bed. Gathering my strength, I sat up abruptly on the bed. My head immediately spun, and I fell back onto the pillows, richly decorated with lace. I fell into them as if I were sinking into the foam of the lace and falling into their soft protection from everything around me. Where am I, really? Why is everything around here so... old-fashioned? I thought, lying on this gorgeous bed and trying to realize what had happened to me. Meanwhile, the shadow approached the bed again. 
Its hand touched the curtain and pulled it aside. I squeezed my eyes shut but then opened them, realizing that I could not keep hiding from the surrounding reality. A girl in dark clothes looked at me. Her long dress was dark blue, made of a rich fabric decorated with silver embroidery. On the girl's head was wearing a headdress resembling the cap of beautiful medieval ladies those knights worshipped. This young woman was young and beautiful. I found it strange that her ears were slightly pointed as if they were the ears of a stoat or some other forest animal. I tried to catch her gaze so I could speak, but the girl stubbornly would not look me in the eye, only scrutinizing me from head to toe like an object. I cleared my throat, coughing several times, and turned to the stranger, struggling to loosen my lips. Good afternoon, my name is. Isabella. Your name is Isabella, I know, she replied calmly, still not looking me in the eye. The girl stepped away from the bed and gathered some things nearby, rustling a thick cloth. My surprise knew no edge. But why am I Isabella? I'm just Ella, and that's what I've always been called, I thought. But who called me that? I could not remember that yet. When the young woman returned to the bed, she handed me an armful of clothes, speaking in her lengthy, chesty voice. My name is Arsenia. I am your maid. Please tell me if you need anything else, clothing, jewelry, or shoes. I live here, next to your bedroom. You can always summon me by ringing this bell. She handed me a long-handled bell and shook it. It was a ringing sound that could not be heard a kilometer away. I smiled faintly and nodded my head, showing that I understood. I have a maid. It's just like a fairy tale about a queen, I thought. Meanwhile, Arsenia handed me a few more articles of clothing and spread them out on the edge of the bed. I pulled myself up on my arms, rested my elbows on the mattress, and sat up. The clothes handed to me by the girl were strange, too. But as I raked the clothes into a pile, I gestured at Arsenia with an expressive gesture toward the door. I wanted her to leave the room so she would not see me changing clothes. Or rather, how I was dressing because I was completely naked. When the girl left the room, I looked around more calmly and realized again that I was completely naked in this huge bed. I mean, I was not wearing anything, not even underwear. Even though there was no one in the room now, I instinctively covered my breasts with my arms, crossing them in a gesture of defense, even though I could cover nothing on my body except my nipples. My bottom was still covered by the blanket, and realizing nothing else was around, I hastily pulled the blanket over me. I covered myself up to my chin with it. Then, entirely covered by the blanket, I sat higher in the bed, leaning against a massive mountain of pillows decorated with elaborate lace. That made me feel calmer, and I looked around my room. The room I was in looked like the chambers of a medieval castle. The room's walls were made of huge boulders, the surface not covered with anything like whitewash or paint. They were just bare pieces of rock, somehow miraculously put together as walls. The high ceiling, visible from under the bed's canopy, led so far upward that I had to tilt my head to see its vault, about four or five feet above the floor. The ceiling looked like the vault of a cave, for it, too, was made of huge boulders. How they could stay above me and not fall, I did not understand, but that did not matter now. It was important that there was only one way out of this room, and it was opened or closed by a massive door made of one solid plate of a slice of a vast diameter tree trunk. The top of the door was rounded to match the semicircular vault of its opening. The door was richly decorated with carvings and images, the meaning of which I could not understand, so complex were they. However, 
I thought it depicted something like dragons and some warriors fighting these monsters. The door handle was made of forged metal and complemented by the lock's opening. Wow, why does such a massive door need to be locked? Who is there to defend against? I thought. Although, if it's a real lock, it should be secure. But why did I decide I was in a glass sarcophagus or a castle? I did not know. Perhaps it was the fact that the only window in the room was small and narrow. Its multicolored panes of glass were set in metal frames. The light streaming into the room from this window created bizarre, colorful patterns on the skin of some enormous animal lying on the floor as if I were looking through a kaleidoscope tube, like when I was a child. Most of all, there was blue and blue glass in this window, which created the effect of the all-pervading bright blue light that made me think I was in a sarcophagus. And all I was doing at the time was lying in a four-poster bed. There was an elegant table by the bed, on which a relatively large mirror was set, and a spread of combs and jewelry. The table contrasted with my surroundings. But at that moment, the maid came back in. She entered with her eyes downcast, but I could see her expression pleased. She had expected to find something different on her return, not a peaceful picture of a strange stranger as if resigned to her captivity. Perhaps, she thought, I am now running naked through this room, trying to open a door or window to escape my prison. But I'm not that stupid. All in good time. Arsenia glanced at me and realized I had not thought to move from my seat. There was a sigh of relief in her breath. That's for sure was written all over her face. She thought I'd put her out the door, intending to escape. But I'm not in a dungeon here at all. I'm in the lap of luxury, so to speak. It's only in my mind that I'm in a dungeon, I thought, deciding what to do next. Arsenia, please explain to me where I am. I said, resigning myself to not understanding anything about my surroundings. The girl replied without stopping folding her clothes. You are in the Fey world. I don't know what else needs explaining. I felt as if I had been hit under the breath. And what are you saying? You're some Fey. I stared at her in disbelief. But the more I looked at Arsenia, the more I realized she was telling the pure truth. Her appearance, those pointy ears, and all those light special effects around my awakening were like waking up in a fairy tale but for adults. I decided not to continue questioning, which this girl thought was unnecessary and fell silent, deep in my thoughts. And what is the name of this world of yours, was all I dared to ask. The kingdom of Etheris, she replied. Etheris. Etheris, I whispered as if learning a new word. If this is your kingdom, Etheris, then you must have a king and queen, right? I could not resist continuing the logic of my musings aloud. My voice soothed me and it was even more comforting to know that someone spoke to me in a language I understood. Yes, we are blessed to have a wise and brave High Lord, Thunder, she replied, respectfully saying the Lord's name. And why does he have such a strange name, Thunder? I kept up with the girl's questioning. You'll understand that as soon as you see him. Me? See your high lord. I was genuinely surprised. Me? But why? Before I could finish my sentence, the girl put her finger to her lips and whispered. You shouldn't talk about him when he's not here. It's not customary. You'll talk to him when he calls you. And that will happen soon enough. With those words, Arsenia gathered up the last of her rags and left the room without turning around. I had many more questions about this high lord of theirs, 
about this kingdom, but there was no one else to ask. I was alone in the room. However, soon, Arsenia came back. She brought me a pitcher of water and a glass. These simple objects were beautifully decorated with very delicate engravings on the glass. They reminded me of something familiar, something related to my family. I took a pitcher from this tray and poured myself some water while she turned away to fix something on the bed. Seeing me pouring my water, Arsenia almost shrieked in horror. Oh, no, my lady, no. Surprised, I spilled the water past the glass and set the pitcher back on the tray. What is it? Is the water poisoned? I asked in horror. Oh, no, of course not. The maid said in a high-pitched voice, running over to the tray. She grabbed the pitcher and poured water into the glass herself, then handed it to me, bowing. I understood nothing. Then what's the matter? I asked her. Arsenia replied. You shouldn't do anything yourself. I and the other maids are here for all that. It is improper for a high lady to pour her water dress herself. I'm the ultimate fey lady. What makes you say that? I laughed, but when I saw the look on her face, I stopped laughing. The girl froze in shock at the way I was talking to her about the high fey. I did not understand why she called me that, but I played along. I laughed. All right, all right. I'll try to do as you advise. Even so, will you let me go to the bathroom alone? Arsenia realized I was joking and smiled back, answering. Of course, my lady. I will soon show you where this place is for women. I glanced questioningly at the girl who had flapped around me again and asked her. What's all this for? Where are my clothes? She, still not looking me in the eye, replied. You won't need your clothes anymore. Ever. So get used to our clothes. I'll show you how to put them on properly. Before I could say anything, she put another dress in front of me, gray, unadorned, but of an exquisite style, the breasts were emphasized by a bodice with bindings and a sash, like ancient Greek statues. Carefully putting on the dress, I turned to the woman. She understood my intention and led me to a large mirror on the boardwalk in the room's corner. I lifted my head and looked at myself in the mirror. An unfamiliar young woman was staring at me. Her long, dark brown hair fell in beautiful waves over her shoulders. Her thin black eyebrows flared over her slightly slanted eyes like a seagull's wings soaring over the sea. The waist, emphasized by the patterned belt of the dress, was unrealistically thin. Naked by the dress's collar, this beauty swan's neck asked to be adorned with a necklace. But what struck me most was her eyes were blue-green like a marvelous sea, with a double layer of black lashes. I was sure those eyelashes were not false. How could it be that there would be any makeup left on my body when I was not even wearing my clothes and underwear? It seemed like I had gone through some purgatory and came out of it completely transformed. Or had I just never noticed that I was beautiful? I did not recognize myself at all. But how did I know what I was supposed to be? Something in my mind whispered that I was different, but I had to trust my eyes for the moment. I was in the fairy tale for adults. Scene 5. Fire Necklace. Arsenia came up to me again and, running her hand over my shoulder, said, well, all that's left to do is put on the jewelry, and you're ready to go. Ready for what? I interjected, still scrutinizing myself in the mirror. Ready to see our high lord, the maid replied respectfully. 
She tilted her head respectfully at those words as if this unknown High Lord was in this room. Without responding to my questioning look with an unspoken, why do I need him, this High Lord, still wearing gloves, she took a heavy necklace from the table by the bed and put it around my neck. That's when I realized what it meant to burn like fire. My skin felt like it was about to be burned by its heat. Like an opal, the necklace was made of stone, with blue fire running through it. What's wrong with me? Why is this necklace on fire? I thought and immediately tried to rip the necklace off my neck. The maid had not expected my reaction. She had already removed her white gloves and placed them on my dressing table. Her face flashed momentarily with an expression of anguish and sacrifice and then with determination. Arsenia rushed to me and pressed the necklace against my skin with her palms, preventing me from removing it. I felt like I was burning to death it hurt so much. But Arsenia kept her palms pressed against the necklace, and I could do nothing about it. My face contorted in pain, but I had to bear it. After a while, I realized that the pain was gone. The girl saw I was no longer trying to remove the jewelry and took her hands off my neck. Blood dripped from her palms they were covered in blistering burns. I stared in horror at her hands, then into the mirror at the skin on my neck. But there was nothing on my skin not a burn mark, not even a scratch from the necklace I had pressed against it. I was unharmed. Arsenia took a couple of steps back from me and bowed obediently before me, hiding her wounded hands under the apron of her dress. She expressed awe and fear on her face. I did not understand what was going on. Had Arsenia mistaken me for someone else? I did not feel like a queen to be bowed down to like that. I stepped toward her, but she backed away, still holding her hands under her apron. I felt sorry for her, even though I understood nothing. I had normal human feelings, and compassion was one of them. The girl shook her head negatively, forbidding me to approach her. No, no, don't come near me now. I'm not allowed to touch you. I, still not understanding anything, stepped towards her once more and, gently touching her hand, said, I don't know what you're allowed or not allowed to do, but I'll do what I think is right. You need to bandage your hands gently right away. I can help you. Arsenia looked at me with her mouth open in surprise and remained silent. I continued. You should probably see a doctor. I'm not a medical professional, but I know you could get an infection if the wound isn't treated immediately. All this confidently, I realized I knew something about first aid. Even though I am not a doctor, I am not afraid of blood and wounds. I realized that only by acting could I regain my memory and possibly return home. My memory was not coming back to me as memories but as skills. So, I had to work to find out what else I could do. I turned around and looked for pieces of cloth I could use as bandages. I saw my bed sheet and, tearing it off the bed, I ripped it into strips. Power appeared in my hands that I had not expected from myself. But I left those thoughts for later, I had to care for poor Arsenia. I carefully wrapped strips of silk sheets around her hands, careful not to press the cloth directly against the wounds. That way, the girl's hands had some protection from the dirt. Arsenia stood with her burned hands folded powerlessly in front of her, watching me take care of her with unending amazement. The girl had expected nothing of me. What are they doing here, living like nobles in the Middle Ages of this etheris? If she mistook me for some important lady, it doesn't mean I'm going to leave her without first aid, I thought, sending Arsenia away from the room with orders to find a healer and rest from work for the next few days. Scene 6 
First Encounter When I, dressed according to Arsenia's choice, was ready to leave the room, another woman, middle-aged but seemingly as humble as my former maid, came after me. They were all somehow like each other, their hair covered by grey shawls and dresses without patterns, with simple linen aprons whose only decoration was a pattern like a border of lizards or dragons. The new maid did not introduce herself, and I did not have the energy to ask her name. It was enough that Arsenia had to be rescued from the burns my strange necklace had inflicted on her. The maid looked at me silently and, realizing that I was dressed to their specifications, gestured to the door. I picked up the hem of my burning dress and stepped boldly out of the room and into a world I did not know. The silent woman led me through the long, dark corridors of the castle. I did not doubt that it was a castle. When I finished walking through the castle corridors, the maid finally opened the door to the room from which the noise and clamor of the unrestrained festivities were pouring in. The maid stood at the open door on the corridor side, and I stepped into the hall. The voices gradually subsided, and the heads of those present at the feast turned in my direction one by one. People, mostly men, sat at tables set up in a T shape. I did not have time to look at their faces and clothes as the maid gave me a gentle nudge in the back to go further into the hall, to where a group of men was seated at the head of the table, their outfits much more affluent or more elaborately decorated than those of the others in the room. I lowered my gaze, embarrassed, avoiding the men's blatant appraisal of me. Despite the unusual dress, I felt like a perfectly ordinary young woman except that my pointy ears made me a little uncomfortable. Nothing to look at me like a visiting bird, I thought, strolling among the men whose heads turned to follow me. I'm not a doll on the counter for them, I'm just a woman, I thought. I looked around as I stepped out into the middle of the hall. I went around the tables and hid somewhere in the corner of this large dark room, despite the day outside the windows being lit by torches. Going around the tables, I found myself behind the broad back of one man whose figure blocked my path to the corner of the hall. A hooded cloak covered the man's head and shoulders. I was about to go around him and walk further along the table when suddenly the man sprang from his chair and turned to me stepping away. The torchlight illuminated his proud profile in the semi-darkness of the hall from beneath his hood, his thick, wavy hair swept back over his high forehead. The top of his hair was held back by a band of thin strips of leather from which hung some jewelry, more like amulets made of colorful beads or glass. Dark eyebrows over deep-set eyes gave his face a menacing yet proud expression. A nose with a hunchback and high, broad cheekbones over a sensual mouth emphasized the proud profile, almost like a satyr. The steep chin was the perfect example of what masculinity should be. The sharp angles of his broad cheekbones and the black bushy eyebrows that looked like the wings of an eagle in flight gave the man the appearance of an imperious and ruthless ruler. The man's nose was prominent, hunchbacked, and broken. Its outline was uneven. The man's face was clean-shaven, like all the surrounding men. Our gazes met. The man looked at me from under his hood first, as if in passing. The stranger's eyes were a dark purple, like amethysts shining beneath his black eyebrows, illuminating his entire face with their mysterious light. The man smelled something tart, like perhaps his clothes were soaked in the odors of campfires and battles. Goosebumps ran up and down my body. I was pierced by a sharp sense of danger and pleasure the way he was looking at me. I grasped with both hands the high, carved wooden back of the chair from which he had risen and realized that the man was so tall that I had to look up at him from below with my head held high. But then the torchlight flickered on the breeze entering the hall, and I shuddered in surprise. 
When I took my gaze away from the inexpressibly beautiful violet color of the man's eyes and looked more closely at his face, he turned even more toward me and, with that movement, pushed his hood back a little. He looked like an excellent warrior. His face was not only crudely sculpted but also scarred, one of which ran from his cheekbone to his mouth, cutting that half of his face in two. This scar gave his face an expression of sarcasm, as the lines of that half of his face where the spot was formed. I looked up at the stranger's face, which looked like the fearsome and beautiful mask of the god of war. Everything about him breathed beastly power and cruelty. I could not understand what he wanted from me. What do they all want with me here? This man was clearly in charge. There was no one around him. Recognizing his right to exclusive power, his subjects had left him lonely, too. Or maybe there was some other reason, which I could not fathom. I was still standing before him, now clasping my hands together and trying to keep from shivering. Finally, the leader of this community uttered in a low, hoarse voice. Well, let's see who you've brought me this time. He did not address anyone, but everyone froze, expecting his following action. Several fey men rose from their seats and stood behind their ruler. With those words, the disfigured giant stepped closer, gazing at me. And I looked at him. I had already realized it was up to him. I was here in this strange world and had to wait for this giant's decisions for some unknown reason. Yes, the high lord of this castle or this world was taller than all the fey men around him by almost a head, and he was taller than me by nearly two heads. When he rose from his seat, I realized how powerful he was. His shoulders were vast, his arms looked like tree trunks. They were almost as thick, and his mighty torso, wearing battle armor made of gilded leather and blackened metal, was elaborately decorated with chaste patterns. These designs depicted dragons emitting fire from their jaws, knights who fought these dragons, eagles, or what looked like giant birds, hovering over this picture of the Battle of the Titans. The leader of this community held out his hand to me. His movement was unusually light and quick, which did not match his powerful appearance. He moved lightly in all this attire, almost like a tiger, which, despite its enormous size, was very light and elegant. His outstretched hand stayed in the air as I took an instinctive step back, away from him. He furrowed his brow and tilted his head a little sideways like a predator trying out the best way to grab its prey. The comparison of the leader of this community to a tiger brought me to my senses. It made me take my eyes off the giant and take a quick look at the society of people around us. I searched their faces for any sign of sympathy and understanding. What does this monstrous knight want from me? What do they all want from me? Don't any of them sympathize with me and can't explain that I am a stranger in this society of strangers and incomprehensible people? I thought, still standing in front of him and looking at him. The men stealthily surrounded my stranger, and I stood in a tight circle. I finally took my eyes off the stranger's disfigured face and looked around. The men were dressed in the same type of clothing as their leader. Only their decorations were more modest. The metal of the protective armor was plain, occasionally decorated with patterns, and the leather details of the garments were simply a darker color, like well-tanned natural leather. The fabric of their caftans and loose pants was also discreet, mostly natural tones of earth and wood. On the heads of some members of this community were hats made of fine leather and occasionally decorated with the feathers of some birds. The men's hairstyles resembled their leaders, but also with more modest adornments. The faces and hands of many of these men were also scarred, but somehow, they were not as disfigured as their leader's face was. 
Perhaps the stark contrast between his regular face and the part the enemy's sword or claw had struck created this shock effect. My insides trembled. Where did I go? Is this a bad dream? When will it end? Suddenly, the crowd parted, and into the circle of men around me entered a tall man in a long dark blue cloak with an utterly white lining. He stood out sharply from the crowd of warriors and their leader, who were the last to care about their appearance. This man was simply handsome, a relatively young man with very blonde hair, if the leader of this gathering, also tied back in a ponytail at the back of his head, with bands of amulets. But his face was handsome with classic beauty. Straight nose stubbornly compressed, thin lips, and a steep chin, clean-shaven. His clean and expensive clothes and the beauty of his face, unblemished by battle scars, gave him an aristocratic appearance. This stranger was the opposite of the leader of this community, a dark-haired, mighty giant with a disfigured face. It was clear from the respect with which the warriors stood before the newcomer that he held a prominent position in this society. The leader of the gathering of warriors raised his massive bison-like head high and greeted the newcomer. Ah, there you are, my friend. Welcome, Amos. Look who I got for myself. With those words, he suddenly grabbed me firmly by the shoulder with his hand and turned me to face my guest. Even if I wanted to resist this action, I could not. The giant held me so tightly, without effort, that I felt trapped. The constant feeling of being used like a toy made me resent him, and I jerked away from the giant's grasp. But he intercepted me as soon as I was out of his grasp, and this time he put his arm around my shoulders, standing behind me so that I was pressed against his body and unable to move. He showed me off to his guest as if I were his toy or prey. Amos looked at me with a mixture of surprise and contempt. He pronounced, Thunder, why do you want this, simple woman? Haven't you had enough of our beauties? The giant was shaken by laughter, more like a burst of thunder than the laughter of a humanoid creature. He replied, Gee, Amos, our beauty can't compare to anyone else. This one's mine. I've got her at last, and now I can do with my life as I please. I understood nothing from this dialogue. Only in my mind imprinted the name of this beast, Thunder, and that somehow, with my help, he would dispose of his own life. I lifted my head to look at my tormentor and buried my face in his chin. I was scared, and his embrace was so tight that I could hardly breathe. With my last strength, I whispered. Thunder, that's your name, isn't it? Thunder, let me go, please. Let me go. The giant loosened his grip, and I turned around in the ring of his arms to face him and desperately rested my hands on his chest to move away from him at least a little and meet him. With my head cocked back, I whispered in a suppressed voice. If you want me to obey you, let me go now. Let me go and give me a chance to come to my senses. After all, I remembered nothing, who I was, where I was from, or where I needed to return. I knew one thing for sure, this place is not for me. Thunder looked down at me in surprise, and everyone around him was silent, waiting for his answer. He exhaled briefly, took his palm to my chin, and turned my face toward the light. The surrounding darkness suddenly parted, and I saw he was just puzzled, like a cat that had caught a mouse and was playing with it. And here was this mouse trying to negotiate with him about something, what insolence! I realized I had crossed some forbidden line. This man's stern, chopped face became just scary, he was laughing. He was laughing at me, such a brave mouse. Who told you that you can ask me for anything? 
you need to realize that your destiny is in my hands, and now I will decide where you go and when. Tomorrow is our ceremony, and you will be my wife. What? His wife? His wife? How could he ever imagine that anyone would want to be his wife? Much less me. My thoughts raced at the speed of light, and my heart raced as if I were running as fast as I could. But the ring of his arms bound me, and I could not move without his permission. How dare he even think of something like that? Thunder's grip was unbreakable, and as I struggled against him, I could not shake the thought that no woman would ever want to touch him because he was such a freak. No matter what, I won't marry him. No way. I can't stand him, they can't make me do it. Around us, his associates shouted. Kiss. Kiss. I froze in horror, staring at Thunder's eyes and lips. His face was right before me, and I squirmed in disgust as I imagined his lips touching mine. No, this will never happen. I turned my face to the side and pressed my lips tightly so he would not even try to kiss me. Fortunately, despite the greasy cheers of his companions, Thunder did not seem eager to kiss me. His disfigured face was now expressing nothing but contempt for me. The surrounding men shouted something like, Cheers! As I made another effort to break free from Thunder's grasp, I felt my head spinning, and I collapsed in the arms of this man who disgusted me. However, he did not let me fall and, picking me up lightly in his arms, carried me somewhere inside the room. To me, Powerless and pressed again tightly against the metal of the Thunder Giant's armor-covered chest, everything around me seemed like a dark castle full of horrible creatures. I was sure he was carrying me to some dungeon where I would spend my days until I died. Scene 7 The Great Magician It turned out, however, that Thunder had brought me back to the same room in which I had awakened in this world. The High Lord of this castle lowered me onto the bed I had recently been so eager to get up from and took a step back, gazing at me. Then he turned and walked out of the room without a word. I lay with my arms folded across my chest, staring up at the ceiling or the top of the canopy over this bed. Everything seemed covered in fog, the fog of my near unconsciousness and despair. What happened to me? I don't know, and I don't remember anything from my past, not my old life, not my relatives, not where I lived until now, I thought while monitoring what was happening in the room. And there was a lot to see here. A succession of women dressed in luxurious outfits came into the room and again piled some clothes on the chest next to my bed. I pulled myself together and, Propping myself up on my elbow, turned to the side of the bed where that chest stood. The chest was unusual, decorated with intricate carvings, and covered with painted images of men or demigods and some very mythical creatures. The closed lid of the chest was entirely covered by the clothes these women kept bringing into my room. It flashed through my mind that it was bizarre that I was calling this room mine but I had nothing else to call my own in this world. Now, I was sure I was in another world or dreaming. But this dream had gone from a mere adventure to a nightmare. Suddenly, the massive door of the room opened again, and a tall, thin man with shoulder-length gray hair walked in. This elderly man was dressed in spacious robes and looked like some magician. I thought so because he was wearing a tall cap of dark blue color, richly decorated with silver embroidery. The hat had stars, comets, and suns on it, or it was just some big shining star. I jumped up on the bed, flew off it onto the floor, ran barefoot to this stranger from wherever I got the strength, and grabbed him tightly by the sleeve of his jacket. The man stared at me in astonishment and, suddenly turned to me affectionately. Dear Ella, 
Let me help you, he began his speech while shaking his head measuredly and disapprovingly as if he were my mentor whose men had not yet learned anything of what he had taught her. I allow myself to remind you that my name is Voldemar, the great magician. But who is he to me? Why do I have this feeling that I know him? It's the feeling that made me jump out of bed and rush toward him, I thought, but I did not back away from him, instead pulling him closer to me by his sleeve and whispering in his ear. I'm so glad to see you here. You're not like them, I looked back at the women floating their business and did not seem to pay any attention to the mage and me. The mage hummed contentedly and, squinting slyly, replied. Of course, because I'm a man. I ignored his barb and continued, pulling him even closer to me. I need your help. I need to get out of here. I'll do anything you want me to do for you, within certain limits, of course. I would not trade my body, but anything else I could offer him in exchange for escaping from here and returning to my world. But then he pulled back and took me by the shoulders in a fatherly way and said, My dear, of course, I will help you. Just not in the way you think. You do not know how important you are to Etheris right now. I backed away from him, looking at Voldemar with disbelief. What? You're with them. What the hell is going on here? I almost shouted, looking around. One woman glanced worriedly at me and at this guest. He made some sign with his hand, and the maid hurried out of the room. Before I could express my thoughts, the woman returned, carrying a small metal tray with a goblet. The goblet was made of metal, probably silver or something similar. Like everything else in this castle, the cup had dragons on it. The man carefully took this goblet from the tray and, holding it with both hands, held it out to me. I backed away from him but ran into the circle of maids surrounding us. Their faces expressed nothing but sympathy. They seemed to have been through something that made my adventures and fears seem like nothing to them. I accepted the goblet from the wizard's hands. The goblet was unusually heavy for its small size. I felt like I was holding a half bucket of water, but it was about half a liter. I looked incredulously at the goblet and the mage. The mage said, Drink this drink, and your mind will clear. Do not be afraid. I, obeying the man's commanding gaze, brought the goblet to my lips and took a sip. A wave of warmth ran through my body, and all my tension vanished. I looked at my hands they glowed with a kind of pearly light and were like porcelain. My skin had always been clear and soft, but now it was like silk. I could see my blood pulsing in the veins of my hands, but it was so beautiful and unusual that I was not frightened at all. Then, I noticed that my body felt unusually light. I swung my arm, trying to understand my new sensations, and suddenly realized I was up in the air by a couple of centimeters. My feet were barely touching the floor. I was hanging in the air like a hummingbird, only I did not have wings. I moved my other arm and lowered myself back to the floor, both feet firmly planted on it. What is it? What have you given me? I asked the mage, a little horrified but delighted. He, very satisfied, replied. It's just our drink that temporarily summons the hidden capabilities of the individual. All of us and you humans have them. Only many of us don't realize it. Like you did not know you could fly. See Nate. The Treaty. After awkwardly trying a few movements with my hands and even my feet, I finally lowered myself to the floor. I stood on it, clinging desperately to the rough, unpainted floorboards with my toes. I felt like if I relaxed my feet, I would return to the ceiling, 
and falling from there hurt more. The magician continued my thought. Yeah, practice before you can use levitation. Levitation? You mean it exists? I asked him mechanically, still trying to feel the floor tightly with my feet. Yes, this is levitation. It exists. And you're capable of it you've just seen it, the mage continued. Then, looking at me slyly, he added. I'm sorry, I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Voldemar Mortensen, the great magician. I know this is not the shortest name, so you can call me the mage. A vital thought flashed through my mind and then vanished. I knew I needed this person, but I did not understand why. I could remember nothing from my other life, and now I had to recognize myself and others anew. While I came to my senses, Voldemar looked around the room and the clothes the women had all brought me. The mage waved his hand, and the maids hurried out of the room. The mage and I were alone. Finally, Voldemar interrupted the lingering silence and asked. So you're happy with the outfits the maids brought you? I haven't had time to look at anything yet. But what are these clothes for? Why are there so many of them? I replied and looked at the outfits. And there was plenty to look at. A mountain of dresses lay before me. Their fabrics, like velvet and silk, with appliqued details made of fine leather and embroidered with gold or silver threads, were simply luxurious. This luxury was overwhelming to me. What's all this for? I don't understand, I muttered. Voldemar took a deep breath and answered, importantly. These outfits are for your wedding, Ella. Isabella, to be exact. Have you realized that this is your real, proper name in our world? I staggered away from him in shock and did not respond. So Thunder was not kidding. What about the wedding? I'm a grown and independent woman, and he has no right to force me to take such a step. I won't agree to it for anything in the world. To become the wife of a stranger, and even one as ugly as Thunder. No, no, and no. I thought, not even trying to control my emotions. With a nostalgic look at Voldemar, I said. Look here, Voldemar. I don't want any weddings. No one, and nothing will force me to marry. Why on earth should I get married at all? What is the meaning of all this? Why doesn't anyone ask me what I want? What is this, slavery? I don't know what I'm doing or how I got here. You know I don't belong in this world. Help me. Before I could finish this tirade, the mage grabbed me firmly by the shoulder with his long, thin hand and, bringing his face so close to mine that I could feel his breath, said, Don't ever say you don't understand how you got here or what you're doing here. Never. It's deadly, and not just for you, the future of the whole Aetheris depends on you. Voldemar darted his pale blue eyes around me, making me think they were about to spill out of his eye sockets and fill the room like cold spring water. He continued, still holding my shoulder. You need to realize that what is happening to you now is your salvation. The mage moved away from me. I stood by the mountain of dresses, entirely dumbfounded by Voldemar's swoop and reaction to what I thought was a legitimate request to help me get out of there. Horror and disgust were written all over my face as he spoke again in a soothing voice. Isabella, becoming Thunder's wife is your only chance of getting out of here. The Dark Oracle says so, and his predictions always come true. Thunder follows those predictions as they are the basic law in our world. And you must obey if you want to get out of here and back to your world. I stared at the mage, still in the shock that had become my normal state. 
tears of anger dripped from my eyes. I shook my head, denying the very possibility of such a deal. I shook my head, denying the mere chance of such a deal. Only by marrying Thunder can you return home. But I offer you one condition to make your situation easier. You will marry him, but he will never become your real husband. That is. You mean I won't have to have sex with them? I was relieved to continue the sentence for him. It was easy for me to say it out loud not like him, the old man. Well, yes, by sex, Voldemar confirmed, clearly embarrassed. Despite my desperate situation, I almost laughed. Voldemar must be a powerful mage for everyone to bow down to him, and even Thunder has to make treaties with him, and here's a word that throws the old man off balance, I thought. Somehow, the realization that there was something that embarrassed the mage brought me back to the reality of what was happening. I knew for sure that I was not a virgin. I was married before, and sexuality did not embarrass me. The only unacceptable thing was being forced into it. So you're offering me a sham marriage? I said in a stronger voice. What does your thunder think about it? It doesn't seem like what would suit such a dork. I could hear the sarcasm in my voice. I had seen Thunder and his entourage at the feast, Amos seemed the only one who seemed like an ordinary man. The rest looked like mad warriors who had just returned from battle. Thunder isn't a dork at all, the mage objected respectfully. You just don't know him. But you'll have time to get to know him better and won't regret it. It would be best to look closer at him, maybe you'll change your opinion of him. But remember, your marriage must remain a sham. It is a condition of my helping you get back to your world. If I, fictitiously marry this thunder, when and how will I be able to get back home? I asked hesitantly, not knowing whether to accept Mage's offer. But what if I disagree? Then they might force me to become Thunder's wife for real or. I imagined a dungeon and the rats in it. Apparently, from somewhere, I knew well what could await me in a medieval jail, even in a world of wizards and fairies. Voldemar answered at once. My girl, it must take some time after the wedding for everyone around you to believe your marriage is real. Believe me. Thunder needs this marriage as much as you do, but he has reasons that I am not at liberty to tell you about it, at least not right now. It's not important to you right now. What is important is that you wear whatever the maids have prepared for you and follow the wedding rites. This is an important condition for my further help to you. Everything logical in my brain was now trying to break through the wall of my shock. I will marry no one but. Except for whom? I did not know that. All I knew was that I had loved before and loved passionately. But all that was now obscured by the shroud of my imperfect memory, which refused to serve me. At that moment, a sound like a roar or some strange wind instrument came from outside. The sound was both mesmerizing and repulsive. It seemed to penetrate my gut and make my heart beat harder. Voldemar was also wary and then went to the window and opened one of its frames to the inside of the room. This strange sound came from outside, which I had not yet seen. I had only been led through the castle's corridors and was in the hall where the hideous thunder had announced that I would be his wife to all. Voldemar gestured me to the window and pointed to something in the castle courtyard. I looked out of this room's colorful stained glass decorated window for the first time. Under the castle wall, where the window was located, was a courtyard, a large square. At its edges were benches of rough planks, and in the center of the court was a square area fenced with a dense hedge of medium-thick tree trunks. Voldemar shook his head and muttered thoughtfully. He took this challenge after all but I told him not to. 
I looked at the mage in surprise. He looked me in the eye and explained his words. Thunder has made it a contest, after all. He must defeat the dragon in honor of marrying you. Dragon? I could not take what the mage was saying seriously. What dragon? Are you kidding? No, I'm not kidding. And soon you'll see that I am, Voldemar said. After another cold, appraising glance, he closed the window sash and pointed gently but insistently at the stack of dresses. Well then, since Thunder has had this battle, you will need to be there. I had already realized that I had little choice in this situation. The Fae and Voldemar treated my life like a toy, and I could do nothing about it. Anger grew inside of me. My whole being was resisting what was in store for me here. Annoyed at my inability to affect the situation, I did something that was up to me. I walked over to the dresses and poked at one of them at random, which was at the top of the pile, and said, This dress suits me. And these boots. I wanted to avoid wearing shoes, even though they were an excellent choice. Something inside me whispered I would rather wear boots and the most straightforward dress. I was not going to trust a mage who was pursuing his interests or was in the service of thunder. I must act on my own and make my own decisions. So I agreed to everything until this wedding, and then I would see what I could do. I did not believe a man like Thunder would leave me alone when he had to show everyone I was his wife. Experience had told me that few men could do such a thing when they had every right to use their woman and her body. I knew that in my world, both spouses decide whether they are together. But in this world, it looked like the Fey men chose everything for the women. At least, that's what I was, a uh, candy for their pleasure. Thinking about it was disgusting, so I put those thoughts aside for later and, for now, got busy with the current event of going and watching some battle with a dragon. Why this battle? Is someone attacking them from the dragons? My thoughts flowed in an analytical direction, and I decided not to ask the maids anything not to violate Voldemar's instruction, just to come and watch the battle. Immersed in these thoughts, I followed the maid's instructions to raise one arm or the other or to sit down, to breathe in and out, to put on the dress I had chosen. At first, I tried to resist and told them I could do it myself, but after looking at the pile of ties in the most awkward places on this dress, I decided not to refuse their help. Looking again out of the window at the square, partly paved with cobblestones and partly sprinkled with sand or gravel, I realized shoes would be too inappropriate for this event. So, like shoes, I chose boots of fine, light-colored leather that fit my legs like stockings. I was delighted with the way my feet felt in these boots. The maids looked me over and, deciding that I needed to add jewelry, tried to suggest that I wear some strange necklace again, but I refused. I remembered what happened when Arsenia burned her hands on my necklace, and I did not want to put myself or them through that again. When I was ready, they threw a light but thick hooded cloak over my shoulders, lilac. I wrapped myself in it like protective armor and followed the maids, who gestured for me to follow them into the square. Walking through the castle's dark, even daytime corridors, faintly lit by smoking torches, I tried to memorize every turn and door on my way out. When we reached the square, it was full of people. The moment I appeared at the castle's door and stepped into its courtyard, the heads of those present turned in my direction and looked only at me. I bowed my head beneath my hood, then raised it, and with proud head held high, followed the maids to where I was to be seated. While still standing at the door of the castle's exit to its courtyard, I noticed that Thunder was there, in front of the arena. He sat proudly in his high-backed chair on the platform at the arena's edge. The high fay wore his painted armor, and a vast sword hung from his belt. 
I followed the maids, treading soft boots on the cobblestone sidewalk and lifting the hem of my long dress slightly so I would not get tangled in its fabric. It seemed as if I had been walking for ages under these silent gazes. I could see out of the corner of my eye that there was no sympathy or favor on the Fay's faces. They looked at me like an exotic animal being led to a cage where it would be displayed. The maids led me to the pedestal on which Thunder's chair, or a throne, was placed. Next to his chair were several other massive wooden chairs with carved backs. Lifting the hem of my dress, I slowly ascended the steps to this pedestal. I felt like I was walking into a scaffold. These creatures around me, these fae. They did not sympathize with me. They were from another world to which I did not belong and would never belong. I did not know why Thunder needed this wedding. How could any normal man agree to such a pact? Being a reasonably experienced woman who had been through at least one long relationship with a man, I had a clever idea of what men do for a living. They need sex, service, and children, neither would be here. I could still serve him, but why when they have plenty of maids here, and some of them, like Arsenia, are very good-looking? All right, that leaves sex and children. But I was sure I would never love Thunder. Yes, I shall never love him. Who could have any affection for Thunder? What woman would have warm feelings for his scarred face, temper, and inability to understand a woman's feelings, I thought, looking askance at his profile. At that moment, he turned around, and I saw the scarred half of his face. I turned away immediately and looked at the arena in front of the platform with feigned interest. I want a future husband to understand my feelings and thoughts and care about me and our children. The idea of children with thunder just made me cringe. When I agreed to this wedding, this marriage of convenience, I did not think about the fact that if he did not fulfill his agreement with the mage, and took me by force, or just drugged me with wine and persuaded me to have real sex, then he and I could have children. And this is such a responsibility, this is a lifelong bond with him. Oh my God! I exclaimed to myself and stumbled. I realized I was falling right into Thunder's arms. In his strong arms, I felt a faint spark of gratitude to me for Thunder. This time, his swiftness had saved me from public shame. At least someone is thinking about me maintaining my dignity and not getting embarrassed by prostrating myself on the wooden floor of this pedestal in front of the Fay gathered here. The thought flashed and vanished, swept away by the sight of my savior's wounded face. I instinctively jerked away from Thunder, who had already gotten me to my feet on the platform. I should have hated him for having me entirely at his mercy. But I was already thinking that Voldemar and Thunder were my only allies. Arsenia? Perhaps this beautiful girl would be my ally, but I did not believe it. What was I to her? I helped her save her burned hands once, burned by my fault. She's not on my side, she's just a polite girl and nothing more, I thought as I followed Thunder down the pedestal to his chair. And Thunder also made sure I looked good. Well, yes, I am his future wife. I have to look good, much better than the wives of the other high fae. And maybe Thunder will present my attractiveness to everyone as a trophy he's won, I thought, sitting in the chair next to Thunder as he instructed. But its sewers were insignificant compared to his magic and influence on this battlefield. How can you compare us, me, a helpless and memory-lost alien to this world, and him, the all-powerful lord of this realm? My thoughts were going in the same direction. Even so, Thunder cared for me somehow, which warmed my soul a little, even though I was about to marry him against my will. But what was his interest in such an unusual marriage? I did not understand. I knew that in my world, 
marriages could be arranged or arranged by families, but a fictitious one, and in this world where everyone reads each other's minds. Why? I had to find out if I wanted to get out of there. I thought, looking at the preparations for the performance before the platform. Of course, I'm not marrying Thunder. I may have to go through with the ceremony, but it doesn't mean anything to me, I'm practically in captivity here, and I don't love Thunder, and I never will. I need to escape from here, and I guess I'll have to do it alone. But how? I was still trying to figure out what to do next, but I knew I had to act independently and not rely on the mage's promises. Who is this Voldemar to me? No one. Why should I believe him? There is no reason to. Perhaps there are other fey here somewhere, or even people, who can help me return to my world. With these thoughts, I prepared to contemplate the upcoming battle in the castle square. I did not notice when Thunder appeared in the arena in front of the platform. He was more undressed than clothed. He wore only a leather loincloth with a metal plate of protection on his most vulnerable spot, and his arms were covered from hands to elbows with protective leather and metal plates. On his feet were leather sandals, and his shins were protected by leather bandages and metal plates. The sword in Thunder's hands was sheetless, and its broad blade glinted in the relentless sunlight. The Thunder Giant's muscles played with every movement, and his entire body was bronze. He seemed to be made of metal. I realized the sweat on his skin made his body look like that, but it was undoubtedly an impressive sight. I looked where Thunder was looking, with his back to me. There was a noise and a roar right out of the sky. I saw a creature's enormous, webbed wings and belly circling the castle square above me. Oh my god! it is a dragon. I thought in horror and amazement as I sat with my head thrown up. There was a commotion in the crowd of Fay as they shouted something to thunder. He raised his sword, trying to catch and reflect a ray of sunlight with its blade and aim it at the dragon. Finally, a ray of sunlight came directly into the dragon's eyes. The creature let out a long roar and descended sharply, clamping its wings to its body and diving sharply downward. A couple of seconds later, sand and dust flew into my face as the dragon landed in the middle of the castle square. I coughed and covered my face and eyes with my hands. When I could open my eyes, I saw something huge just a few meters away. It was a dragon, or rather, its back and tail. Their total length was 15 meters. The dragon's head was the size of a passenger car, and there were puffs of smoke coming out of its nostrils. Perhaps its exhalation was so thick and filled with vapor or gas that it seemed like smoke. The dragon's jaws were open, revealing huge teeth, many rows of them, and the fangs stood out for their size and whiteness. The sides of the dragon's body expanded and contracted as it inhaled and exhaled, moving like the mechanism of some massive motor driven by steam power. I imagined I knew from somewhere this was what dinosaurs might have looked like, but I could not remember where I knew it from. The dragon was so giant that I could have compared its torso in size to three elephants or an intercity double-decker bus. Or was it the size of a brontosaurus? From somewhere in the depths of my memory, that association surfaced. As I looked at the dragon, I felt no fear. Probably because none of the fays around me felt fear. So, there was something I did not understand. Why aren't they afraid of him? I thought, shuddering and looking at this extraordinary creature with admiration. Is Thunder really going to kill this dragon? Why? For my sake or their customs, as Voldemar had hinted to me? I was outraged at the thought that this magnificent and unusual creature could be injured or even die just because the Fae wanted to have fun. Suddenly, 
I jumped up from my seat and, picking up the hem of my dress, jumped off the platform and into the arena. Before anyone could do anything, I was between Thunder, still standing with his sword raised, and the dragon. A sigh of surprise swept through the fey crowd. Then, everyone froze, waiting for the outcome of the situation. I stood with my back to the dragon and my face to Thunder. I did not care what the creature was doing behind my back. I watched that Thunder would not entertain his subjects with this foolish slaying of a dragon who had come to this square at his beck and call to meet his death. I raised my head so that Thunder could see my confidence in what I was about to say and spoke up. Stop. Don't. My arms spread apart, protecting the dragon dozens of times bigger than me. Thunder lowered his sword and stared at me, stunned. He had expected nothing like this from the stranger the Dark Oracle had prepared for him to marry. He must have thought he was dealing with a frightened girl who was shocked by everything happening to her and unable to take decisive action. Thunder's face changed. The expression of determination changed to surprise, and then, I thought, a shadow of satisfaction flickered across it, if you could say that about his face, half of it was like a poorly carved mask. Thunder stuck his sword into the sand of the arena in front of him, leaned on it with both hands and said in a hoarse voice. I obey, my lady. I could not tell if he meant it or mocked it. The fay roared, so the dragon grunted behind me and blew his wet breath at me. I turned to the creature and saw it slowly and cautiously, bringing its head closer to me. I reached out and touched its nostril, the size of a furnace opening. The dragon sniffed at me. First, he sucked in air with his nostrils, and I was drawn almost to his mouth. Then it exhaled, and I was blasted with moisture and steam, like from a sauna. But the breath was not stinky it was just spicy. I suddenly realized that this dragon was just an herbivorous animal or amphibian that, despite its sinister-looking teeth and fangs, fed on grass or something vegetative. I did not know if all the dragons in this world were so harmless, but this one was now, my, dragon, I could see it in his eyes. He even winked at me, or so I thought, and then shook his head as if asking me to escape him. I stepped to the arena's edge and lowered my sword, and Thunder did the same. The dragon, sharply pushing off the ground with all four paws, spread its massive wings in the air and, flapping them, swept me off my feet. I fell, thrown from where I stood, and rolled on the arena's sand, hitting my side against the fence. A flurry of dust and sand filled my mouth and nose with them. I coughed and curled up on the ground, covering my face with my hands so I would not get hurt by the debris flying from the arena surface with each flap of the dragon's wings. The dragon's wings could be heard high above and soon died down. I was lying at the arena's edge, still in a ball. I could not open my eyes, covered in sand and dust, but firm hands lifted me and brought me to my feet. Water was splashed on my face. I opened my eyes. Thunder stood before me, holding me by the shoulders with both hands. Amos was standing next to him. They were both staring at me. Neither of them expected me to do anything as I had done here. I had ruined their feast, broken their traditions. I'm about to be punished, I thought gloomily, wiping my face and smearing the dust and tears from my eyes. But Thunder, taking his hands off my shoulders, turned and shook his arms up, shaking them and exclaiming to the face surrounding the arena. Hey, well, could I have picked a better bride? Isabella is the best in the entire world. Praise Isabella. The thunder of their shouts was like a shaft of emotion I could not handle anymore. All the fae, the dragons, and the mages were too much for me. 
I wanted only one thing, to go home. And to do that, I had no choice but to go through with this stupid wedding ceremony, which, according to Voldemar the mage, was supposed to take place today. Scene 9. Preparing for the Wedding After the dragon blew his breath on me in a grateful gust and, in addition, pelted me with sand and rubble, I had to go back to the castle and wash up. The maids had already brought a barrel to my bedroom and filled it with warm water. Solutions of some aromatic herbs were added to the water. I just basked in that aroma and the lather of the excellent soap, which smelled like a rose. While these women washed me with huge loofahs made of natural sponge and did not let me do anything myself, I sat in the barrel on a stool set up inside and, spreading my arms over the edges of the barrel, enjoyed the moment of tenderness and relaxation. When I came out of the barrel, the maids wrapped me in a huge fluffy towel and led me to the screen by the bed, behind which I changed. So, the inevitable moment arrived. I was being prepared for the festivities preceding the wedding ceremony. But somehow, I thought I would be led to the scaffold. However, the next dress I was to wear was luxurious. Despite my aversion to the upcoming wedding, I could not help but admit that Thunder had tried to choose a gorgeous outfit for me, his future wife. The corset of the blue dress, embroidered with silver roses, emphasized my breasts and waist. The corset of the blue dress, embroidered with silver roses, emphasized my breasts and waist. My curls were lifted and beautifully pinned with pearl combs. But I did not care what I wore to the wedding. I wanted only one thing, that all this would be over soon, and I would be free from these charms, from this nightmare in which I was to be the wife of a man as unpleasant as this thunder. Somehow, I no longer felt the disgust of him I had felt before when I first saw his disfigured face. Now, he seemed even a little unhappy to me, he was marrying a woman who did not love him. Yes, a marriage arranged by some higher power that even such a powerful high fae could not fight. Or did you not want to? But that was something I would find out after this ceremony was over and he and I were alone. He doesn't think I'd get into bed with him, does he? No, never. These thoughts ran through my head, but I did not know how to convince my designated husband not to touch me. If this marriage was necessary for both of us, one thing I did not need was his touch and his desire to have sex with me. Nothing like this is out of the question. I thought as the maids toweled my hair dry, dressed me in a gorgeous wedding gown, and arranged my hair in an intricate, high hairstyle adorned with vivid purple flowers of an unusually intoxicating fragrance. Finally, I was ready to appear in front of my fiancé. I did not know the wedding ceremony or when it would take place. Still, since I had no choice but to trust the mage and fulfill his agreement terms, I would have to obey and follow their wedding ritual. As the maids led me again through the partly familiar corridors of the castle, I held the hem of my dress with both hands. I occasionally adjusted my necklace, pressing my neck and chest slightly. I did not know why they asked me to wear that necklace again. I remembered how it had burned Arsenia's hands, though it had not hurt me. I did not know why that necklace was so selective, this time, I took great care putting it on. But nothing terrible happened. Arsenia, who had already returned to work after burning her palms, carefully put it on my neck with her hands, clad in thick leather gloves. I already knew that this fire necklace would not harm me. When its weight rested on my neck and shoulders, I felt hot momentarily, as if I were before a fire. But the sensation passed quickly, faster than it had the first time. I was going into my wedding with thunder, hoping I would not get any more magical surprises and would have to go through the ceremony. The only thing that helped me hold on to this situation was that I had agreed with Voldemar. 
I still did not know what Thunder stood to gain from this wedding, but that did not matter now. And, of course, having an intimate relationship with Thunder was something other than what I had envisioned. In the meantime, I was led out of the castle and through the square. In the middle of the court was a white carriage pulled by a small white dragon. Both were covered in golden designs like painted Baroque boxes. I remembered the concept from somewhere. There was hope that someday my memory would return to me entirely, and I could figure out how to get home without that dreaded mage's condition of imminent marriage. But there was no time to rely on anything but my wits. The dragon snorted like a real horse and flapped its white, down-covered, leathery wings like a rooster that wants to but cannot fly high. I was used to surprises every time I left the castle. But that a dragon pulled the carriage, and a white dragon at that, made me nervous. I laughed nervously and looked around for someone who could tell me if it was safe for me to get into a carriage pulled by a white dragon alone. I was alone because all the maids, including Arsenia, had stepped back and stood around me, heads bowed as if saying goodbye to me forever. I could not catch a glance from any of the maids, and I realized I had to follow the transportation choice. I decided and, picking up the hem of my dress, stepped into the carriage, which one of the fae opened with a warning, and sat on its seat. The carriage's interior was white leather, embroidered with golden designs, which were dragons and some thrones. The dragon spread its white wings, and I noticed that blue blood flowed through its veins in them. I saw it and closed my eyes. In my past life, only aristocrats had blue blood, or that's what they said. And here is a white dragon with blue blood. Well, let's start a new life. I folded my hands in my lap, closed my eyes, and relaxed into the sensation of flying. As I flew in the white carriage pulled by the white dragon, I thought momentarily that my blood was red. But that strange sensation flickered in my mind and disappeared. When I pulled myself together and looked out the carriage window again, the dragon was still flapping its wings in the same measured way. I saw that the castle, the square, and the fae who had come out to the court to see me off were all far below, fading. I felt dizzy. I grabbed the rail of the carriage with my hand. I was afraid to look out now because the dragon had lifted us so high that the clouds were below us. The dragon flapped its massive wings and rose higher and higher. We flew, making circles as if floating in a whirlpool of air that made us higher and higher. I leaned back in the carriage seat and closed my eyes. I was afraid to look down. But more than anything, I wanted to know where this dragon was taking me and where Thunder, my so-called future husband, was. Scene 10 The Goddess Espina when I opened my eyes, the dragon was on its way down to the ground. The carriage touched the wheels of the road, which was paved with stones that glittered in the sunlight as if made of crystal or cut glass and stopped. The dragon folded its wings, and I exited the carriage and looked around. In front of me stood a temple building that was made of glass. High towers were erected on the edges of the main temple building, the entrance open to all, there were no doors. Inside the transparent temple, slightly shaded by the curves of the lancet vaults of the temple halls, the outlines of which I could see even from the outside, were hung with luminous chandeliers, from which poured the same bright blue light that I remembered upon my awakening in this world. I looked around. There was nothing, only the forest, and that crystal temple. I realized I should go to the temple and find my destiny there. Maybe Thunder was somewhere in the temple. Why do I have to do everything myself? I'm getting married against my will, and no one even meets me here. I thought in annoyance as I walked through the temple doorway. 
and then a flood of bright blue light came upon me. This light flooded everything in the temple, the windows, the vaults of the temple hall, and the benches in front of the altar. The altar was also made of glass or some transparent stone. A tall totem or something like it was placed on it. This totem, made of metal unlike anything else in the temple, was carved with dragons and the faces of some creatures, unlike human or fey faces. These faces were contorted with grimaces of horror, aggression, or sadness. I stood in front of this totem, unable to move. I could not take my eyes off it off those faces. Suddenly, there was a rustle behind me. I turned around. Thunder was standing right behind me. My fiancé was dressed in a white caftan and pants embroidered with silver and decorated with faceted gems glittering in the blue light. His black hair was loose and fell loosely over his shoulders. Thunder wore white boots of the softest leather embroidered with silver dragons. The giant's waist was cinched by a white leather belt, which hung a sword. This eternal companion of thunder, the sword, was in a scabbard adorned with colorful gems, not the black sheath worn from the trek, as usual. Thunder was looking right at me. Looking over his appearance, I knew he was also looking all over me, from head to toe and back again. I felt his gaze stop on my face. I looked up, and finally, our gazes met. A man was looking at me, studying his future wife. Thunder was looking for an answer in my eyes, whether I would be a good wife and life friend to him. But that was precisely what I could not promise him. How can you promise each other something you don't feel or want? Thunder was the first to break the silence. I see you made it to our wedding venue. Did you have a good flight? The sound of his voice awakened me to reality. The question, did you have a good flight, reminded me of something from my other life, but I could not understand why people in that life asked each other that. And now, I needed to communicate with my future husband. I got right down to business. Thunder his name came off my lips as a plea for leniency, as an admission that I was in his hands, in his net in this fey world. My fiancé also noticed that my voice lacked the bravery I had shown when I had defended the dragon from his sword. He tilted his head toward me as if trying to hear better what else I would say to him. I continued. I spoke to the mage, Voldemar who said our wedding is a sham. We must agree on what we're doing so that everyone around us believes we're a real couple. I was unsure I was doing the right thing, telling him what I thought about the wedding. But Thunder nodded his head understandingly and answered, lowering his voice. I understand. Yes, we can work things out, but not in the way you think. For now, we must do things like they're supposed to be done, play the wedding. My heart dropped. Thunder did not want to come to any agreement that he would not lay a finger on me as my husband. Panic gripped me, and I turned pale, backing away from him. Thunder quickly grabbed my forearm and shook me hard, bringing me to my senses. Wake up. Don't make a scene here and disrupt our first wedding ceremony. His voice was low but sounded threatening. This ceremony is very important, and if it doesn't go how it should, then everything you agreed upon with the mage will become unimportant. I stood before him, tears streaming from my eyes from helplessness. I was trapped. The mage had forced me to accept terms that Thunder had no intention of fulfilling for me. What a fool I am. The thought flashed through my mind, and immediately, my brain went into overdrive, looking for a way to escape this monster's grasp and escape. But where? And when? 
I was powerless before him now, he would catch up with me in one leap, and it was unclear what would wait for me afterward. I replied in a suppressed voice. Okay, okay. What do I have to do? My hands were clenched into fists from excitement, I straightened up and stood like that before my future husband, not looking him in the eyes but only at his boots. Thunder uttered conciliatingly. Okay, then listen. We're going through the first rite of marriage now, and it's not final. A regular wedding for everyone will follow it, but not right away, after a while. I listened, swallowing tears of frustration and anger, then asked. What do I have to do now? Stand beside me and do what I will do. Talk only about what I will talk about, Thunder replied. He took my arm and pulled me straight toward him with those words. I was on his left side and, restrained by his arm around my elbow, pressed against his side so tightly that I could not move a step away. Thunder looked down at me and, satisfied that I was not breaking free of his grip, let me go. I stood beside him, wishing more than anything that he would disappear from here, disappear from my life, and that I would wake up from this nightmare. But the action continued. A column of blue smoke sprang to the altar, enveloping the totem. When the smoke cleared, a woman stood in the totem's place. She was dressed in a robe and light toga, like an Amazon. Thunder bowed respectfully to her, pulling me to turn with him. I obeyed, but I kept my eyes on the woman. While we stood like that, a woman came down from the altar and walked straight toward us on the platform, treading gracefully on it with her bare feet. She was all white and the blue light gave her an ethereal glow. Her beautiful face and luscious figure made her look like a mature woman in the prime of life. Thunder lifted his head and straightened. I straightened, too, staring at the stranger approaching us. The woman stopped right in front of us, raised a beautifully shaped hand, and said in a melodious voice, May grace and happiness be with you, my dears. Thunder bowed again, and I turned to her just like that again, following his example. The woman continued. I see many challenges before you. Your life will be challenging and eventful, some pleasant and some terrible. Are you ready for that? Thunder replied in a muffled voice. Yes, we're ready for that. I just nodded my head. My voice would not listen to me. I could not lie if she asked if we loved each other. But she did not ask that. In that case, I could continue my game and try to bring Thunder to the arrangement the mage had told me was a possible sham marriage. The woman turned quickly and walked back down the aisle. Thunder reached out to her and asked. Great Espina, what do you see in our future? The woman bowed, thinking about the question Thunder had asked her, but did not turn around. Only as she climbed the steps back to the altar did the woman turn to us again and answer. I can see that you have a future. But I can't tell you what it is. The time will come, and you will see and understand everything for yourselves. I can say that this future depends on your mutual efforts. I bless you in this marriage. From this moment, you are spouses, and all other ceremonies are unimportant. Farewell. Again, the smoke enveloped her, and after a few seconds, no one was on the altar. I looked questioningly at Thunder. What was that? Did she bless us for marriage? Who is she, this Espina? Thunder replied, still looking at the altar. She is our supreme goddess, who was once a supreme fay, like me. Her world was destroyed, and she created a new world for herself that we fay have no access to. 
but sometimes she condescends to us and gives blessings or curses to the marriages of the high fae. Thunder was silent for a moment, turned away from the altar, and added, looking at me. In our case, we got a blessing. Although I had a lot of doubts about it. But now we are husband and wife, and we can move on and do our normal wedding. I shuddered and took a step back from him. When do we have to go through the usual wedding rituals? I whispered, crossing my arms over my chest, trying to protect myself from the reality washing over me in waves of fear and despair. We will return to my castle and go through the wedding ceremony in front of all our fae subjects. And you must obey me and do as I say. Because you're my future husband. Or because you're a man. My mind raced like horses on the prairie, but I said nothing. It would have been useless, for my fate and his fate, as far as he was concerned, was sealed. But I had not given up hope I might still avoid the wedding. After that, I was not myself in the first stage of the wedding. So what if Voldemar promised me that Thunder would never touch me with the intention of sexual gratification without my consent? How can I trust this mage when Thunder denied such an intention? I thought. But the wedding agreement had been enacted, and I had to follow Thunder. He and I got into the same white carriage in which I had arrived at this crystal temple, and, in complete silence, the dragon brought us back to Thunder Castle. Thunder and I sat in different corners of the carriage as we traveled and stared out its windows. Neither of us wanted to talk. We were completely immersed in our thoughts. It was strange to me, however, that Thunder did not notice me now, as if I did not exist. He had just married me with the blessing of their goddess Espina. If he's getting ready to be my husband, he could show a little consideration for my feelings. He's just a callous jerk. I thought, glancing at Thunder across from me. Thunder was looking out the carriage window, and the side of his face that was untouched by the scar suddenly seemed to me the face of a beautiful statue of a demon. The wavy hair, the satyr's mouth, the proud profile. I turned away, trying to suppress any feelings for Thunder that reminded me he could be attractive, too, if he wanted to be. But those thoughts flickered and were gone. When we flew back to the Fey Castle, Thunder's subjects greeted us with applause and shouts, wishing us many years of happiness. I was disgusted by all this. The sight of my future husband and the sight of those faces made me sick. Thunder was the first to get out of the carriage, and he gave me a hand to lean on. I straightened up proudly at first, thinking to be tough, and got down from the carriage myself. But, realizing that everyone was looking at us and hundreds of attentive eyes were searching for signs of a happy couple in our behavior, I accepted his gesture with politeness. I leaned on Thunder's arm and climbed down from the carriage. Thankfully, he bowed to me immediately and turned and strode quickly away in the direction opposite the door to my part of the castle. Dreams A Fey Fantasy Romance Written by Misha Quinn All Rights Reserved, 2023 Book cover by Misha Quinn and Book Brush Templates, 2023. Auto narrated audio files created on Mike Monster's resource by using Pro Max license, 2023. Dreams A Fey Fantasy Romance. Written by Misha Quinn. All Rights Reserved, 2023 Book Cover by Misha Quinn and Book Brush Templates, 2023
Auto-narrated audio files created on Mike Monster's resource by using Pro Max license, 2023. Scene 11. Dark Oracle and Escape. The day after the first wedding night, Thunder entered my bedroom without knocking. To my relief, I was already awake and wearing the one dress the maids had prepared for me. A vast man stood at the door, almost touching the top of his head to the doorway. I froze, not saying hello. I should train him to knock on my door, but what's the use? He's so wild. I turned to him, and I shuddered. I was afraid he had forgotten everything and had come to me like this because he had changed the game's rules. Thunder regarded me like a precious toy he had been bought but not given, afraid he had to break it immediately. There was no lust in his gaze, just curiosity and, I thought, a little contempt. Let him despise himself because I'm sticking to our agreement, and I don't even think about approaching him or breaking into his chambers without his invitation. And what would I do there? Nothing is interesting there, I thought as I stared at him. Thunder, meanwhile, shifted his gaze to the window and said, We should get going. Be ready in half an hour or sooner. Wear clothes befitting my wife not these rags. He crossed the space between us with these words with a single step. Standing before me, Thunder rummaged through the pile of dresses on the chest beside the bed and pulled out one, richly embellished with intricate silver embroidery on dark green velvet. This one will suit you for our walk, he said in a tone that accepted no objections and left my room. I picked up his chosen dress and threw it at the fireplace. It did not hit and landed on a pile of ash by the fireplace opening. After running around the room for a bit, I sighed heavily, walked over to the fireplace, and picked the dress up off the floor. I shook the dress off, and the ash quickly flew off. Now the dress could be put on. I had to obey thunder in everything that did not concern our sex. That was the mage's condition, and I would not break it. I also understood that Thunder did not want his courtiers to realize we had no intimacy. Our marriage was as much for Thunder as it was for me. I just wanted to leave here and regain my memory and old life. And a plan to escape was slowly maturing in my head. Half an hour later, I was standing in the castle courtyard, wearing that dress of green velvet with silver embroidery. The long hem of the cloak the maids had persuaded me to wear fell to the ground from my shoulders, and its hood could almost wholly cover my head and my intricately woven, silver-embroidered hair. Arsenia had helped me do it. She was now one of my chosen maids, and the others accepted it. Not all of them would have dared to sacrifice themselves so much to do their master's bidding and persuade me to wear one of their dresses and that necklace of fire. There was a carriage waiting in the castle's courtyard. I saw before me a vast shell of some colossal sea mollusk, the twisted horn of which rose above the enormous wheels of the carriage almost to my height. In the shell's opening were seats, which looked quite comfortable, covered with embroidered leather. When I got closer to the carriage, I was surprised. The carriage was once again pulled by a dragon. It was small and blue. Its wings were already spread and towered over the carriage and me like two domes. The dragon was sniffing, and its breathing was like the work of a steam engine. However, I could only compare it to something I had seen only twice in my life, steam locomotives had already become museum pieces, and the way they worked, I had learned only from movies. I looked back at the maid, not knowing how to enter the carriage. Still, she had already stepped aside, respectfully bowing to her master. Yes, Thunder was already standing next to me. Realizing I was in a quandary, he hummed loudly, picked me up from behind under my arms, 
lifted me, and quickly placed me right on the floor of the carriage. I did not have time to say anything and realized he was helping me, not wanting to find an excuse to touch me. So I looked around in the carriage and sat down on the seat facing the direction of travel. Thunder swung from the ground to the carriage in one leap and, standing in it, whistled sharply. The dragon turned toward him, and even to me, it seemed like he winked at his master and flapped its wings. I did not realize we were in the air, in the dust. The dragon circled higher and higher above the castle, this time, I could see everything. I realized this castle was a natural fortress. The court itself was in the middle of a massive square of fortified fortress city, surrounded by a thick stone wall, on top of which a wagon like the one we were now flying up could ride and fit a couple more pedestrians. On the pointed towers of the fortress, I hung narrow, long flags of dark blue color with some images that I could no longer make out. We flew high enough that the dragon finally stopped spiraling and flew parallel to the ground. Even though I was terrified of heights and sat with my hands clutched frantically to the edge of the leather seat, I enjoyed the view. Fields, forests, and plains were left behind. We flew towards the mountain peaks, shrouded in clouds and glistening with snowy caps. Between some of them, Streams descended into the valleys, turning into turbulent streams of mountain rivers. In the distance, I could see the shore of the sea or some vast body of water. Looking out of the carriage's window, flying over all this splendor, I thought wistfully that I would trade all this for a simple view from my window, but in my world. When we arrived at the place where the dragon was lowered to the ground by Thunder's order, I could barely get out of our carriage shell on my own from fatigue and nervous tension. Thunder wanted to lift me again, but I gestured for him to refuse his help and climbed to the ground myself. I need to be more independent, or he'll always think I need his help. And I did not want him to touch me again. With vast strides, Thunder headed toward the woods near the field. I followed him, stepping back constantly and shaking off the hem of my long dress. It was incomprehensible to me why their women wore such long clothes. Probably so that they would not run away from their husbands. No, he's not my husband. He's nobody. I repeated my thoughts like a chant. I don't need him. I need to get out of here, and everything will be normal. Thunder did not turn around. I could see his massive figure in front of me, and suddenly, I noticed how lightly he walked as if he were dancing. It was strange, for he was such a massive man. His sword was in its sheath, bumping against Thunder's thigh as he walked, but he did not notice it. Finally, we came to a cave of some sort. The entrance was blocked by huge boulders, which one man could not move. But Thunder approached the boulders and, resting his shoulder on one of them, his whole body edged. The colossal boulder first shook, and after the giant Thunder's repeated attempts to push it away from the rock, it broke loose and rolled away from the cave's opening. After that, Thunder had already easily moved the rest of the stones out of the way. I watched from the side and only came to the cave when he called out to me. The cave smelled of the age-old dampness of the dungeon. It seemed to be haunted. A distant noise could be heard from the cave's depths as if an underground stream of water was rushing through it. Thunder entered the cave first and, stopping a step from its entrance inside the cave, turned to me. I was still hesitant to step into that horrible hole. He held out his hand to me, and I had to take it with my hand to avoid stumbling on the slippery stones that littered the dungeon's floor. I felt the strength of his palm, and it made me uneasy. I did not want to think anything good about this monster. He was a monster, and how he looked at me, even with the unmutilated half of his face turned toward me, made me shiver. 
We walked inside the cave. In front of us, in total darkness, we could hear the dripping of water more clearly. I followed Thunder, trying to keep up with him. So far, he had not said a word to me about why we were here. At last, a considerable cavern opened before us, with light coming from some source above our heads. I lifted my head, trying to see the source of the light. The light was coming through some giant transparent crystal suspended under the cave vault. It needed to be clarified whether the crystal itself was glowing, the light from the sun, or some other light source was shining. The light from the crystal was falling in a rainbow on the dark water of a small lake, which was right in front of us at the bottom of the cave. While I was looking at the crystal and the rays of light falling from it onto the lake, Thunder walked to the lake's edge and pulled a chain out of the water. It rattled with huge links, and an old wooden boat appeared out of the cave's darkness. On the bow of the boat was a carved figure of a dragon. I thought dragons were as common here as they had been in my past life, but I still could remember nothing from my past life. As I pulled the boat toward the shore, Thunder went knee-deep in the water and, holding the boat with one hand, held out the other to help me step from the beach into the boat. I had no choice but to lean on his arm again. Again, I was struck by the sensation of his strength. Thunder did not stagger as I leaned on his arm with my whole body and pushed my foot off the shore to jump into the boat. Once in the boat, I quickly removed my hand from his arm. To hide my embarrassment, I rushed to the other end of the boat and sat on the bench at the stern. All the while, Thunder held the boat with his hands to keep it from rocking. He looked at me sideways and grinned at me. His scarred face seized on a boyish, mischievous expression. I turned away from him and stared at the dark water of the underground lake. I wondered why Thunder said nothing about why we were there. None of his courtiers or warrior friends had come with us. What does he want to show me? I thought. And why? When we reached the opposite shore of the underground lake, I saw what looked like an altar on the beach. It was as tall as a two-story house and made of dark stone. It was more like a temple to some deity in their world. Thunder was the first to jump out of the boat and into the water, and he gave me his hand again. I leaned on his hand without fear and jumped to the ground without getting my feet wet. Thunder had not spoken a word since we had embarked on this journey. He stood there now, hands on his hips and legs wide apart. He looked like a deity, so stern and majestic was his appearance. Thunder walked up to this altar, kneeled, and bowed his head. I stood behind him, not knowing what I should do. Thunder stood up, turned to me, and said, You, too, can worship the Dark Oracle. He protects our kind and we need to serve him. You've already had the good fortune to hear from a mage, so I don't need to tell you anything more about him. But none of that was true. When I remembered that the mage had said something about the Dark Oracle and his prediction to Thunder, I was suddenly interested and moved closer to the altar. The image of a man looked like an old man with a beard, unlike the fay I had seen here. The old man held a scroll in front of him, and a sword was on the stone in front of him. This image of the oracle was half erased as if it had been polished by thousands of touches from the hands of the fay who worshipped him. I also ran my hand over the old man's image and touched the sword and scroll. While I tried to examine the image of a male figure carved into it, Thunder stood behind me and watched my actions. Then he touched my hand lightly, explaining. The Dark Oracle lived centuries ago. But his predictions are valid and form an essential part of our laws. He also protects us from our enemies, and believe me, we have plenty of them. Come closer and talk to him. 
talking to a long-dead oracle. Is that possible? I thought. But seeing Thunder's seriousness, I leaned over the stone base relief and suddenly felt a breeze. It was as if a swallow or a night mouse had flown over and touched my cheek with its wing. My curls, out of my hair, flew to the sides. I saw a grey shadow at the end of the steeple that crowned the altar as if a soft blob of smoke or cloud hung over the altar. Suddenly, out of that cloud appeared the face of a man with a beard, so proper that I could not believe it was the same dark oracle. Thunder stepped, leaned toward me, and whispered in my ear. It's a good sign that he showed up. He accepts you. He recognizes my choice. But then I inwardly resented it. There he goes again, his choice. Why doesn't anyone ask me what I want? What am I, a slave? But I had to clench my teeth and look up at the oracle, turning away from the monster. The oracle melted away as time passed, and a light puff of smoke drifted upward beneath the cave vault. The light of the crystal faded, and thunder hurried me away. Well, now we must get out of here as soon as possible. It'll be dark soon, and won't be safe here. But I suddenly felt I got out of this hated castle and got rid of my unwelcome husband. Now I knew when and how I would escape him and my unhappy fate, which had been set for me by this oracle, wizard, and thunder. I turned to thunder and, with an unexpectedly kind smile, said. Thunder, I'd like to, go to the, bathroom. You know, I have to, you know. Thunder seemed to have no way of expecting that I might have some human needs. Maybe he just never needs it, I thought, but I have to go to the bathroom often. I thought I knew nothing about the physiology of the high fay, just as they knew nothing about mine. They may not have to go to the bathroom in their world. But I do because I eat and drink. In fact, at Thunder's castle, I was constantly fed excellent food, game, fruit, and water with berry juice in it. I did not understand why it never occurred to him that, after all that, I needed to go to the bathroom occasionally. Though perhaps only Thunder had not thought of that. When I arrived at the castle, the maids showed me where their women's restroom was. Thunder looked around, his face taking on the amused and confused expression of a man suddenly asked to change a baby's diaper. I had gotten that association from somewhere, but it was so funny. And it was even funnier because he did not know what I was up to. Finding nothing like a cover, Thunder looked at me and said. Okay, but we need to get to the other side of the lake first. Jump in the boat, and I'll find a good place for you. I found myself in the boat, leaning again on his hand. Thunder sat at the oars again and rowed slowly toward the opposite shore. His muscles worked like the mechanism of a fine-tuned machine, the strokes were smooth and robust, without jolts. The boat went so smoothly over the water's surface that I appreciated his rowing skills. I sat on the boat's bow and tried not to look at Thunder. For a moment, I thought I heard something else slap against the water's surface beside the sounds the oars made as they sank evenly into the water. I looked around but saw nothing in the dark water of the underground lake. We swam to the shore of the lake, and Thunder, no longer offering me his arms, just picked me up and carried me to the beach. I felt like he was playing with me. He was so intense I could do nothing against him. It was as if Thunder was bragging about being able to lift me so quickly, and he showed his strength every time it was justified. As Thunder lowered me to the lake's rocky shore, I quickly bounced away from my husband, but I was not ready to run away yet. I realized he would catch up with me quickly that way. I had to hide from him and to do that, 
I had to find a hiding place behind which I could run away for a while, hoping that he would not immediately notice my disappearance. Then, I would discover humans or other fae and ask them for help to return to my world. I looked around and, choosing a sheltered spot, pointed to the trunk of a huge tree that had fallen over in the storm. I could crouch behind its thick trunk for my toilet and then run away as fast as possible, hoping my fearsome guardian would not notice. Thunder nodded in agreement and turned away, staring at the opposite side of the lake with contempt. I was free to go that way, away from him, behind the trunk of that tree. No sooner had I stepped behind the trunk of the massive tree than I heard a rustle behind me. It was not a rustle but the rustling of massive scales on the shore's rocks. I turned around and froze in horror. The jaws of a monstrous creature were hanging over me, looking at me with interest. But the phrase, gazing at me, was not correct. Instead, the monstrous creature intended to hunt me, and I had no chance of surviving, for its gaze was nothing like that of the dragons with whom I had developed a good relationship in the fey world. I shrank back in horror, forgetting my escape plan. I wanted nothing more than to escape this nightmare I had unwillingly gotten myself into. I stood there, unmoving and, it seemed to me, almost out of breath, with my head thrown upward, saying goodbye to my life. The colossal head was that of a monster that looked like a giant serpent. The triangular, Blunt face with its mouth open, in which a split black tongue fluttered, caused a feeling of disgust. Although the head was the size of a decent-sized couch, the body I saw while standing in front of this creature of darkness was that of a snake but with the legs of a crocodile. I could not even think about running. I stood frozen, waiting for my life to end. What will this monster do to me? Will it swallow me alive, and will I gradually die in its dark stomach? Or, having seized me with its jaws, it will immediately break me in half and leave me lying here, behind this tree, waiting for my body to decompose enough to become pleasant to its taste. I thought, imagining the pictures of my fate. I could not control these thoughts, they flowed in my mind. And as the thoughts floated through my mind, I knew I was still alive. Suddenly, the serpent, or a monster like it, twisted its head to the side. Thunder was standing in front of the snake with the sword drawn. No matter how strong and tall Thunder was, he seemed like a pygmy compared to the colossal serpent. I could finally breathe and instinctively reached out to Thunder, begging him for protection and caution. But Thunder was not looking at me his gaze was fixed on the snake. Without looking at me, Thunder waved his hand, pointing to the forest, which was quite far away, beyond the clearing, and I realized I had to run. I jumped over a tree trunk but tripped and fell onto the grass. I had no strength to get up and thought this was my life's end. No warrior like Thunder could save me anymore, his power was too unequal to face such an opponent. Their games of fighting a dragon were just child's play compared to fighting such a predator. I squirmed like a baby in a cradle and closed my eyes. Suddenly, I felt the unimaginably powerful hissing of a monstrous snake right next to me. In the exact second, Thunder's strong hand lifted me off the ground, grabbing me by the waistband of my outfit. Thunder's face was covered in blood from the wound on his forehead and trickled down his brow straight to the scar on his cheek. He shook me so hard I thought I would fly away from him a couple of meters. Thunder brought his mangled, bloody face closer to me and growled. Run, Ella. Run. Glancing back at the serpent, which was wriggling around, already clearly coming to its senses from its first defeat in the fight, he added. Run, I'll protect you. Go straight to the forest and wait for me there. 
The thunder looked terrible, but the serpent was even scarier, so I obeyed the giant and ran away again with all my might. Behind me, I could hear the terrible hissing of the serpent and the guttural shouts of thunder, who were evading the serpent's throes or attacking it. I had neither the energy nor the time to stop to turn around and watch thunder fight the monster. However, in a battle of two monsters, one would win, probably the serpent. I did not feel sorry for thunder. I ran away from all this horror, stumbling over the roots of the trees, thinking only that if the serpent ate my high fay, I would have time to escape as far away as possible, just as thunder had advised me. I stopped to catch my breath when I reached the forest's edge. I turned back and saw thunder standing on the serpent's back. The sword was thrust into the monster's back, and it appeared one of its spines was equipped with the serpent's upper fin. But even at this distance, I could see that thunder was hurt. His left arm was hanging limply along his body, and when he took his eyes off the serpent and looked around, I realized he could not see me. I did not know what it was, but thunder looked straight at me. It was as if he did not see me as he drifted his gaze to the other side of the forest and looked around at the other side of the clearing, opposite where I was standing. I felt a twinge of gratitude to him for saving me. Still, I thought he had brought me here and was protecting his property, his still unfinished wife, in a dangerous situation. From such thoughts, sympathy for my husband's wounds and his courageous act immediately vanished. It's his life, and he does what he wants with it and how he wants. And I want to figure out my normal life and regain my memory. And then come home after that. I thought, turning again towards the forest and entering its darkness. I knew that thunder was not my home but a place where my life was being tested and threatened. I had to get out of here fast. There may have been people, not giants or monsters, and I could find help. I never looked back again. That thunder had saved me meant nothing to me now. I was free of him now, and I was running away. Scene 12 The Mage and Isabella's Secret I walked through the dense undergrowth, and the branches cut my hands to a bloody pulp. My dress was a rag of rags that dangled from my wounded body. The only joy was that I was wearing my favorite thin leather boots. Even though I had been walking for an hour or more, my feet remained intact. I needed to catch up on time. I noticed it was getting dark, and a chilling fear of being alone in this strange forest without a roof over my head entered my soul. When my hope of finding people and a decent shelter over my head was almost gone, some yellow light appeared ahead like a small street lamp. Its light flickered in the wind, but I still had a guide to where to go. Finally, I came to a hut made of solid tree trunks with a sloping roof covered with grass and moss. The hut seemed to grow right out of the trunk of the massive tree at the foot of which it was attached. I went to the hut's door, and before I could even grasp the massive metal ring of its handle with which I could knock on the door, the door opened, and a flood of yellow light fell upon me. That alone pleased me. I did not want to see more of that cold blue light, now firmly associated with the Fey world. The strangely familiar figure of a man appeared in the doorway. A friendly voice sounded. Well, Ella, here you are. Come on in. I've been waiting for you. Voldemar, and it was him, held out his hand and helped me up the slippery, dewy porch steps. He nudged me lightly in the back to get me inside, then closed the front door and watched me as I looked around. Despite my fatigue, the interior and the items it contained intrigued me. The room of the hut was small. A vast, whitewashed stove occupied the central place in the hut. 
It told those who entered the hut that it was impossible to survive in this dark and cold forest without the stove. It was so. Next to the stove was a large table made of roughly hewn boards, the surface scarred and drenched with liquids, which had turned into some strange pattern. Around the table were several similarly around made chairs with very high backs. The backs of the chairs were skillfully decorated with carvings, but as if carved with an axe. The hut's interior needed to be more critical to its occupant. Everything was functional. But for what? I walked inside the hut straight to the stove and collapsed exhausted on the long bench that encircled the entire hut room. There were thin mattresses and many colorful striped and plain patterned pillows on the bench. I looked around for a bed or bedroom but did not see any. The hut's owner slept here, on this bench or the stove. It did not occur to me to ask if Voldemar could give me a blanket to keep me warm. But he had just brought me a sizable, knitted blanket as if he had guessed my thoughts. I covered myself with a blanket and tucked my legs under me on the bench, and only after half an hour I stopped shivering. During that time, the mage warmed my drink, which smelled pleasantly of forest herbs. Voldemar looked at me occasionally and thought for a moment. Still, he opened a large jar of honey and added it to the drink. Why was I sure it was honey and not something else? Because it said, honey, in big letters in the jar. This amused me a little, and my mood improved a little. I slipped my hands out from under the blanket and gingerly took the cup with the hot drink from his hands. I took a sip, a second, a third, and the cup was empty. Warmth spread through my body. I relaxed, pulled the blanket over my shoulders, and fell asleep. I woke up to someone walking and muttering on the creaking wooden floor of the hut. It was Mage Voldemar. He had round glasses on his nose and a magical cap on his head again. Voldemar was also wearing an apron. Half closing my eyes, not moving, I watched what the mage was doing from my place on the bench by the wall. Suddenly, he glanced at me from under his glasses and asked, squinting slyly. So, did you get any sleep yet? There was nothing left for me to do but reply. Yeah, it looks like it. What time is it? Voldemar replied, no longer turning around. It's already light. Time is completely unimportant here at our place. All that matters is the time of day, light or dark. I didn't think that the time should be known before he continued. Time shouldn't interest you. Time runs differently here, not like it does in your world. I stared at him in surprise. How so? It made sense to me I was in some other reality, but to have such a difference in the relationship to time. Voldemar continued his story. Time moves differently for humans here. And for Faye, and even more so for their higher individuals, it simply does not move unless there are significant changes in their lives, which makes them seem eternal to people. What do you mean, forever? I interjected, forgetting that I needed to get up and clean myself up before continuing my journey home, wherever that might be. The high phase are practically immortal, as we know them. For example, thunder. No sooner had he pronounced him my doomed future husband than I jumped up from the bench, throwing off my plaid and screaming. I wish to have nothing to do with that thug. Nothing. Do you realize that? Voldemar turned to me and answered in a swaying tone. Ella, my dear Ella. He wants nothing to do with you either. What? I exhaled in amazement and sat back on the bench. My legs just gave out. I was outraged at the extreme. 
Then why all this show with our marriage and wedding to him if he wants nothing to do with me? Why does he want me? I almost cried with despair. I had to run away from someone who should marry me even though this high lord of Fay, Thunder, does not want to at all, and neither do I. What games are these? Voldemar looked at me testingly as if he had expected such a reaction to his words. He came over to me, touched my shoulder comfortingly with his thin musician's fingers, and said, Poor girl, you do not know what's in store for you. I looked up at him in even more amazement. The mage continued. It's time to discover why you're here. He stepped away from me, who was sitting on the bench with a blanket slumped to the floor. The mage continued. Come with me. I'll show you our world. I stood up and followed him out of the hut entirely unwillingly. Voldemar walked through the forest, which did not seem dark now, far away from the hut. The rising sun's rays penetrated the thicket of trees aslant and glowed like strings strung almost parallel to the ground. It was chilly, but the mage offered nothing like warm clothing. He walked through the forest in a shirt and canvas pants, his belt the only piece of jewelry, embroidered in gold and with a purse attached to it. Finally, Voldemar stopped and turned sharply toward me. I almost tripped over him and stopped as well. The mage looked at the lake that opened in the middle of the forest. The lake was small, most likely formed from some small spring. There was no hint of water or air movement on its surface. The lake's surface was like a dark mirror, reflecting the tops of the surrounding pine and spruce trees. Voldemar stretched his hand over the lake's water surface toward the opposite shore. I could see the altar. The shape and size were familiar. What is this? Why have you brought me to this altar again? I've seen it before. I cried out and was about to turn and run away when suddenly I was enveloped in a veil I could not tear. I stood there as if wrapped in a cloth like a baby, unable to move an arm or a leg. Voldemar turned to me and said, Ella, realize that my power is enough for ten thunders. However, I'm not applying any super strong influence on you. It's only to stop you from running away from your destiny. I have no destiny here. I exclaimed, still trying to unwrap my cocoon. Let me go. I want to go home. There was such desperation and determination in my voice to throw off these magical shackles that Voldemar answered, a little less cocky. All right, all right. Just wait a little while and this power will disappear. Just don't fight it. I relaxed my arms, my consciousness seemed to shut down, and my body relaxed. And indeed, the feeling of shackles disappeared. I was free again. The mage looked at me with pleasure as if he were examining a new toy. He said, Well, there you go. You've proven yourself worthy of thunder. We've chosen a fine wife for him. We? Who's we? Why doesn't anyone ask me anything? I'm not marrying him, all your pre-wedding ceremonies and spirit blessings mean nothing to me. I want to get home, and I want to get home now. I shrieked in rage. Voldemar backed away from me in feigned horror replying. Well, my queen, don't take it so personally. We are me and my counselors. In time, you will learn everything, have no doubt. Well, today I will give you the key to the box, which lies the scroll with your secret. Seeing the look on my face, he hastened to add. Yes, yes, you have your mystery. You will only know your mystery when you can open the casket. 
and that will only happen when you decide whether you stay at least temporarily in the Fey world, the mage said and turned away from me. He did not want to see the expressions of rage and anger alternating between the two on my face. And let this casket remain closed forever, nothing in the world will change from that, I thought. I was dizzy from what the mage was saying. Okay, let's say some oracles and this mage decide my fate. But why would they want Thunder, who has no warm feelings for me, to marry me? Why would he and they do that? And why was I suddenly worthy of Thunder just because I could remove the shackles of Voldemar's magic? Or was there some other reason? These thoughts raced through my head like seagulls over the waves of a stormy sea. Voldemar did not want to tell me anything more. I had to accept that I depended on him and his information. But I had to think of something to escape the Fae and Voldemar's world. While contemplating my escape plan, Voldemar was rustling something in the corner of his hut. Then he appeared in front of me with a box covered with a tattered cloth that had once been dark red. Voldemar carried the box with care and reverence as if he had a real jewel. The mage walked over to me and held out this chest, with a nod encouraging me to take the box in hand. Only part of the box was visible from under the dusty towel. Its surface was covered with carved patterns but not wood carving. The box was covered in a layer of dark red lacquer, with designs cut into the thickness of the color. And those patterns, when I opened the towel, right at me popped out of the sea of blood into the face of a horrible dragon, whose body twisted and wriggled bizarrely with no end. The dragon girdled the entire box, and no matter how hard I tried to figure out how to open it, it must be opened, or why did Voldemar give it to me? I could not figure it out. I could not see where to press or pull to open the lid of this strange box. Voldemar watched my attempts to explore the box with amusement. Finally, he tired of it and approached me and handed me a minor metal key. I put the box, the dragon writhing and wriggling, on the table and took the key from the wizard's hands. As soon as the key was in my hand, the dragon on the box moved even more. It scurried across its surface and then froze with its mouth wide open as if preparing to attack anyone who tried to touch the treasure it guarded. But in the open mouth of this dragon, I saw a keyhole. The key trembled in my hand, but I had to dare to open the strange box. I held the key out to the dragon's mouth, and he gawked in rage and swallowed the key. I jumped away from the box in surprise and looked back at Voldemar. He stepped closer to the table and scrutinized what was happening on the surface of the box. A dragon was struggling with something or someone that was keeping it from swallowing the key. I could see nothing, the dark red-black silhouettes of the dragon and the other creatures on the surface of the box were flashing so fast. Then the struggle stopped, and the key fell to the wooden floor of the hut with a clang. It was as if someone or something had spit it out or flung it away from the box. I picked up the key from the floor and, holding it hesitantly in my hand, asked Voldemar. Well, what's going on in there? You're a mage. Deal with your magical creatures. Voldemar looked at me slyly and replied. You need to do nothing, my dear Ella. The casket is open. He stepped back from the table, and a flood of familiar blue light washed over me. It was like the light I had seen or felt when awakened from unconsciousness. And it was exactly like the light I had seen in the crystal temple, where the goddess Aspen had blessed Thunder and me for marriage. The blue light faded, and I saw a parchment scroll at the bottom of the box, twisted into a tube and sealed with a red wax seal. The massive, dark red wax seal was attached to a simple rope that encircled the scroll, preventing it from unrolling. 
I impatiently pulled the sealing wax off the rope and carefully unrolled the scroll, holding it up with one hand and down with the other. The yellow parchment of the scroll was so dry it looked like it would crumble in my hands. I looked at the text written on the parchment of the scroll. What is it? I asked Voldemar. He shook his head and replied. Sit at the table and read, my girl, read. I obediently followed his advice. Mage and I sat down at the table, and I continued to study the text of the scroll. The text was decorated with beautiful and elaborate embellishments around the first letters of each section, and the letters themselves were rendered neatly and clearly. The text was separated into sections. Otherwise, why would one spend so much effort on the extraordinary embellishments of this text? I read. The text was written in a language I could understand, but some expressions looked strange. I ran my eyes over the first section of text on the scroll and stared at Voldemar in surprise. Is this a joke? That was all I said, waiting for his clarification. Does what I've read here mean I belong to some special family? Well, if that's what this scroll says, then that's what it is, the mage replied contentedly, tapping his slender fingers on the tabletop of the table we were sitting at. I read on. The text said that I was a member of the salamander race and that they were distinguished by their ability to stay in fire, water, and air without harm. They could recover from injuries that would be fatal to other creatures. And such are the properties of human salamanders that bring them immortality. And if a creature of the salamander race marries a woman of humans, an extraordinary creature is born, able to use the abilities of both humans and salamanders. I lifted my eyes from the parchment and stared at the mage again. And what, this isn't a joke, do you think? What kind of salamander do you think I am? I'm afraid of fire, like fire. I'm not a good swimmer. Turns out I can fly, but that was only with your magic, I laughed, putting the parchment scroll away. Then, I continued my rant. I'm not going to read this nonsense. I don't know why you gave it to me at all. Do you want to see my embarrassment? You've seen it. I want to get home quickly, that's all. I don't want any salamander secrets. The mage suddenly grew serious, his thick white eyebrows shifting to the bridge of his nose. He lowered his round spectacles low on his nose and said sternly. And that's one you don't mess with, Ella. Or rather, Isabella. I told you that's your real name in this world. Isabella, I whispered. I thought I had heard Grandma Lily call me that sometimes as a child, but I had always thought she liked old names. Perhaps she knew something about this salamander's story. But how? But now I put those memories aside. Since Voldemar is suddenly so serious, we should read the scroll to the end, I thought as I continued to read the text. What it said next made me even more confused. It described a battle between the forces of evil and sound in the Fey world. The forces of evil were winning, and the balance of the Fey world was being upset, which caused grief to all the world's inhabitants. The mage looked at me expectantly, apparently understanding my emotions. I did not understand what this story had to do with me. In that story, the woman with the salamander heart saved the Fey leader by giving him some of her life force. Whether she literally or magically did this, I did not understand. But the description of the continuation of the battle, after the leader of the Fey had risen from the dead, was done. Heads flew away, 
severed by the warrior's sharp swords, wounds made by the dragon's teeth in the warrior's bodies bled terribly, clouds of black magic that made the warriors blind and helpless descended on the battlefield. Well, that sort of thing. But the excellent Fei won, and peace was restored to their realm. I read the account of the battle to the end and asked, So what does all this mean? Why does this story about some ancient battle have anything to do with me? The mage suddenly became utterly calm. He returned his glasses to their usual place on his nose and said, carefully enunciating the words. This is not the past. This is the future. What? The future? But this is such an old scroll. How is that possible? I replied, setting the scroll on the table before me. The parchment curled back into a scroll and froze on the tabletop. The mage sighed and continued his explanation. You don't even know what you just met. No one can know what you've just read. The ancient people wrote here a special prediction of the Dark Oracle concerning you. Everyone who holds some value to the Fey world gets their prediction. I suddenly perked up and asked. Yes, I already know that the Dark Oracle has been making a lot of predictions here, including thunders. But why did this oracle say something about me? Am I of any value to this fey world other than something this thunder needs for something? The mage did not answer. I continued my musings aloud. I don't even know what happened recently what world I came from, and here are these ancient predictions about a future I can't imagine. Voldemar replied. No one knows anything for sure about their future. We only know exactly what has already happened. And even then, everyone interprets the past as they wish. This scroll said what the Dark Oracle saw, and he was not wrong. The other thing is that actual events sometimes differ from his descriptions. Gives. Do you mean he's still living now? I thought he died a long time ago, I muttered. The mage nodded his head in confirmation of my guess. But why are we looking at this old scroll instead of going and asking this oracle of yours directly what is in store for me? If he knew something about me hundreds of years ago, he could tell us about my future now and more accurately. I exclaimed, jumping from my chair and knocking over some retort on Mage's desk. With a commanding gesture, Voldemar held his hand to me and ordered me to sit back at the table. I obeyed him. I sat down and just stared at him, waiting for an explanation. The Dark Oracle no longer predicts anything. He's locked in a cave where no one can go. No one even knows where the cave is. The Dark Oracle only occasionally appears in the Chosen Fey. This only happens if exceptional events are imminent. Trying to find him could cost you your life and is a completely futile intention. Everything you need to know is written here, in this scroll. Keep this secret, and don't let anyone else get their hands on it. Whoever finds out about your secret will immediately try to influence you to get you out of the way. Who? Who would wish me harm just because I might be of this race of salamanders? I did not even realize that until a few minutes ago. I shrieked. Oh God, I'm so sick of these games. I want to go home." The mage shook his head contritely and, seeing my persistence, said, All right, Isabella, I will show you the way away from this forest. But I can't help you get home now. I did not know what that answer meant, but it was something to find my way out of this enchanted forest. We left the hut and Voldemar put me on a wagon drawn by a calm ox and drove us to the forest's edge. There, the mage dismounted, turned to me, and said, holding the reins. 
There, now it's up to you to decide where you want to go and what you want to do. Remember one thing, you must never let the scroll with your secret fall into the hands of the enemies of Thunder and his kingdom, Etheris. It could bring great misfortune to all of us, particularly Thunder. Dark forces will try to take this scroll from you and destroy the Dark Oracle's prediction. After all, his prediction is only fulfilled when it exists on this magical parchment. I suddenly realized that things were not adding up in the mage's explanation and asked. But if the scroll is destroyed, then? Then Thunder will still die, but without the possibility of being saved. And your future will be completely unclear. The mage was silent for a moment and continued. Well, all in time. There's nothing more I can tell you. Now go over there, through that forest, and if you're lucky, you'll find your way to Thunder's castle soon enough. It's located over there, on those hills you can see in the distance, beyond that forest. The mage pointed his skinny hand toward the edge of the forest, where the bluish hilltops could be seen beyond the tops. I thought he was missing something but did not have the energy to question him. I was tired of all these magical events and predictions. I just wanted to return to the familiar world of my reality and find my memory and real life. I thanked Voldemar and stepped bravely back into the dark forest. The box with the scroll was in the bag mage had given me, and it hurt my back as I stumbled over the wet tree roots that crisscrossed the forest path I was walking on. The mage stayed at the edge of the forest and, I thought, staring intensely into the forest's darkness as I walked away from him. Soon, I stopped turning around and just kept walking forward. My boots were quickly soaked with the moisture of the evening mist, which settled in droplets that glittered like diamonds on the tall grass of the clearing. My dress was as wet as if it had just been doused with water in a bucket. Only the scroll box remained untouched by the moisture, wrapped in its old red cloth and tucked safely in my leather bag. After a while, Tired of the bag with the jewelry box slamming against my thigh, I looked around and, seeing an old oak tree with a vast hollow, climbed inside the tree trunk and placed the jewelry box with my secret in its far corner. No one will find my secret here, I thought. When I can, I'll get that box. And if I can't get it the way it is, it will be gone altogether. I'll have less trouble. With these thoughts, I continued my way away from this forest. Scene 13 The Forest Giant I had to walk those few miles through the woods and out to the hills. Then I would be safe, the mage had said. However, I could not navigate the woods and lost my bearings almost immediately. I just realized which way Voldemar had said the hills were. I remembered he said I should get to the mountain before dark. But the sun had set, and darkness descended into the forest. I just had to walk at random. The dark trunks of century-old trees encircled me like menacing giants, and their branches seemed like knotted hands reaching out to catch me and hold me there forever. I felt as if every branch in the forest was trying to touch and tear the key from my chest. I clutched the key to my chest even tighter, suddenly aware of the importance of Voldemar's explanation of it to me and the world. I kept walking forward. Or I thought I was walking forward. I had long ago given up hope of reaching the forest's edge and was looking for some light in the forest's darkness. Suddenly, right behind me, I heard the cracking sound of breaking bushes. I turned around and froze. Something that looked like a man of enormous stature was coming at me, and it was a tree. Did one tree come to life and haunt me? My thoughts raced, frantically searching for an explanation for this situation. I was terrified. I stumbled backward, 
tripping over a root and falling to the ground. The giant took only one step, and his hands were above me. In a moment, he would have grabbed me. But I was nimbler than he was, slipping from under his gnarled fingers, I jumped and ran away again. I ran into the clearing and stood at a loss, not knowing where to turn to hide from this monster. Suddenly, on the opposite side of the clearing, there was the same cracking of branches as the bushes being pulled apart. In the dead white light of the full moon that had risen above the forest, I saw that. Thunder had come into the clearing. He saw me, and his always frowning face, disfigured by a long scar, brightened. I felt as if he could have nothing but hatred for me now. And then that joyful smile. Something shook my heart, I felt someone could protect me from the tree monster, even if that someone was Thunder. I shouted to Thunder. Look out, someone is chasing me. And then that tree man jumped out into the clearing. Thunder straightened to his enormous height, but even he seemed smaller than that giant. But that did not embarrass Thunder at all. He drew his sword from its sheath and raised it threateningly with both hands before him, pointing it at the giant's chest. But he did not think of stopping and, ignoring Thunder, kept coming and coming straight toward me. I paced back and forth, back to Thunder, thinking we were both gone. Thunder could prolong my life for a few more seconds, and I could escape this monster. I did not know which of them I should be more afraid of this wooden giant or my unloved husband. The giant was before me as Thunder's hand touched my back. I turned around and suddenly realized that Thunder was not going anywhere, he was intent on fighting an unequal battle with the forest monster. So he doesn't hate me for running away from him? I thought. I'd hate my soulmate if he left me. Even if he was as ugly as that Thunder. A soulmate? I thought with some surprise, having just a couple of hours ago irreconcilably denied the possibility of a real marriage with Thunder. But at that moment, the giant's gaunt hands were above me. I threw my head up, trying to see him and figure out how to escape his grasp. My head spun, and I fell, slipping on a wet tree root and hitting my head on something hard. I was almost unconscious when I saw Thunder standing above me, raising his sword and planting his feet on the ground, preparing to strike. The last thing I heard was the giant's terrible roar, impact, whistling, and crunching of something heavy. Scene 14 Bathing in the Castle And there was that blue light again. It penetrated my consciousness, even though my eyes were closed. I had to open my eyes and look up. Above me again was the canopy of this bed, which I hated with all my soul. Was it impossible to avoid returning to this room where I had appeared in this world of high fay and such trials as I was not sure I could endure? I grabbed on the bed, fluffed the pillows, and leaned against them. I crossed my arms over my chest to protect myself from my upcoming encounters with the castle maids and my fiancé, Thunder. My expectations were realized. No sooner had I sat up in bed than the massive wooden bedroom door opened, revealing the maid who had attended to me on my first day in the castle. I remembered her name was Arsenia. Well, mistress, are you with us again? She said, folding her hands on her apron, just like last time. I answered her, smiling strained. Yes, unfortunately, I'm with you again. It can't be helped. We'll have to prepare for the so-called second wedding as well. The girl looked at me in surprise and, without saying a word, went to the window, where a large barrel was placed, over which steam was wafting and from which the aroma of some spicy herbs was spreading throughout the bedroom. With a determined gesture, 
I got out of bed and pulled off the branch-torn dress I had been wearing since my escape. Thunder had brought me back to this castle and had not touched me, leaving me wearing all my clothes as they were. It was good that he had not taken advantage of my unconsciousness to. To what? To take me by force? The annoying inner voice continued the monologue in my head. But if the mage said that Thunder doesn't like me and is just forced to marry me, he doesn't need to take advantage of my unconsciousness. After all, if he was sleeping next to me, which I can't even imagine yet, I also have to prepare for the so-called second wedding and would never take advantage of his sleep to. To what? To touch him. No. Never. He disgusts me. These tangled thoughts were throwing me off balance. Meanwhile, the girl brought me a large bath towel and, holding it in front of me, waited for me to wrap myself in it to reach the makeshift bath. I wrapped myself in the vast fluffy towel she handed me and walked over to the warm water barrel. I climbed up the small steps to the edge of the barrel and, throwing off the towel, stepped over the edge of the barrel. I dipped one foot into the water first, then the other. When I found the bottom of the barrel with my foot, I plunged entirely into the water. I felt as if I had been settled into a life-giving spring. I felt so good, as if the very force of nature flowed through my veins and arteries. I closed my eyes, sat on a ledge inside the barrel, and rested my head on a cushioned pad attached to the tub's edge. The scent of herbs wafted over me, and I felt I could spend forever like this. Arsenia's voice came through. Mistress, I can help you wash. I jumped, remembering that I had to wash before the wedding, and my relaxed mood vanished. I shook my head negatively, took the washcloth from Arsenia's hands, and passed, scrubbing my body fiercely with the fragrant soap that smelled of roses and peonies. Why do I need to be pretty and smell good? To attract thunder. No, he won't wait for that. Such thoughts were going through my head, but I realized I had to honor my agreement with the mage and fulfill his condition, to marry this supreme fae so that the mage would take me back to my world. When I finished bathing, Arsenia helped me down the slippery steps of the barrel steps and guided me to the bed, wrapping me in a towel. She brushed my hair with a beautiful metal comb and dried it by the fireplace, which had long since been lit. After that, I went back to bed and thought only of how much time I had, this much free time before I was forced to marry Thunder. Meanwhile, the maid pulled holiday dresses out of a trunk and laid them on the bed beside me. I sat in bed, idly watching the gorgeous fabric spread before me. I felt as if all the world's richest were spread out before me, so beautiful were the fabrics. Waves of gorgeous fabrics in the colors of gold, silver, emeralds, rubies, and amber replaced one after another. But I did not want to wear any of them. Suddenly, the bedroom door opened wide again, and Thunder walked in. I pulled my knees up to my chest, wrapped my arms around them, and froze in the bed in that crouched position, looking away. I did not want to look at him. Why? If I'm destined to spend the rest of my life with him, as is the custom in this world, I'll still have time to look at his handsome face, I thought. I was also pierced by the horror that he could have walked into this bedroom like this half an hour ago. I was sitting completely naked in this bathtub barrel. I blushed at the thought that he had put me in a very uncomfortable position by coming in without knocking or warning. But then my imagination started working again. I continued to imagine and dramatize this imaginary situation. I felt almost sick as I imagined my life with him, here he was, my husband and master, entering the room where I lived without knocking and, taking me by force. Well, not by force, but without my full consent. 
Although many married couples don't like each other at all, I thought, looking sadly out the window. But for me, love was the prerequisite for having sex with a man, even if you were the highest and most powerful fae in the world. Thunder seemed oblivious to the fact that I was not looking at him. He held a bundle in one hand, which he handed to Arsenia. She took the bundle from his hands with a bow. She stepped aside from Thunder, bowing respectfully, ignoring my presence. Thunder turned abruptly and just as swiftly left the room as he had entered it a moment ago. I relaxed. I did not need to communicate with him right now. I needed to calm my excited imagination, and everything would work out. I had stopped imagining our scenes alone with Thunder in the bedroom, which made me uncomfortable. It would not happen because the mage had promised that my marriage to Thunder would be a mere formality. The main thing is that the surrounding people don't realize it. I had to gather all my strength to bear his presence with me this evening or at this damned wedding. Despite such thoughts, I could not hold back a sigh of admiration when Arsenia unwrapped the roll left by Thunder and placed the dress on the bed. Yes, there was a holiday dress in that bundle for me. The long dress was made of a dark, very plastic fabric that glistened as if woven from embers. I pulled myself up and pulled the blanket down slightly lower to better look at the dress. Unusual patterns covered the fabric. It had two layers, a bottom layer and a top layer. The bottom layer glowed slightly, with a red-orange light flaring up and fading. The other pattern layer, slightly above the first layer of cloth, seemed charcoal black and matte, like a lump of extinguished coal in a fireplace. These patterns or designs on the fabric depicted lizards or small dragons. Their black silhouettes appeared one by one on the fabric as waves of waning fire ran across its bottom layer. The fire ran through the dress's fabric like someone's soul was living in it, trying to escape its captivity. I could not take my eyes off the dress. Arsenia watched my reaction with satisfaction. The maid put the dress on the free part of the bed and said, There you go, mistress. Your party dress is ready. I touched the dress's fabric with my hand, and it burst into flames like I had thrown coal into a furnace. Tongues of flame played on the dress, and I instinctively jerked my hand away, afraid the fire would burn me. Arsenia watched my exploration of the dress with clear pleasure. She said in a satisfied tone, Don't be afraid, Isabella you are. She hesitated and did not continue the sentence. Then Arsenia sighed heavily and said, If you are not afraid, this fire is not terrible. It burns only those who are not equal to it. I looked at her in surprise. What did equal or not equal have to do with it? Those notions had long since died out. I knew people's relationships were defined by their personalities, not their societal status. I placed my palm on the fabric of the dress again. The fire flared again, this time, it ran up my arm straight to my shoulder. I threw back the blanket and jumped around the room, naked, pulling that arm away from me and using my other hand to knock the fire off my body. The maid ran up grabbed me firmly by the shoulders, and shook me. She looked me in the eye and said in a persuasive tone, Don't be afraid of anything. I told you that this fire is nothing to you. It may run down your body as it plays on fabric, but it will not harm you. Indeed, when I examined my hand, which had been licked by the fire a moment ago, it was outstanding. There was no trace of a burn or just redness on the skin. Is this an illusion? I think it's fire. I whispered, completely flabbergasted. Arsenia replied, straightening her dress with some extraordinary reverence for its fabric. 
No, this fire is real. It would be best if you learned how to be in tune with it, but later, you'll figure out how to use it, and things will improve. For now, just put on the dress and don't remember that it's on fire. After a while, you'll get in balance with the fire magic, and you won't notice it burning. Still looking at the maid incredulously, no longer trying to cover my body with my hands, I walked over to the bed and carefully lifted the dress with both hands. The fabric flamed more in the places where I had touched it, but this time, the fire did not transfer to my skin, it just lived in the dress's fabric. Somehow, I knew I could wear this dress. I sighed resolutely, slid my bare feet off the bed, and stood at the edge of the bed, right in front of the dress. I took the dress by one shoulder with one hand, the other by the other, and held it up in front of me. Fire ran up the dress, but I did not take my hand away. Something inside told me I could touch this dress without fear that it would burn me. I noticed the maid was touching the dress with leather gloves. That meant that this dress was not safe for the others. I remembered how my necklace had burned Arsenia's hands. And that meant that these fays had some things in store for me that were only meant for me. So, I would have to use those things and figure out why they were safe for me and what others feared of them. Humans. But they're fey. How can I compare the dangers to humans and fey? They are completely different things. These magical creatures shouldn't be afraid of anything, yet my dress and necklace are dangerous. That means the dress and necklace contain some magic I must deal with. I nodded for the maid to leave the room. I did not want to show myself naked in front of her again. Arsenia bowed her head obediently and, bowing to Thunder and me, left the room. She closed the door tightly behind her. I turned to the bed, on which I had already put the dress back on, and considered it, still hesitant to put on my outfit. Finally, I gingerly picked up the dress from its shoulders with both hands. The lights on the fabric flickered, but no flames appeared. I spread the dress out on the bed so I could quickly dive into the middle of it and throw its skirt down, covering my legs. I succeeded. I felt energized again when I wore the dress, as if something fed me warmth and vigor. I went to the mirror and looked at myself. I saw in the mirror again a tall and slender, blue-eyed young woman the exact opposite of how I felt. I had been a frail, boyishly angular brunette in my nearly erased, memorized self. But this young woman I saw in the mirror was like an ancient Greek statue, with golden hair, a beautiful figure, full breasts, and a thin waist. But her face was familiar, a woman who never gives up. Oh well, I'll have to get to know the rest of the world I find myself in. If I'm so pretty here, why not take advantage of it and figure out how to get out of here for good? I did not know how it was possible yet, but I realized I had something to use, beauty and attractiveness. I just had to learn how to do it because I did not know how to flirt, or I thought I did not. I turned away from the mirror and headed resolutely toward the room's exit. I was on my way to my wedding, the beginning of my life, and my escape from here to where I used to live. Scene 15 Throne of Flames I walked down the castle corridor and wondered why no one greeted me. If I'm a bride, they should have some respect for my status. That's how it is in many societies, even if they are a fae society. I knew this was not clear to me, but I was expecting royal treatment, if only for the sake of this performance for the court of my future husband, Thunder. And these fays were all somewhere, and I did not know what to think. Finally, I reached the hall door where I thought the pre-wedding ceremony might occur. But there was no one there either. 
The rays of the midday sun shyly poured through the vast windows of the castle hall. I looked around. In front of me was a throne, a massive chair with a high carved back of dark metal. Its tall lancet back was decorated with peaks and rounded ends on its other sharp parts. The intricately curved armrests of the throne were in the shape of dragons, which, as always, were eating someone, holding those poor creatures in their toothy jaws. The throne stood on a relatively high stone pedestal. Suddenly, I had a crazy thought, which I immediately realized. Since I am to be married to the king of this kingdom of strange fey individuals, why don't I sit on that throne? I climbed the steps to the platform and, resolutely throwing aside the plume of my dress with my hand, sat down on the throne. At first, I straightened my back as if the throne was burning me and I could not relax sitting on it. But after a couple of seconds, I realized nothing terrible was happening. I leaned back against the back of the throne, resting my hands on the armrests. Suddenly, flames appeared from under my feet. At first, I thought the hem of my dress caught fire from some candlestick I had touched on my way to the throne. But no, the fire was coming from under the throne itself. Before I could even stand up on the throne, I was chained to it by some mighty force and held there despite my desperate attempts. Blue fire flowed all over the chair and rose above my head. I felt like I was sitting in a cocoon of blue fire. Then, the color of the fire changed to orange, and everything went quiet. Flames disappeared as if they had never been there. And then I looked down at my knees the fabric of the dress was transparent. It dissolved like liquid metal and flowed down my legs, chest, and ankles straight to the floor and the throne's foot. I stared at it in horror, unable to move a hand. My body felt as if it were attached to the throne. The only thing that kept me from panicking and screaming in terror was that only the fabric of my dress had disappeared in the flames, but I was unharmed. The thought came into my mind that the fire had not harmed my skin. I did not even feel the pain of the flames licking my body. The fire was only affecting the fabric of the dress. I instinctively squeezed my legs together and covered my chest with my arms, looking around for some shelter or curtain to wrap myself in and escape from this enchanted castle to somewhere in a field with nothing but wind. Damn these fays and all the magic associated with them. I'll never be mine in this strange world, I thought, looking around frantically. But I saw nothing I could use as clothing. There were no curtains in this room, so I could tear them off and wrap myself in their fabric. The hall doors opened then, and a noisy crowd of fae celebrants burst in with thunder at the head. Thunder and his entourage froze when they saw me naked on the throne. I had to raise my head and stare at them with disdain proudly. Thunder stared greedily at me, my body, for a few seconds. He was devouring it with his eyes, and I thought the fact that I was trying to cover my breasts with my hands only further fueled his interest in my body. Then Thunder lowered his gaze as if trying to deal with his feelings. He gestured for everyone to stay by the door and move toward me alone. In almost perfect silence, interrupted only by the sound of his footsteps and the hoarse coughs of the embarrassed soldiers and their companions, he ascended the platform, approached the throne, and threw his cloak over my shoulders in one motion. Thunder's cloak completely shielded me from his and his subjects' gazes. I felt relieved and clutched at the edges of my cloak, pulling it tighter around me. I could have gotten up and walked away, but Thunder was not about to leave the throne platform, which kept me in place. Thunder turned to his subjects and growled. Hail High Dame Isabella! He bowed before me, utterly bewildered, 
kneeled on one knee, and respectfully touched with his other hand, gloveless, the edge of the cloak on the platform floor. I accepted the game, relaxing back on the throne. If they want a high lady in me, they will get one. I proudly looked around the hall and the courtiers and, taking hold of the armrests of the throne, roared in an unexpectedly low and resonant voice. Glory to thunder, our lord and my betrothed. It was impossible to convey the look that thunder threw at me. There was immense surprise and admiration in it and disbelief. But he was not the only one who could play such games. If I had learned more about the life of the Fey world for the sake of escape, I had to get into it, get a feel for it, and figure out what I should do next. Thunder, still standing beside me, still covered to my feet by his cloak and naked under that protection from the lustful glances of the Fey men or the hateful glances of the Fey women, watched silently as his entourage seated themselves at the tables set in a T-shape in front of the throne. Those massive tables and crudely made wooden chairs had been brought into the room. The tables were covered with tablecloths with unexpectedly skillful embroidery depicting patterns of mythical animals or dragons. Why are there so many unusual creatures here? Is this the world of the Fae I had read stories about as a child? I thought and suddenly realized I remembered something from my past. I had been reading fairy tales about Fae there. It gave me the strength to get out of there and go home. I got up from my spirits and turned to thunder. Look, look, I must wear something more normal than this cloak. Thanks for it, of course, but I must find a normal dress that won't disappear on me. My request made thunder laugh. His face creased in a bizarre attempt at a smile. He replied. You don't need to wear anything. Today is special since even your dress has glassed you off on that throne. These are all signs that I cannot help but recognize as special. They are signs that the higher powers of the Fey are giving us. He was silent for a moment and continued. You know, you just have to accept that we're meant to be together. I'm not happy about what will get married either, but I will have to do it. Here was a chance to ask Thunder himself. This question plagued me ever since Voldemort said that Thunder was also forced into this wedding. Why do you do that? Can't you? Before I could finish, Thunder leaned toward me, brought his face close to mine, and whispered. You can't ask such a thing of me or anyone in my kingdom. Don't ever ask me that again. I leaned far back on the back of the throne so that my future husband's face was not so close to mine and answered. All right, I won't ask again, especially since I cannot avoid this wedding. I don't know anything about your world, but you're a lord and could fight against anything that doesn't suit you. Thunder muttered through clenched teeth without looking at me. Stop it. Stop trying to avoid the inevitable. You don't understand the forces we live at the mercy of, so you ask about something that can't be fully explained. He exhaled noisily and continued more calmly but still in a whisper. After the wedding, you will have a certain amount of freedom in our kingdom, but remember that in other kingdoms, you will be enemy number one, which is very dangerous for us and our dynasty. I did not understand why other kingdoms were dangerous to him and me. Still, the word dynasty recalled the need to continue the lineage and everything that went with it. I imagined for a second what awaited me that night, and I felt sick to my stomach. Disgust came over me again, and I answered briefly. That's it, I'm dropping the subject. But I'd still like to get the dress. Thunder was already grinning as he looked down at me and replied. Yes, you'll get another dress for the wedding. But you're not giving up. Yeah, I'm not giving up, I answered him, to myself. 
but what did it cost me? All these adventures in the strange world of the Fae were too much for my nerves. But I did not know what lay ahead when I thought about that. Scene 16 Wedding and First Kiss And then it was time for the wedding ceremony. I describe it so calmly. After all, I had no choice because I just wanted to get home, just as Voldemar had promised me. I had to pay for that opportunity with my freedom first. After my conversation with Thunder, the maids led me away from the hall to some room adjoining the hall. We entered the room through a secret or indistinct door in the hall's wall. There were no windows in the room, and it was lit by some lantern that gave off the same blue light I had seen more than once in their kingdom. The maid handed me a dress I had never seen before. This dress was white, almost unadorned. Only the top of its corset was decorated with a small embroidery of white threads and beads. Unlike anything they had offered me, this dress was the most modest. But I would have chosen nothing else myself. I had nothing to be happy about. I did not remember my past lives, but I knew that my future life with Thunder would not be as Mage Voldemar described. When the maids helped me wear the white dress, I was not escorted back to the throne room. Still, I was led through some dark corridors of the castle to a part one had yet to have time to familiarize myself with. Finally, the maid ahead opened the door, and the light fell on me. Thank God it was plain daylight. We stepped out into the square inside the castle and made our way to the blue temple in the center of the court. The temple was made of enormous stone blocks, bound seemingly without mortar. Their irregular faces were tightly interlocked, forming a bizarre pattern on the temple wall. The narrow embrasure's windows let so small and light into the temple that when I was led up to its lancet door, which was very high, perhaps two feet tall, I shivered as I stepped inside, fearing total darkness. But I was wrong. When I entered the temple, I saw the altar on which some unusually bright source of blue light was shining. It was like a bowl from which light poured out in waves in all directions, rising and falling down the temple walls like a blue mist. Thunder's entourage occupied the entire space of the temple hall. His subject, the Fae, wore royal outfits compared to my white dress. The Fae women wore the same dress as mine, resembling ancient Greek statues' robes. I did not know where I got the idea that the ancient Greek statues were the same type of dresses that these fey women and I wore. Still, I knew that the grace with which they wore these clothes was worthy of being the best of the female species. The fey women were all slender, tall, and fair-haired beauties. It suddenly occurred to me that my appearance, which I did not recognize in the mirror, did not quite match theirs. These women were frail and short, with long, straight and blonde hair. These women knew their worth, and men had something to appreciate them for. My appearance made me believe that my tall stature, shoulder-length dark curly hair, and slender but still quite athletic figure were not like these women. I was completely different. What about the Fey warriors? The Fey men were as tall as thunder. I saw only a few of them under six feet tall. That meant that Thunder, who towered over them by at least half a head or more, was much taller than six feet. The Fey men wore festive costumes, richly decorated with embroidery and jewelry. As I thought about the men and women of the Fey, I heard a whisper of admiration run through the crowd of courtiers. It was not me they were admiring. I was not worth their attention, I could see that. They respected their lord. Thunder appeared behind me in such a way that I only realized it when I heard the admiring sighs of the Fey women. I turned around and found myself right in front of him. 
My husband's hands were folded at his waist, and his thumbs were tucked behind his belt. He also had a giant sword hanging from his belt in a scabbard elaborately decorated with colorful gems. Thunder was wearing a kaftan made of a fabric that looked like dark purple velvet embroidered with silver patterns. What did not surprise me was that the marks on his clothes depicted dragons. Everything that could be shown in this kingdom seemed related to dragons. I had yet to notice any depictions of the rulers of this kingdom, their subjects, or other types of creatures that lived in this world other than dragons. Thunder swept his right hand over the heads of those gathered. The murmur of voices gradually died down. Thunder drew air into his mighty lungs, and he said in a sonorous voice. Well then, let us celebrate my wedding to the beautiful Isabella. Voldemar, begin the ceremony. Looking up at Thunder from below, I did not immediately realize that the ceremony would be introduced by the very mage Voldemar, who had promised me that after this ceremony, everything would be as I wanted it to be, I would leave this kingdom and return to my world. Hoping for support from at least one person I knew in this strange situation, I looked around. Voldemar was standing at the altar with the source of blue light. The apothecary's round glasses, familiar to me, sat on his nose, and on his shoulders was a dark purple robe embroidered with gold and silver stars. His long gray hair was sprinkled over his shoulders, and he wore the familiar alchemist's or wizard's cap on his head. In Voldemar's hands was a scroll bound with a coarse hemp rope, the ends of which were sealed with a massive sealing wax seal. Slowly and solemnly looking only at thunder with both hands, the mage raised the parchment roll before him. Then he sharply tore the seal off the scroll, carefully unfolded it before him, and read measuredly, holding the parchment above and below. By the authority given to me by the higher powers of the Fey world, I proclaim Thunder, the High Lord of Aetheris, and Isabella, the beautiful page who has appeared in our kingdom, husband and wife. I wish the newlyweds happiness in their married life and many more years of life and rule. Long live our new royal couple, Thunder and Isabella. As Voldemar read out the message, I felt Thunder take my hand. My hand disappeared into his massive palm. I tried to pull my hand out of his hand with no one noticing, but I failed. The moment was not right to resist him in this situation. Since I agree to this game, I must play my part. I'll have to play my role as Thunder's bride and wife to the end. I resigned myself and relaxed my hand. I gave myself over to Thunder's will. Looking not at him but only at Waldemar, I saw out of the corner of my eye that Thunder looked at me in surprise. And I thought that this rough warrior would not even notice the movements of my arm, its tension or relaxation. His hand, which should have easily held a vast and heavy sword, could feel the slight tension and piece of the muscles in my tiny hand. But Thunder had noticed all this. I had not expected him to be so sensitive. It was something new I had learned about thunder. Probably from nervous tension. My cheeks were covered with a blush of embarrassment as my hand rested on his palm. Next, I had to follow the further wedding ceremony, at which thunder and I were invited to walk down the makeshift corridor his courtiers had created for us, lined up in two rows toward the altar. As Thunder led me to the altar, leading me down this corridor, the top of which was made of the crossed swords of his companions and bouquets of white roses held up by the women of the Fae, I thought I was dreaming. It's just a dream, I told myself. I'll wake up soon, and none of this will happen. Voldemar promised me that soon, all this would be over. I'll wake up, and none of this will be happening. None of this will happen. But Thunder still held my hand, and the ceremony continued. 
Voldemar made a few more speeches in honor of the newlyweds. Then, some important nobles from Thunder's entourage spoke. After all, this came a moment that I had hoped would not happen. But it turned out that the most embarrassing wedding moment could not be avoided. Voldemar said solemnly, spreading his arms above us like wings and flapping the hem of his cloak. He said in a loud voice. Hail to the newlyweds. The surrounding crowd roared. Hail to the newlyweds. I felt thunder turn toward me. I stood before him, not wanting to turn my head toward him. My husband took me by the shoulders with both hands lightly but firmly and turned me to face him. I realized that this was when I had to take all my will in my fist and bear it. I closed my eyes and felt Thunder's rugged fingers touch my chin and gently lift it. I closed my eyes. I can't stand the sight of his face so close, but we'll just have to stand here and bear it all, I thought, not daring to move in response to his actions. A man's warm breath touched my lips, enveloping me in a strange sensation of anticipation of something forbidden and somehow desired by me. I had not expected my body to react the way it did when he touched my lips. Suddenly terrified of my desires, I realized I wanted to know what it felt like to feel his lips on mine. And it did. Thunder's breath grew warmer and suddenly, I felt my tightly compressed lips touch his. But they weren't rough, like his fingers. Thunder's lips were soft and gentle. My whole body felt as if it had melted. I stood there with my eyes closed, marveling and enjoying this strange sensation that I had not expected from myself, from my body. A wave of pleasure slowly traveled down my body from top to bottom, traveling lower and lower. I froze and almost did not breathe. I could not resist this strange sensation, realizing that my body wanted this kiss to continue, even though my mind was protesting with all its might. Finally, thunder pulled away from my lips, and I opened my eyes. I saw his scarred face right in front of me. The man, or my husband, was staring at me studiously as if he had been expecting a different reaction to the kiss. As he kissed me, Thunder did not even try to pull my lips apart with his lips. He did not touch my tongue with his tongue. I suddenly realized that Thunder had not even tried to kiss me. At least this kiss was not the overbearing kiss I had expected from a lord husband who had asserted his right to touch me, his wife, whenever and however he wished. That calmed me down, at least for a while. The only thing that worried and confused me was how good it felt when thunder touched my lips. Well, I won't let that happen again, I thought, shuddering at the disgust for my husband that returned to me as soon as I came to my senses. Never again will I let him kiss me but we still have to spend the damn wedding night together, thought I. After Thunder moved away from me and stepped back, I dared to look around. The wedding guests were standing in a semicircle at the altar of this temple, staring at Thunder and me in silence. What awaits me? Do I have to spend my whole life here, even if it is as short as Voldemar predicted? I thought as I stared at the temple and its majestic vaults that stretched into endless heights. These thoughts stayed with me for the rest of the wedding evening. And there was much to admire in the evening, for the Fay had great luxury. The outfits of the ladies and their cavaliers outshone one another. Richly embroidered silver tablecloths covered the tables for the post-wedding feast, set here in the center of the temple. The wedding ceremony was an essential event in the life of this kingdom, except that it should have been another woman in the place of this Thunder's wife, not me. All evening, Thunder and I sat next to each other at a beautifully decorated table with various viands, trying to respond kindly to the eulogies of his subjects and associates. 
But he answered them, and I just nodded, leaning slightly toward the one making the following speech. I did not care about them. I had to get through this night, which could be both the beginning of my liberation and the failure of my escape plan. The wedding feast ended relatively late. I sat by thunder, stupefied by the smells that came over me from the smoky aromas from the large bull's coals. The smoke of those smokestacks wafted upward, up into the temple's vaults, and then downward, creeping in through the windows and floating past me, reminding me it was all unreal. I'm sleeping. I'm just sleeping, I reminded myself mentally to get through this interminable evening. Thunder seemed in no way weary of the eulogies in honor of the newlyweds and enjoyed them. I sat at the wedding table to his left. His sword, never removed from his belt, rattled heavily on the floor as Thunder raised his glass, answering the toasts of his congratulating guests. His sword separated us as if there was an invisible boundary that neither Thunder nor I wanted to cross. After that kiss, I avoided touching Thunder. However, we had to stand up several times at that feast and listen to congratulations. Only once did I catch his scrutinizing gaze. He looked at me like he was searching for the answer to some unspoken question. I did not understand why I felt pleasure, oh yes, it was a pleasure. When he kissed me. Now, he seemed like a monster again, a creature of evil in a world I did not understand. Or was I so afraid of what I would go through in a couple of hours, an hour, five minutes after this evening? Thunder touched me only once at the table, which seemed by accident. When he saw me turn pale and recoil, he pressed his lips together and turned away. I felt a deep sense of relief. Suddenly, a horn sounded. One of the temple servants picked up the horn of some unknown creature and blew it, producing a low, soul-penetrating sound that vibrated in my chest. Everyone fell silent. Thunder rose from his chair, and he looked around the temple hall. He said in his low, husky voice, Dear guests and friends, thank you for being with me on this important day in my life. He sighed, I thought, and continued. Please continue your feast, and my wife and I. At that, he turned to me, frozen in despair on the wooden chair seat. It is time for us to retire to our chambers. The crowd of guests roared with pleasure. The culmination of the evening had arrived, the newlyweds were to retire to their chambers. Now, their lord and master would get what was his, he would enjoy the body and love of his young wife. Body and love? What on earth am I saying to myself? None of this is going to happen. These thoughts tore at my head as I followed Thunder out of the table. Thunder stepped out from behind the desk and walked around my chair so I could lean on his arm, which he gave me. It's just a gesture of politeness. He can't be so gallant, he just can't be so, well-mannered. I thought, standing up and leaning on his arm. When our palms touched, I felt the heat of his body penetrate me and warm my waiting soul. It'll all be over soon. I have to endure this one night alone with him, I thought, obediently following Thunder, who led me beside him into the temple's depths. No one followed us. We went to the square in front of the temple. There was no one there. Even the dragon, still in his chariot, slept peacefully, his breath echoing in the empty alleys of the castle city. Thunder was leading me away from the temple, away from the main castle of his kingdom. We stepped outside the fortress gates and found ourselves in the middle of a night field in front of a forest. Where are you taking me? I ventured to ask, stopping and pulling Thunder by the sleeve of his caftan so that he turned toward me. 
to where you and I will be alone, he answered. My heart raced as fast as if I were running. In my heart, I was running away from my unwanted husband, away from this night I could not bear. Thunder took my hand firmly and tugged it lightly behind him. He sensed my resistance and turned to me again. Don't be afraid. I'm with you. You can't be afraid of any monsters if I'm with you. I sensed some hidden meaning or irony in his words. Maybe my husband realized how afraid I was of him, to be with him alone. Perhaps he is the scariest monster I have yet to see in this kingdom. He doesn't know how I see him. Maybe I should just tell him he disgusts me. The thoughts rushed through my mind like a herd of deer in the forest running from wolves. Scene 17 Wedding Night As I followed Thunder, immersed in my thoughts and my despair, we walked through the nighttime overgrowth and came to a clearing. The moon was shining directly over our heads. I could see every blade of grass, tree leaf, and Thunder's face, as if he had intentionally turned his disfigured side toward me. My husband stood in front of me. He took me by the wrist of my other hand, so I did not break free. Both my hands were in his grip like shackles. Here we are, where we're going to spend this night, Thunder said, looking into my eyes testingly. I did not look away, but there was not an ounce of tenderness or understanding in my gaze. I looked at my husband as if he were my rival. I had to fight him for my freedom. Thunder saw the stubbornness in my eyes at my position as a forced wife and, with a light sigh, took a step back from me, but he never released one of my hands from his. He nodded to the side, pointing to the edge of the downs. Look, that's our hideout over there. I glanced in that direction and remained standing, mesmerized by the view that opened. Blue lights were flying at the edge of the clearing in the darkness, and white moonlight had already descended. There were so many of them it seemed as if some whirlwinds were carrying them, twisting them into whirlpools, bending them to the ground, and then raising a stream of this blue light to the sky. Fascinated by this picture, I followed Thunder, who slowly walked toward this swirl of blue light. When we got closer to the edge of the clearing, I realized that those blue lights were night butterflies that glowed in the moonlight. Thunder watched my reaction to this nighttime extravaganza with a sidelong glance. My soul seemed to drift upward with these creatures of the night. I should fly away with them, fly up there, up high, and never return to this earth again. Instinctively, I spread my arms out to the side as if preparing to fly up and join the stream of those blue lights of the night. But thunder interrupted my trance with words. Let's move on. Now, you will see my private castle. I looked at him with incomprehension. Your castle. And what was it? back where we came from. Was not that your castle? He hummed contentedly, answering. That castle is my official residence. And now you'll see what my real home is like. Thunder, pulling me with him, stepped right into the swirl of blue moths. We were in a stream of blue light, and I felt dizzy. When I realized I was healing, I felt as good as ever. The mage had shown me only once that I could do it. Suddenly, some force was carrying me upward, following thunder, his cloak fluttering in the wind. My hand felt as if it were clinging to his. We were held together by a force so strong that I did not think that he would let go of my hand and I would fall to the ground. We were flying higher and higher. I did not look down anymore only forward, upward, at thunder and the moon. After a while, we descended and came down to the center of a dark structure. 
everything around me was illuminated by the blue light I already knew. A real fairy tale castle appeared before me, the castle that little girls dreaming of being princesses would draw. The tall spires of the towers surrounded the castle's main building, skillfully built of white stone. The tops of the spires were decorated with golden plates that glittered dimly in the moonlight. Inlaid with floral ornaments, huge doors were open and beckoned to enter. Thunder led me inside the castle. I followed him obediently, confused by the strangeness of what was happening. This was magic it was all so beautiful. I was mesmerized by the exquisite luxury of the castle, its decorations, the mosaics on the floors of the halls we passed through, the high lancet windows decorated with colored glass that let in the mysterious moonlight, which left bizarre patterns on the light stone floor of the castle. Finally, Thunder stopped in front of a door made of strange wood, its surface shimmered with all colors as if a rainbow was floating on it. Here we are, he said, looking at me again with a testing look. Come in, don't be afraid. I, back to the reality of my situation, looked at Thunder as if he had awakened me from a dream. Yeah, apparently, this is where we'll be spending our wedding night, I thought as I stepped inside the room. The room, or rather the bedroom, was immense. Like everything else in the castle, it was illuminated by nothing but the moonlight from the window and the fire dancing in the vast fireplace. I looked from the fireplace to the other corner of the room and shuddered. I looked away from the fireplace to the other corner of the room and shuddered. The pillows on the bed were beautifully arranged, seeming to be made of foam lace. The blanket was thrown off the bed on its edge, and the crimson glow of the fire danced on the silk of the sheet. The sight of this bed immediately brought my senses from marveling at the beauty of this nook for high fay to reality. I must get into this bed with my husband. Oh, gods! Thunder, meanwhile, had closed the door to the luxurious bedroom. The knock on the door and the sound of the key turning in the door's keyhole brought me back to reality, the reality I was living in. When the bedroom door slammed shut, I lost my composure. Fear gripped my heart, the fear of being alone with this monster. Who could even want to spend the night with him? No one could love someone like him, this thunder. I thought as he walked around the bedroom and held back the curtains on the considerable lancet windows. From whom is he holding back the curtains? Is someone here in the habit of peeping in at night through the windows of a castle? I involuntarily thought. But these thoughts were immediately swept away by a wave of new experiences. Thunder came to me, still standing in confusion by the front door of the bedroom, and gestured to an alcove against one of the bedroom walls, almost hidden by a screen. I could change there. What do I have to change into? And for what? For the sake of enduring his touch. I thought but obediently followed my husband's instructions. I won't let him use my body like he owns it. I thought, walking into the alcove. And there, my heart was struck to the very depths. My nightgown lay on the couch in this alcove, separated from the room by a handsome screen. This nightgown was made of a fragile and transparent fabric that fell from the couch to the floor in a foam of lace. This garment was more suitable for a meeting of lovers who could enjoy the gradual manifestation of the body of the woman they loved among those laces. But in my case, such a nightgown was just mockery, torture. This nightcloth was intended for a man to enjoy his chosen woman. What's left for a woman who harbors an aversion to her husband? Nothing, at least in my case. Everything the mage promised was not coming true as I thought it would. I can't escape intimacy with my so-called husband. 
I had hoped in vain that this marriage would remain a sham. Voldemar had deceived me. These thoughts swarmed through my head as I stood before that nightgown. I was not afraid of my husband coming in here. But when I heard Thunder's sword being thrown to the bedroom floor, I shuddered and realized it was no longer worth waiting for a miracle and prolonging the agony. I lay in bed and waited. I had nothing to say. My husband suggested I think about the fact that he wanted children. I saw the disgust in my eyes, and the matter was straightforward. Thunder did not need to explain why he got up and would leave. I got up from the bed, and suddenly, not realizing what I was doing, I walked over to him and tried to touch his arm at the elbow with my palm to soften the situation somehow. But he only turned around and looked down at me. The moonlight was playing in his eyes, and their expression changed from regret to something that made my heart sink again, just as it had when he kissed me. Thunder quickly removed my hand from his, and with a quick, rest, I won't bother you again, he left the bedroom and closed the door tightly behind him, turning the key in the lock on the other side. I felt relieved as if my life had been saved. Perhaps it had been. I was a slave here, but I had won my first fight with my guard. At least, I thought I had. If I can influence Thunder on our wedding night, I can get him not to touch me again, I thought, relieved to look around the room where I was lucky enough to be alone tonight. I paid little attention to his, I won't bother you again, phrase because I only considered saving myself from being forced to have sex with a man I did not like, even if he was ten times the highest fay. Scene 18. Mariana and the Vampire Hunt. Indeed, I spent my first wedding night alone, lounging openly in a luxurious bed of soft silk sheets. I had closed the heavy curtains of the bedroom windows tightly so that the moon would not disturb me before I went to bed, and this gave me some peace of mind. I tossed and turned in bed for a long time, unable to sleep. I had the silhouette of a naked man in front of me, magnificent as God. And it was my husband who usually disgusted me with his appearance. In the morning, I woke up to the sun shining on my face. It took me a moment to realize that the curtains were open because I had closed them so carefully the night before. Who had come into my bedroom? I opened my eyes and saw thunder in front of me. He was sitting on the edge of the bed, gazing at me. Thunder was fully dressed. He was wearing a modest suit, starkly contrasting with the ones I had seen him in before. Pack up. We're going hunting, he said in a tone that accepted no objections. Hunting. I wondered and pulled the blanket higher over me, almost to my shoulders, tucked my legs under me, and sat down. Why? Thunder got out of bed, turned away, and laughed loudly. Why? Just because I want to. I curled my lips, about to object, but his gaze suddenly darkened, and I saw him again as a stern warrior, not a courteous high fay. You and I agreed, and it must be honored. If my courtiers don't see you hunting with me tonight, word will emerge that our marriage failed. And then we will both lose the benefits of this union, he added, tossing my clothes onto the bed. Here. Put this on, it's a suit that suits you better. It's made for hunting. I hesitated, picking through the articles of clothing with my hands. It was a grey, silver-embroidered, hooded caftan and pants with a wide leather belt. Thunder, leaving the bedroom, added. Put these on and be ready to go in half an hour. 
you'll find the boots over there, he pointed to a chest on which were tall, thin leather boots with laces. You have half an hour to be ready to ride. We'll go riding. On horseback. On horseback. I was horrified. But I don't know how to ride a horse. Thunder turned around and, standing in the doorway, said in a somehow satisfied tone. And you don't need to know how. You'll have a horse that understands you, and that's enough. Half an hour later, I was standing at the front door of Thunder's private castle, having got out of my clothes and their many ties and girded with a leather belt. Thunder was indeed waiting for me in the castle courtyard. He was riding a vast raven stallion whose stature and power were reminiscent of the mighty horses of the age of the knight's impression that was complemented by the thick mane and tail and the lush brushes on his feet at the hooves. Nearby stood a horse of the same raven color as his stallion but much more elegant. Its swan-like neck, neat little head with wide flared nostrils, and a long body with a steep croup reminded me of some fancy car from my old world. This horse was a fancy creature, with its shimmering blue eyes, in which a mischievous expression flashed, with its long mane neatly braided into ornamented pigtails. This horse's neat hooves were half the size of Thunder's stallion's hooves. But the whole look of the horse told even me, a completely inexperienced rider, that it was made for comfortable riding and speed. Thunder watched with interest as I regarded the horses. He said, Well, this is Mariana. You're going to ride her. Yeah, but, I mumbled, hesitantly looking around the horse. I don't know how to get on a horse. Thunder looked at me with a surprised expression and laughed. Yes, I promised your horse would understand, but you must get into the saddle yourself. I walked over to the horse, not knowing what to grab onto to get on the horse's back. Meanwhile, Thunder rushed over and approached me, staying a little behind me. I tried to jump up and ended up on the back of the pancake, but I was unsuccessful. I did not have the strength to jump up like that. Thunder watched my attempts with a smile. When I gave up and looked at him questioningly, he walked over to me and said, Jump up again. I jumped up and felt his arms around my waist, almost closing around it, and I flew upward, ending upright on the horse's back. Thunder stood nearby and, satisfied, looked up at me. Yeah, that's the angle I even like him from. I thought. When he looks up at me, he has that expression of a faithful dog waiting to be petted by his mistress. How could I possibly like him? He can look down on me, or up on me, or down on me, but I don't like him, I interrupted. And at that moment, Thunder, who had already got on his stallion, said. Now, on your way. He spurred his stallion to his feet and roared, waving his front hooves in the air. He galloped forward, away from the courtyard of Thunder Castle. My horse just stepped after them. I felt how good it was to sit on her back. It was so cozy, feeling like riding in a luxury car. My back involuntarily moved in the same rhythm as my horse's stride, and my legs wrapped around his flanks tighter. I needed to learn to manage a horse without a harness or to stay on it without a saddle and stirrup. Still, I had to trust Thunder and give the initiative to my horse. Mariana was going in the direction where Thunder had long ago ridden away on his stallion. I just sat and admired the surrounding expanse the fields, forests, and lakes around Thunder's castle. Who knows what was waiting for me out there on that hunt. The main thing was that I could talk to Thunder usually enough, and his face no longer disgusted me. I can hold out for a while and fulfill our pact with Voldemar. And then I'll get out of here.
When my horse led me out of another thicket and into a vast field, I saw a crowd of fay. They were waiting for us, Thunder and me. And here we were, in front of his subjects. A group of fay in luxurious robes separated from the crowd. I recognized them as friends of Thunder, who had been at the first feast I had attended in their world. One of them, that handsome blonde Amos, approached us with a bow and, looking up at Thunder and me, said, Greetings to you, Supreme Fay, and to you, our Lordless. I hope you had a night full of pleasure. As Amos spoke the last sentence, his gaze slid to my face, but he immediately averted it. After a passionate night of lovemaking with his friend and lord, he seemed to gauge the embarrassment that should have been written on my face. Thunder, harping on his stallion, nodded to his friend with a careless smile and replied. Thank you, Amos, for your wishes. Isabella and I thoroughly enjoyed our first night. I hope she was satisfied. The other fay courtiers listened to his answer as if assessing whether to believe it. Somehow, I thought there was distrust in their eyes at how Thunder responded to their greeting. I realized that Thunder was not entirely up to the role of a freshly baked husband, and I came to his rescue, adding, Thank you for your wishes. We had a memorable night. Did not we, my love? With those words, I looked at my husband as tenderly as possible. Thunder's stallion was snorting and playing, shaking his hooves as if competing in a dressage competition. He drew the attention of the crowd of courtiers away from the expression on Thunder's face, which was simply amazement itself. He had not expected me to be so refined in my speech. And even more so, Thunder had not expected me to support his game of real wife and husband, even in such a form. But then something special occurred to him, and he came close to me. I looked into his eyes and smiled a pretend to gentle smile, adding as much honey and tenderness to my voice as possible. Beloved, I'm so happy to be here with you on the hunt, but I'd like to return to the castle soon so you don't leave me alone for too long. The crowd roared with pleasure. Fays were shown a slice of their lord's intimate life, and it was the best we could give them to discuss. But then there were screams. At first, I did not understand what they were shouting, but when their shouts merged into a rumble of voices, I could make them out clearly. Kiss. Kiss. Thunder, who had not yet pulled away from me, looked at me in confusion. He did not know how deeply I had fallen into the role of his wife. But I took hold of his stallion's mane, pulled him to my horse, and set them aside. He froze, and so did Thunder, who sat on him. I grasped the wide collar of Thunder's caftan with my hand and pulled it toward me so that Thunder leaned toward me. Again, his face was in front of mine, but what I was about to do was now part of my game and I was leading in it, playing by my own rules. I touched my lips to thunders. What happened after my kiss, or the mere touch of my lips to thunder's lips, is impossible to describe. Fireworks exploded into the sky. A huge shadow loomed over us, a dragon that appeared out of nowhere and vanished into nothing. Thunder's subjects roared with delight, and now, not just those at the wedding feast had seen their lord and his wife kiss. Pulling away from Thunder's lips, I looked around in confusion. The kiss was not natural to him and me but to all the surrounding creatures his subjects were. I was getting increasingly bogged down in this game, but there was no escape. Meanwhile, Thunder rode away from me toward the ranks of his warriors, who were all riding horses of the same statue as his stallion. The Fey men greeted their leader with the thud of swords against the shields of their armor. Thunder, without rushing, 
accepted the protective armor for his shoulders and chest from the hands of one of them, put it on, and rode forward, stopping before the crowd of his subjects. He shouted something to them I could not understand. The crowd parted and formed a circle the size of a soccer field. Thunder rode into its midst and shouted, drawing his battle sword from its sheath and raising it above his head. The time has come. Follow me to battle. Before I could think where he was calling them all, too, a flood of creatures came crashing down on us from the sky. They came in flocks, swooping down on us, then flying upward, almost under the clouds. Pack after pack, they tried to knock Thunder out of the saddle. Thunder individually brought these creatures down to the ground with each swing of his sword. I froze in horror, unable to make sense of what was happening. Suddenly, there was a rustling sound behind me, like someone had unfolded an old leather cloak and shaken it. I turned around. Standing in front of me was a creature the likes of which I had never seen before. The face, covered in thin, wrinkled skin, resembled a human face and the face of a fox. The slim arms and legs were bound by leather webbing that, when spread apart, created the effect of wings. The creature opened its mouth and hissed. So that's what you are, the new queen of the Aetheris. I could not wake up, but I realized the horse was backing up and slowly turning to carry me away from this horrible creature. But something stopped the horse's movement like a rope had pulled us together. The figure of the creature approached us without moving at all. It was as if the distance between us was changing in my mind. The creature reached out its hand if you could call it that, trying to grab my arm. But I gathered my strength and leaned back against the horse's rump. There was nothing more I could do, though. The creature's bony hand touched my arm, thin fingers ran down my shoulder to my throat. Now let's see what he can do for you, the creature hissed and squeezed my throat. I choked. My eyes went black, and I would probably pass out soon. My only regret was that I had not left there in time to go to my world. It would have made more sense to die there. The thoughts flashed through my mind as I felt the creature's grip on me loosen, and I regained my breath. I clutched at my throat, trying to catch my breath. And then I noticed that Thunder was standing right behind the creature. It was the same height, but its leathery wings made it seem twice as big as Thunder. Thunder held his sword in front of him, and then I realized the creature had turned into two and had been cut in half. The two halves settled to the ground and disintegrated into many small creatures that scurried about, muttering something and scattering frantically in different directions. Thunder came up to me and, looking up from below me, asked. Are you okay? Yeah. What was that? Who was that? I could only answer, wheezing through a tight throat. That was the great vampire and his entourage. They regularly raid here, so I thought I'd show you what enemies we deal with. You mean he's not dead? I continued to ask. No, it's almost impossible to kill him. Only to incapacitate him for a while. He's better than me in that respect, I am mortal, Thunder replied, grinning menacingly. You'll get used to all this, but you have to be very careful with many of the creatures of our world, especially you, a woman from another world. Thunder turned and, already leaving, threw over his shoulder. And thanks for the kiss, it was excellent. I lowered my gaze in annoyance, trying not to flare up in the presence of his subjects. This was all just a game, and he's still mocking me. Way to go to war with your vampires. 
I spurred Mariana on and led her reins in the direction I wanted to go, and the horse swayed as it carried me away from Thunder and his jokes and vampire battles. I needed to get back to the castle and rest. Thunder and his subjects could do what they wanted without me. Scene 19 The Mistress In the evening of the same day, I had to attend a feast in honor of a successful vampire hunt. I did not ask Thunder what would have happened if the vampires had defeated the pack. I did not ask Thunder what would have happened if the vampires had won. And I could not talk to anyone else yet. I had not seen Arsenia in a long time, and the other maids did not count. The feast was held in the first castle I had ever been to. The familiar corridors of the court were more pleasant than the first time I had been there. I was welcomed there with royal honors because, to all of them, I was their lord's wife. While the feast was in full swing, I sat next to Thunder at a food and drink table I occasionally sampled. Everything seemed unearthly, unfamiliar even the taste of what I ate and drank. But gradually, I overcame that barrier and tasted their food more eagerly. Thunder was engrossed in conversations with the surrounding subjects. Oddly enough, many of them were women. Their admiring gazes blatantly expressed a desire to get his attention, to have the honor of speaking to him, and perhaps more than talking. The Fey women hardly looked at me, but I had noticed the looks of dislike in some of them before. Their behavior is more like that of rivals in love. But for whom? Toward Thunder, whom I did not like at all, and even on the contrary, makes me shiver with disgust? I thought, leaving the table to freshen up in the restroom outside the castle hall. When I came to the door of this room, a premonition made me not open its door but listen to the conversation with it. Two fey women were talking. One of them was saying. I don't understand what thunder found in this unassuming and helpless alien. Could he not have chosen one of us as his wife? We're his blood. The second one answered, and her low, velvety voice rang an alarm bell in my chest. I don't understand it either. He left me for that dirty girl and still hasn't visited me. He can't just leave me for her like that, even if she was his wife ten times over. My heart pounded like I was running as hard as I could. I pressed my back against the bathroom door to avoid giving myself away. I put my hand on my chest and tried to calm my rapid breathing. The woman's phrase, with her velvety and very sexy voice, had me in a stupor. But why was I so excited about Thunder having a relationship with someone? Our pact with him did not include giving up relationships with other people around us. Including that, we said nothing to each other about whether we would be faithful to each other, I shouldn't care. I thought. Why on earth should I care about who Thunder has had a relationship with before, who he's with now, and who else he'll be with? I must think about how to fulfill my part of the bargain and break up with him. Voldemar promised that if I fulfill my part of the bargain and be a good wife, which is, good, in quotes, only in the eyes of his subjects, then Voldemar will bring me home. Walking along the wall and trying to hold my breath, I silently walked away from the restroom and into the temple. Although there was a lump in my chest long after the incident, as if I wanted to cry, I could not do that. I kept telling myself, I don't care who Thunder had a relationship with. I don't care. I don't care. But this self-condemnation did not help me much. My chest was tight, and I felt both outraged and helpless at the same time. Scene 20 Necessity of Wielding the Dagger A few days passed. My life was getting back on track. I would wake up in my gorgeous marital bed with only me in the morning. I loved it. 
In the mornings, a couple of maids knocked gently on us in my marital bedroom. They laid before me the clothes I would wear that day and left. I explained to them on the first day when they tried to put on my usual daily clothes again that I did not want to be served every day like a little girl and could manage independently. From everything they brought me, I chose the simplest clothes that corresponded to my inner feeling for the day. After all, I'm no queen. I'm just an ordinary young woman who came here by accident. But on this day, Thunder was the first to enter the bedroom in the morning. He did not knock. He opened the door and entered the room as if I belonged to him. Boiling with anger, I covered myself with the blanket, sat in bed, and tried to pull up my day clothes, which had been tossed to the edge of the bed by Thunder's mighty hand. My husband did not look at me. He turned away with a quick hello, walked back to the window, and waited for me to get dressed. I grabbed my clothes, ran behind the screen I already knew, and quickly changed my nightgown into my everyday clothes. This time, my regular clothes comprised men's pants made of thin leather decorated with perforated patterns. It may have been one in this way to allow the body to breathe. I was asked to wear a gorgeous white shirt with lush lace around the edges of the sleeves and collar. When I had buttoned all its buttons, I looked at myself in the large mirror behind the screen. I found I needed some belt to tighten the garment around my waist. I stepped out from behind the screen and timidly approached Thunder, holding my shirt at my waist with my hands. Thunder, listen, I need some belt here. I could find nothing in these clothes to tie around my waist. Immersed in his thoughts, Thunder first looked at me, puzzled, as if not understanding what I was missing. Then his face brightened. He jerked his leather belt from his waist and handed it to me. I wondered. What about you? I asked in confusion, taking the heavy leather belt and scabbard from his hands. Thunder replied. Don't worry, I'll get another one. He watched as I tried to tie his belt around my waist, it seemed too long for me. Thunder stepped toward me with determination and almost wrapped his arms around me, instantly, he had the belt on me just as needed. The shirt did not hang in unnecessary folds or twist at my waist. He took a step away from me and, looking me over with satisfaction, added. Look, there's a sheath here, but it doesn't have a dagger. I'd recommend you learn how to use a dagger. You'll need it. I looked at him in surprise. What? Me and use a dagger? Why? He continued. Yeah, you need to learn how to use a dagger. It will do you good. As you have seen, our world is inhabited by quite unusual creatures, unlike the ones you are used to. I don't know your world. I may never know it. But my responsibility for you in this world is to keep you alive, healthy, and unharmed, which is why you need to learn how to use a dagger. It's just in case I'm not around when you need to defend yourself at some point. I did not answer. I was struck by Thunder's words about his responsibility to me. I did not feel responsible for him, but he did. He told me that I would trust him. I realized that Thunder was silent and staring at me. His gaze slid down my figure as if stroking my body from head to toe, back to my waist, and then to my chest. I felt strangely warm from that gaze, as if a spring of unusually vivid sensations burst inside. But the senses flickered and disappeared. Finally, I was satisfied with how the clothes fit me, so I asked Thunder. So, what's the purpose of leaving the house today? Hunting again? Or a horseback ride? Thunder calmly replied. Neither. 
We're going to a feast my subjects put on in honor of the summer equinox. I hope you enjoy it. After all, I can see that you're bored with being cooped up in four walls and even more bored that you can't go anywhere without me yet. Yes, that's the life we lead, full of danger. That's why I told you about learning to wield a dagger and maybe even other means of self-defense. You must learn to protect yourself. I looked at Thunder, trying to understand why he kept me safe. What's in it for him to ensure nothing happens to me? Does my presence play such a crucial role for him in this game he's playing with his pact with the mage about us posing as wife and husband in front of everyone? Or does he care about my well-being as a person, as his wife? But if I started talking to Thunder about everything I was thinking about and asking him questions about everything I wanted to know, we would not have had a lifetime to have this conversation. And I would not spend even a few days with him. So I just turned to Thunder and said. I'm ready, let's go. Thunder, saying nothing more, left the bedroom without delay, and I followed him. We went into the castle courtyard, where a couple of his courtiers were waiting for us. Amos was among them. He stared at me as if he could not believe what he saw. When Thunder, gallantly giving me his hand, put me into the carriage, Amos leaned over to Thunder and asked quietly. Are you sure she should come with us? Thunder turned toward him and closed the carriage door, but I had time to hear him answer. Yes, I'm sure of it. She's my wife and has to follow me no matter what. She'll have to live with whatever she sees out there. Dreams A Fay Fantasy Romance Written by Misha Quinn All Rights Reserved 2023 Book cover by Misha Quinn and Book Brush Templates, 2023 Auto-narrated audio files created on Mike Monster's resource, by using Pro Max License, 2023 Scene 21 Red Lotus Lake We arrived at the celebration. The feast was set up at the edge of the forest, in the center of which was a pond with dark dark water. At its edges floated dark red lotus flowers. Thunder gallantly extended his hand to me, inviting me to leave the carriage. I gave him my hand. This time, when my hand touched him, I did not shiver. I took his gesture for granted that I was his wife. In front of everyone, he should give me all the usual courtesies a husband gives his wife. The dark, oily surface of the pond suddenly moved in circles. The blood-red lotuses growing along the pond's edge danced in time with the movement of the water's surface. Suddenly, one woman's hand and another slowly emerged from the water in the pond's center. The hands were unusually graceful and their movements resembled the swans dancing on the water. Yes, it was a woman. Her head, adorned with a wreath of red lotus flowers, appeared. Her copper-red hair fell heavily over her shoulders, covering her breasts. The woman was not wearing any clothes. The movements of this woman's hands began with her long, slender fingers and traveled in waves down her arms to the woman's shoulders. The woman's hands continued their dance. The smooth movement flowed from one hand across the woman's shoulders to the other, forming waves. Her movements were so perfect that it was impossible to put them into words. The dancer's naked breasts emerged from the water. This woman did not need clothes to hide the incredible attractiveness of her figure. When her waist-high body emerged from the water, this dance attracted the attention of all the face surrounding the pond. This dance encouraged the spectators to wait for the dancer to appear from the water. 
I realized that someone was playing a flute or something similar. Those long and romantic sounds were as mesmerizing as beauty's dance. The woman danced with her eyes closed. She did not seem interested in who was looking at her or why these fays were there. She performed her dance as if it were her ritual dance, a dance of calling for love. I watched this woman move in the water and could not understand how she did it. She held on to the water, sticking out of the water up to her waist as if she were standing in it. Suddenly, as she moved again, I saw that her lower body, from the waist down, was covered with something pearlescent, like, fish scales. Oh my god, it's a mermaid. The thought flashed through my head like lightning. Do they exist? Nothing would surprise me, but seeing a real mermaid dancing in the water was fascinating. Meanwhile, the mermaid continued her dance. The music gradually sped up, and the dancer's movements became sharper and faster. The water around the mermaid formed a vortex, in the center of which her body was suspended in weightlessness. The mermaid's fish tail, with which she created a whirlpool around herself, became visible. This picture mesmerized not only me but everyone around me. The fey men just gazed at her body. It was as if they could not get enough of their fey women with beautiful bodies and perfect faces. This dance of the mermaid aroused in them the deepest sexual feelings, the kind that one cannot get from an ordinary woman, be she even ten times a fey woman. I was also staring at the mermaid. Suddenly, something felt like a nudge from inside me. I turned around and looked for thunder. I just needed to see him looking at the mermaid. I did not know why it was suddenly so important to me, but I needed to see his gaze fixed on her body. Thunder stood, and his gaze was fixed, no, not on the mermaid. He was standing there, staring at me. Our gazes met. I frowned in surprise, not knowing how to explain that I wanted to look at my husband then. Though I turned away, pretending to be more interested in the pond's watery surface than in his gaze, I could feel thunder still staring at me. I could feel that gaze sliding over me, down my neck and shoulder blades, lower and lower to my waist, then down my buttocks, thighs, and right to my feet. He looked at me like the other fey men looked at this dancing mermaid. No, that look in his eyes was impossible to bear. Not daring to turn around again to let Thunder know that his gaze had made me so uncomfortable, I turned away from him, sighed, and tried to think of an excuse to escape. I needed to get away from this fay, who was growing increasingly agitated by the mermaid's performance and talking excitedly amongst themselves while keeping their eyes on her body. I had to hide from him. I was only afraid that I could not hide from the sensations growing in me, the mermaid's dance, her sensuality, and how thunder looked at me. Just at that moment, someone's hand touched my elbow once. I shuddered, imagining it was thunder, and I did not know whether to return to him with annoyance at his insistent stare or gratitude for the attention he was giving me but it was a fey beauty woman I had seen before at the feast at Thunder Castle. Her expression changed as I turned to her. Although she gave her face an amiable presentation, I could see the squeamish expression she looked at me, thinking that I could not yet see her face in the darkness. The woman looked at me as if she were studying some inferior creature. The woman gestured invitingly for me to follow her. I did not refuse, for it was just a woman, and she was probably as uncomfortable as I was to be in a crowd of fey men, heated by a mermaid's sexy dance. I followed her even with some relief it was an escape from Thunder's gaze. We walked with her along the shore of the pond, away from the crowd of men, away from Thunder. 
I did not have time to ask her name we had to communicate somehow, and I did not know anyone from Thunder's entourage except for a couple of his subjects. I followed her, treading carefully on the dewy grass. We followed a path along the lake's edge, set among tall sedge-type grasses. A single touch on a leaf of this grass could cut your skin to the point of bleeding. I did not remember how I knew this, but I learned not to touch it without gloves. Finally, we came to the edge of the lake. This fey woman wanted to take me there, perhaps to show me something else about the celebration. Suddenly, the woman stopped so suddenly that I almost ran into her. She said, My name is Morgana. You can call me Morgana, I am Mistress Morgana to others. Her chest voice sounded familiar. I heard it somewhere, but I could not remember where. I looked at Morgana and saw a large pendant hanging from a beautiful gold chain. The charm was shaped like a dagger, decorated with beautiful metal ligatures and blackened patterns. Morgana noticed my gaze and, pleased with my interest in her jewelry, said, I see you're interested in my pendant. Yes, it's a very unusual piece. She raised her voice slightly, continuing her tirade with some mockery. And by the way, it's good for you to know that this is a gift from Thunder. I jerked away from her. My feet tangled in the thick grass. I staggered and almost fell, but Morgana picked me up under my elbows and brought me to my feet. She was strong for her frail build. Why does this Morgana tell me, with all her appearance, that thunder means a great deal to her? This woman, unashamed of me, the wife of her former lover, openly wears on her chest his gift, this pendant as a dagger. I wanted to run away from her. I did not know what I was doing alone with Thunder's ex-lover. And then suddenly, a thought popped into my head. Who says she's an ex-lover? The woman looked at me with sympathy, but there was in her gaze the expression of a victor who looks at a defeated enemy, for she had knocked me off my feet with the news that on her breast, right by her heart, her skin was touched by my husband's gift. I, stunned by her confession, stayed where I was. I looked around, but there was only darkness. My mind was racing with thoughts that something was amiss. Why did she lead me into this wilderness where you can barely hear the holiday sounds? My heart froze in my chest, then pounded like a caged bird. I felt that something was wrong here, that I should go back to the Fays, back to their crowd it would be safer there than alone with this hostile woman. But some unknown force pressed my feet into the marshy path, and I could not move. And then hundreds of tiny creatures crawled out of the tall grass along the path and reached for me. This something was everywhere. It, or, instead, they, were streaming toward me from the darkness on all sides, as if the soaked ground of this swampy lake shore was trying to swallow me up. I could neither scream nor move. That something was crawling up my legs higher and higher. This sticky mud covered my thighs then my waist, and almost reached my breasts. My breasts felt like someone was tightening an iron hoop on me. Then I felt a real horror. I could not breathe anymore. Morgana stood a meter away from me. The horror creature did not touch her. She was smiling contentedly, looking at me. When Morgana noticed I could not move, she said in a hushed voice, there, now Thunder doesn't need you anymore. What's left of you in half an hour will be useless to him. And if you even stay alive, your appearance will never attract him again. Morgana took a step back from me, stepped around me, and walked back toward the light of the torches, back to where Thunder and the rest of the face were. I was alone. My body could not move, and I could hardly breathe. 
I could feel some corrosive liquid burning through my skin. I felt many thin stings digging into my skin and drinking my blood. But I did not think of saying goodbye to life that way. No, never. Not like this. I closed my eyes, gathered all my remaining strength, and imagined my skin being purged of this affliction. I imagined a red-blooded lotus flower blooming above my head and the heat of its fire traveling down my body, penetrating it and the bodies of these creatures. When the heat of the fire descended below my shoulders, I felt relief. It was the shackles of my chest falling off. Then the heat of the lotus fire sank lower, lower, and flowed over the ground, destroying everything around it these creatures, the grass, and vaporizing the water in its path. And then something changed in my senses. That something, that had been choking me and drinking my blood just a second ago retreated. Softly and silently, that sticky mud slid off my body. It vanished into the dark grass of the marshy pond shore. I was saved. I was amazed at what I had done with the power of my imagination, but I no longer had the strength to leave this place. But the power of my imagination had defeated this black magic, I was sure it was some unknown dark power. I had dealt with this horror that Morgana had brought to me. All this gave me strength. My skin was unharmed, and neither the something nor the lotus fire had harmed me. I stroked my body with my hands, brushing away the ashes of the horrible something, and ran down the path along the pond's shore, trying to remember precisely how Morgana had led me here. I ran out of breath to the circle of people dancing to the sound of the fey flute. I stopped in the circle of light cast by the huge bonfire, around which pairs of fey men and women were dancing, holding hands, to the flute sound, and looked for thunder with my eyes. I could not immediately see where thunder was. Finally, I saw him. My husband was sitting on a large boulder close to the fire. The flames of the fire seemed to burn additional scars into his face, giving his already disfigured side an evil demon expression that kept changing with the dance of the flames. Opposite thunder, Morgana danced to the sound of the flute. She danced for him alone. The woman's movements were smooth, as if floating in the night's darkness. Her gaze was full of appeal and love and passion and directed toward thunder and only toward him. The campfire illuminated her, giving the scene an ephemeral quality. Morgana seemed to be made not of the flesh but of the tongues of the flame of the fire before which she danced. I could not believe what I was seeing. In all the time that Thunder and I had been husband and wife, he had never once given me a reason to doubt that he was only with me. Even though we were not physically close. And here, in front of all his subjects, Thunder watched the unequivocal dance of this beautiful, dangerous woman who had just tried to kill me. It was at that moment that Thunder noticed me. He stood up abruptly, took his hand off Morgana's arm, and strode toward me away from the circle of dancers, away from the fire. When he came straight toward me, I stood there, trembling with the conflicting feelings that overwhelmed me. I hated Morgana, who wanted me dead and tried to kill me. I wouldn't say I liked Thunder for looking at her like that, dancing passionately before him. I hated myself for being. Oh God, I hated myself for suddenly caring about Thunder. I did not remember how I ended up riding his horse back to the castle in Thunder's arms. I was half asleep. Perhaps my strength left me when I realized I was safe and near my husband. Thunder's horse carried us on his back, strolling and swaying gently. I felt as if Thunder were cradling me, one hand on my back and the other on his reins. The surrounding forest parted, and its clearing promised we would soon reach the field before the castle. 
I rested my head on Thunder's chest. He was wearing simple clothes, no metal armor of the high fey. But the giant steel muscles on his chest were as stiff as his plain armor. I could smell the spicy scent of his heated body and the fire permeating his clothes. And I liked those smells. I felt cozy on his chest, in his arms. I wanted this journey to go on for a long, long time. But the moment came when we reached the castle. Thunder gently pulled me away from him, still sitting on his lap. He mumbled, a little ironically. Well, my beautiful wife, you must come down to earth. Can you stand on your feet? I responded by resting my hands on his chest, which had become a habit of mine. I drew air into my chest, and I replied. I'll try. Please put me down. I can handle it. But Thunder gripped my waist tightly with both hands and lowered me gently to the ground. When my feet touched the ground, I realized I would have to hold on to something. I frantically grabbed his boot with my hand. Thunder jumped to the ground in a flash and was at my side. He put his arm around my shoulders, pulled me close, and led me slowly toward the gates of his castle. As we walked through the castle's corridors to the bedroom door, I staggered to the door jamb and asked Thunder to open it. He opened it and, holding me by the shoulders, led me into the bedroom. As my husband led me to the bed, he deftly pulled off my swamp mud-stained clothes and threw them directly into the fireplace flames. The clothes immediately ignited and glowed with some green love. I could no longer look in that direction. I realized my clothes were the remnants of that disgusting slime that had tried to choke me and dissolve me at the instigation of Morgana, that mistress of thunder. But then I realized I had left them in my underclothes. I did not know what to do, should I go to bed? But my feet, despite my fine leather boots, were soaked through and covered with mud. Thunder also noticed this. He sat me down on the edge of the bed and, quickly pulling off my wet boots, said. Wait for me. I'll be right back. He quickly left the room and returned five minutes later, carrying a large trough filled with hot water. I dipped my bare feet into the water with relish. Before I could bend down to wash them, Thunder kneeled before me and dropped his hands in the water. He took a bar of soap and, soaping his hands, ran them over my legs. I felt like flying to heaven from his tenderness washing my feet. Thunder did it as gently as if they were a child's feet. I stared at him in amazement. I watched as his massive hands, accustomed to the hilt of a sword, gently touched my feet, lathering them with soap with a delicate floral scent and stroking my every toe first, on one foot, then on the other. I felt a pleasure that I could not have imagined before. Could a man, I mean a man, and not just any man, but a supreme fay, woo a woman like that? Could he, thunder? who has hitherto seemed so rough to me, be so gentle. Thunder continued to massage my legs. His circular stroking palms moved from my feet to my knees, then to my thighs. But then, my sensations exceeded my ability to tolerate them without a moan of pleasure. I grabbed both of Thunder's wrists with both hands. I did not want him to continue this gentle torment. Our gazes met, and the fire of desire burned through our hearts. I was the first to lower my gaze. Thunder, grinning lightly, removed his palms from my thighs. He dabbed a colossal terry towel against my skin and drained my legs. Then he deftly lifted my legs and laid me on it, carefully turning my whole body along the bed. I lay on the bed entirely peaceful and relaxed. 
As he had once before, Thunder leaned over me and rested his hands on either side of my shoulders. He looked at me, but there was no question in his gaze. He looked as if he wanted to make sure I was finally okay. Seeing the answer in my eyes, he knew I could sleep now. I lay on our marital bed with a relaxed expression. I did not know how to tell Thursday that even though I was grateful for his care and concern for me, I would be even more thankful if he left me alone. But I just closed my eyes and smiled at him, eyes closed. I brushed my hand over his arm and touched the hand resting on the bed's edge beside me. I did not have to open my eyes to know from his satisfied sigh he understood my sign of gratitude and accepted it. I knew he had known what I meant. I turned my head slightly to the side and rested it comfortably on the soft pillow, ready to fall asleep. Almost exhausted from the night's events, I opened my eyes again. I saw that Thunder was smiling gently at me. The mangled side of his face was wrinkled in a strange grin, but the part of his face that was untouched by the scars was so beautiful now that I could not take my eyes off him. I had seen everything scared, but from that moment on, they did not scare me anymore. Thunder slowly moved away from me and sat on the edge of the bed. He had an expression on his face like he was forcing himself to do something he did not want. But he got up from the bed and threw the comforter over me, covering me from head to toe. Thunder stepped aside, picked up a trough of already cold water and a wet towel, and carried it all outside the bedroom. Thunder was doing the maid's job. He was doing it for me so that I would sleep soundly and no one would disturb me again tonight. When Thunder came back to me, I was still awake, but I was already completely relaxed. I exhaled quietly. Thank you. Thank you for saving me. Thunder replied, and there was annoyance in his voice. I did not save you. I should have foreseen that this might happen. I should have foreseen that she would not like you're my wife. I opened my eyes in amazement and stared at him. Did Thunder know she, Morgana, did this to me? Did he know? Thunder saw the look on my face and added. I should have foreseen this development. I will not allow her to terrorize you again. I will take all measures to ensure this woman never hurts you again. But you must be careful. Remember that I gave you a dagger, you must learn to use it. It's the bare minimum for your defense. I don't know how you coped with the forces of my former lover brought upon you. Perhaps you were just lucky. He emphasized the word X, which sent a warm wave through my chest. It was hopeful. Hope for what? I could have something with him other than this arranged marriage relationship. No, no. Thunder realized I had disconnected from talking to him and had gone into my feelings. He lightly adjusted the blanket to my chin, sighed softly, and said, Well then, sleep, Isabella. Sleep, my beautiful wife, sleep. See you tomorrow. His voice sounded so warm and lulling that I did not even realize I had fallen asleep. Dreams A Fay Fantasy Romance Written by Misha Quinn All Rights Reserved, 2023 Book cover by Misha Quinn and Book Brush Templates, 2023. Auto narrated audio files created on Mike Monster's resource by using Pro Max license, 2023. Scene 22 Thunder and Morgana's Explanation. The next day, I woke up feeling that some important event would happen today. However, in the morning, 
Thunder did not come to my bedroom. Instead, Arsenia came and helped me pick out my clothes for tonight. Breakfast was served in bed, which was still unusual for me. After all, I knew I should get dressed, wash my face, and brush my teeth, and only then eat breakfast. Where these habits came from, I could not say. Perhaps they were from that other life of mine. But those habits were hardwired into my head, and even the magic of this world could not smoke them out. Evening came. I spent the afternoon studying with one of Thunder's fighters, who showed me how to use a dagger in self-defense. I awkwardly repeated his movements, and he, an older fey warrior, shook his head regretfully, questioning Thunder's idea of training me to defend myself. After class, I returned to my bedroom, to Thunder and me, and bathed. I had my bath in a barrel and brought it to my bedroom on a cart. I sat in the barrel filled with warm water. I enjoyed its coolness, cooling down my body, which was heated by physical exercises. I rested a little after dinner, which was brought to my bedroom. Towards evening, when I heard the bugles announcing the beginning of the feast, I chose one dress brought by the maids, the simplest one, the only adornment of which was a rose flower pinned on the shoulder. It was artificial, but in the firelight, its petals seemed as delicate as a natural rose. I left the bedroom and followed the maids to the castle's main hall, where a feast was being held. I did not know the reason for the dinner and did not want to know. The memories of the previous evening at the pond were haunting me, and I was expecting a trick from every event in the castle. And so it was. When I entered the hall, where the familiar and high fay were already gathered, the crowd did not part as their etiquette required. For a moment, I thought I was no longer his wife. No one noticed me. As I walked through the rows to Thunder's throne, no one thought to move. I did not know what caused it, but when I saw Thunder sitting on his throne, I raised my head proudly and elbowed the last courtiers, blocking my way to my husband and walking to the throne. Thunder's face lit up with a sincere smile. He stood up, came down from the platform, and gallantly, giving me his hand, helped me onto the platform where his throne stood. I sat down beside him on another smaller throne. Everyone around me froze. I understood nothing that was happening here. Just a moment ago, Faze gave me royal honors, and now. What had happened? Morgana entered the circle of empty seats in front of the throne. She was dazzling. Her flawlessly beautiful face attracted the eyes of everyone in the room. Her body was shrouded in translucent robes. An ornate belt emphasized her incomparably thin waist. Morgana's hair was adorned with a tiara of uncut gemstones set in gold. Everything about her said she was a lady of the noble Fay family and worthy of attention. I did not lower my gaze when Morgana stared at me. Her face, however, was expressionless. The Fay woman looked at me as if I were nothing and turned away quickly, turning her attention to thunder. But I could feel the danger from her with all my being. Thunder, meanwhile, greeted Morgana graciously as if he did not remember that she had wanted to kill me yesterday. A wave of distrust rose in my soul. I thought about how he could be nice to this woman, who was openly provoking him, seducing him in full view of everyone yesterday. And that she was trying to get rid of me. His lawful wife, was that a flower? Morgana bowed deeply to thunder and ignored me completely. But I did not need to accept signs of deference from this snake soul woman. Any dragon of this world was far more soulful and honest than her. While anger boiled in my soul, the feast began. The viands succeeded each other, and the wine flowed in rivers. There seemed to be no end to the feast. As usual, 
Thunder sat on his throne and did not come downstairs to sit at the communal table. We were brought food on trays, and he chose what he wanted to eat himself or share with me. He would not let me take anything from the tray and signaled me to eat only what he ate. Morgana, who was seated at the communal table directly across from Thunder's throne, facing him, raised a heavy goblet of wine and exclaimed loudly. To the health of our Lord. I realized that Thunder could not refuse to drink wine at such a toast. He had drunk nothing but water before. He had been handed a goblet like the one Morgana held. Thunder accepted the goblet from the servant's hands and raised it above his head, replying, Long live our higher powers. The roar of cheers drowned out the crowd, and the Fae drank from their goblets. The wine flowed down their faces and spilled onto the tables and tablecloths, it flowed down the clothes and bedspreads of the Fae women. The whole place seemed to burst into a riot of merriment. Musicians appeared out of nowhere and played cheerful music. Faye rushed to dance in pairs, and everyone twirled to the sound of the music. Thunder looked at me. It was as if he had asked for my consent to dance with him. Before I could nod, Morgana stood before him, giving him her hand. She was asking him to dance. What an asshole! I thought. I had not expected to feel so annoyed that she was crossing my path again. Even if Thunder and I aren't real husband and wife, no one knows that. What does she allow herself, after all? But what is the conscience of a murderer? Nothing. After all, she wanted to kill or maim me. My nerves could not take it anymore. I stood up abruptly and, lifting the hem of my dress, ran off the platform and disappeared into the crowd of the dancing fay, leaving Thunder standing in front of Morgana. Let him deal with his mistress. If he's okay with what she tried to do yesterday, it was too much for me, I thought. I needed to be alone and decide what to do next. I can no longer fulfill our pact with the mage if I leave Thunder before the mage gives permission. Otherwise, I will never return to my world, to my family. I was running through the castle's corridors and suddenly realized I was lost. There was no one around. All the servants were at the pirate's service, and no one was in this part of the castle. I walked farther and farther down the dark corridors where the draft walked and opened more doors of rooms from which there was no further exit. I was tired of wandering in the darkness and took a torch from the corridor wall to light my way when I heard footsteps in one room. I froze. I could have asked the man for directions to my part of the castle, but something stopped me. In the room outside the door, I was standing. Footsteps were heavier than the first, and a low male voice sounded painfully familiar. Thunder asked someone. So, are you satisfied? Did you put on such a show to get her to leave? I froze in anticipation that the truth about Thunder would be revealed. I both wanted to know what he had in mind for me and dreaded it. I felt like he was the only one who cared about me in this world, and if I got proof that he did not, then. I did not know how I would feel about him, but I was sure it would be decisive. Something has been bugging me lately. Whether it was a warm feeling for him or something else, I did not know. And now I had to find out whether he was my enemy or. Then came Morgana's voice, full of honey and tenderness. Thunder, love, don't do that. You know how much I love you. At Morgana's words, favorite, I shook with anger. Now he's going to answer her. What am I going to hear? Oh, God, I don't have the strength to stand here and wait for my entire world to come crashing down at his words. I thought, but I did not leave the door. 
the torch in my hand sizzled and went out. No one outside the door paid any attention to the sound, so absorbed were Thunder and Morgana in their conversation. Thunder said quietly but sharply. Morgana, I never promised you anything. Our connection was over and is over. Did not you realize that? Light footsteps were heard. Morgana's voice became even more quiet and inviting as she exhaled. You can't say that. You know how much I love you. My heart is with you, and you can do nothing about it. She must have gotten close to Thunder because there was a rustle of clothes and her sigh as if she was hugging him. My heart raced as if I were running. I should have run, but my legs would not budge. I was stuck to the floor, listening. Thunder continued. Morgana, don't say that. I tell you again that I have promised you nothing, nor do I owe you anything. We often make love. In our world, no one promises each other fidelity forever. We are almost immortal, unfortunately. Morgana, with irritation and pleading in her voice, said. But you can't do this to me. Can't. Here, she seemed to gasp with indignation and conjecture. She continued in a hushed whisper. Are you, in love with her? Thunder did not answer. I stood outside the door, unable to even breathe. My chest was tight. I could not push even a fraction of the air into my lungs or exhale at that moment. You can't love her, that lurker from the human world. No, no, and no. Morgana's voice rose to a squeal. Calm down. It came Thunder's growl and a whipping slap, then another and another. Did he really hit her? If Thunder hit his former lover, even a poisonous one like Morgana. I'll lose the respect for him that had butted, I thought feverishly and finally peeked through the narrow crack of the room's door. Thunder stood in the middle of the room, holding Morgana, who was hysterical, back with both hands. The woman whipped her palms at his face and neck and tried kicking him with her legs. Her face was ugly in this fit of anger and despair. But Thunder held her tightly and had an utterly impenetrable expression on his face as if restraining a capricious child. I quickly bounced away from the door. Thunder did not give in to Morgana's provocation. He could not have known I was here. They could not have made such a scene just for me. And he did not hit her. Just then, another hunch pierced me. So he's in love, with me. What the hell is that? My heart began to melt and melt and melt and melt. I was flying up into the clouds, rising above this room, above this castle, toward the moon that shone in the velvet black sky that night. I was flying from the delight of Thunder's confession of love to me. He did not confess it to me, but he confirmed that my feelings for him were well founded. My feelings? But do I really love him? I thought, tenderized by this feeling of understanding what I felt for him and a sense of dread for the future trials that awaited him and me. What's in store for me and him? Have we already broken our pact with Voldemar by becoming indifferent to each other? This thought flashed and disappeared in the flood of tenderness for thunder and the joyful feeling of something outstanding awaiting us. Finally, I came to my senses a little and, treading quietly on the old floorboards of the castle corridor floor, made my way away from this room where Thunder could now soothe his former mistress for as long as his soul desired. I realized. But I desperately needed my husband to tell me how he felt, to look me in the eye. <laughs> Dreams
A Fae Fantasy Romance Written by Misha Quinn All Rights Reserved, 2023 Book Cover by Misha Quinn and Book Brush Templates, 2023 Auto-narrated audio files created on Mike Monster's resource, by using Pro Max License, 2023 Scene 23. Mountain Lake. After I had unwittingly witnessed Thunder's explanation to Morgana, his former lover, I wandered the dark corridors of the castle for a while longer and found my bedroom. I threw myself into bed without undressing. My mind was racing with thoughts of his love for me. He does. And never made it clear. What was Thunder protecting me from? I was fulfilling my pact with the mage, and the day would soon come when Voldemar would bring me home. I realized I was putting the very possibility of getting home from here on the line. But my home was becoming an increasingly blurred concept in my mind. The memory never returned to me, and I did not understand why I was so eager to return home. Home but that thunder loved me. That struck me to the core. And I could not contain my feelings for him. Sleep came unbidden. I woke up early in the morning in unusually high spirits. I looked out the bedroom window and saw a rainbow making a complete arc across the blue sky. It was a good sign, and I threw off my clothes, opened the bedroom door, and shouted to the maids. Good morning, I'm ready. That meant they could carry me everything they usually brought for my morning toilet, warm water in a pitcher, a basin for washing my face, hair shake sent to the golden handles, and all that. For the first time today, I enjoyed the process of them helping me clean up. None of the maids thought to ask how I had spent the night. They were used to their master not sleeping in this bedroom or he had ordered them not to ask anything. I knew nothing about why they never asked me about my night with my husband. And this time, I told them. I want to look perfect today. Choose my best riding clothes and style my hair so that it is elegant but not in the way of riding. Everything was done exactly the way I wanted it done. I wore a two-piece riding pantsuit. It was gray fabric embroidered with silver threads. The white shirt, made of thin fabric with wide sleeves and lace cuffs, fit me perfectly and set off the tan I had gotten from riding and fencing. I walked to the stables, unnoticed by anyone. My horse Mariana was waiting for me, and she neighs happily when she smells my scent. Today, I rode my horse outside the menege and into the mountains surrounding the castle for the first time. I wanted to explore the castle's surroundings, partly out of curiosity and partly out of calculation. I took a light whip, without the help of the stableman, but still with the aid of the bench, jumped on Mariana's back, and, patting the horse on the neck, directed her away from the castle, into the mountains, with a calm step. Why did I choose the mountains for my trip? I was tired of the forest with its dark thickets, the knotty roots of giant trees suddenly appearing on the way, and the possibility of getting into a swamp because of ignorance of the terrain. And the mountains seemed unusually clear and easy to ride. I wanted to enjoy the vastness of the hilltops. I should have thought about going higher into the rocky part of them. I could not even make it up there on foot, let alone on horseback. I waved to the servants and the stable boy, who stood at the castle gate in confusion, and Mariana strode away from them with a measured step. My path followed the road, which soon narrowed to the size of a footpath as I climbed higher and higher into the foothills. At last, a splendid view of the valley opened before me, along one slope of which the water of a high mountain spring was noisily flying down. The waterfall, 
falling from an almost ten-meter-high cliff, was mesmerizing in its beauty and majesty. On the way down, the stream of water broke into a myriad of particles that sparkled like diamonds and created a rainbow around the jets of the waterfall. The water fell directly into a small lake, probably created by this source of purest mountain water. I dismounted and let the horse drink the purest water from the lake. Then I tied Mariana to a stout tree by the lake so she could drink the water if she wanted. And, of course, I, heated by riding a horse, immediately wanted to take off all my clothes and plunge into this lake's clear and cool water. I looked around. There were no paths leading to the lake. I thought it was completely deserted and no one could have come there. Nothing alarmed me, the birds quietly continued their business and sang in the bushes around the lake. At first, they were silent when Mariana and I approached the lake, but then, convinced we would not harm them, they continued their nest building. I decided it would be safe to swim here. I gladly removed my sweaty clothes and threw them on a boulder at the lake's edge. The splash of falling water also reached this spot, but only as a refreshing vapor. I walked toward the water, treading carefully with my bare feet on the stones of the lake shore. I did not rush into the water as a man might have done. I gingerly tasted the water with the tips of my toes, then dipped my whole foot. The freshness of the water immediately refreshed me. I walked straight to the middle of the lake, treading carefully. It was not deep perhaps only a couple of meters, but I was not a super swimmer, and even that depth seemed endless. With a groan of pleasure, I swam. The water lapped me with a stream of coolness. The spray from the jets of the waterfall splashed on my hair. The lake's water was as clear as a teardrop, making it possible to see the tiny pebbles covering its bottom. I took a deep breath, exhaled, and dove into the depths of the lake right down to the bottom. At first, I instinctively squeezed my eyes shut, but then I opened them right up in the water. The water was not salty, and nothing irritated my eyes. I swam like that underwater, trying to press myself lower to the bottom and get some pebbles from the bottom as a souvenir. It was a habit I had had since childhood. I was trying to remember where I had done it, but I knew I enjoyed collecting small pebbles from places where I had an enjoyable time. And that was when I saw thunder swimming toward me. Dreams A Fae Fantasy Romance Written by Misha Quinn all Rights Reserved, 2023 Book Cover by Misha Quinn and Book Brush Templates, 2023 Auto-narrated audio files created on Mike Monster's resource, by using Pro Max License, 2023 
Scene 24. Confessing. Thunder swam straight toward me. Underwater, his face looked unusually beautiful like the face of the god of the seas. His thick hair developed in the water, creating a dark halo around his head. His body was athletic and beautiful, moving with the grace of a shark, which does not waste any extra effort to move in the water column but is ready to rush to attack at any moment. I froze at the bottom, trying to figure out what to do now, I had run away from the castle without my husband's permission, and here he was. Thunder turned slightly and, in the water, saw me. His eyes widened in surprise, air bubbles escaping from his mouth as if he were saying something. I, not knowing what to do now, realized that I no longer had the strength to be underwater without air, and sharply pushing off from the bottom of the lake, I rushed up to its surface. Thunder boomed out with noise right next to me. Only now did I realize he was also unclothed. I had seen him without clothes once before, but that was in the moonlight, practically in the dark, and here. All my determination to force Thunder to admit that he cared about me evaporated, I could not control myself. My nerves were tense, like I needed to run like hell. Maybe I did. I was ready to break my pact with the mage that my marriage to Thunder would remain a mere formality. Thunder was the first to come to his senses. He was floating upright in the water, looking at me, looking straight into my eyes, and his gaze was unusually affectionate. I shrank back and covered myself with my hands, horrified that my body was on display to him and we were alone. I remembered how he had once saved me from the skeptical gaze of his courtiers, when my dress had dissolved on me from sitting on his throne. But that was in his company and the company of his courtiers. And here he and I were again, entirely alone, as on our wedding night. Thunder in his deep voice, now sounding quite hoarse to me, said, Isabella, what a surprise. What are you doing here? I replied, also trying not to look at his body in the water but only into his eyes. I'm a swimmer, don't you see? Don't I have a right to be here? Despair rang in my voice. Thunder realized this and replied conciliatory. I did not mean to accuse you, Isabella. I just... Before we knew it, we were almost under the waterfall's flow. Exhausted from the power of the feeling that had just linked us in the water, we both lay on the shore under the caressing rays of the setting sun that were making their way into the valley between the hills. Thunder was the first to come to his senses. He sat beside me, leaning one hand on the rock of the lake shore, the other resting on a knee bent and drawn up to his stomach. He looked at me and said, And you? You're beautiful, and you know that. His voice had the notes of a man who had suddenly allowed himself to show affection and was surprised by it. I replied without opening my eyes. And you, too. Thunder was silent. I opened my eyes and sat up, wrapping my arms around my knees and continuing. You're beautiful too, and you don't know it. Recently, I thought you were. I fell silent, reliving my feelings when I first saw Thunder again. I'm a freak, aren't I? Continued Thunder with irony at my phrase. Yeah. I thought so before I got to know you more, I answered boldly and looked Thunder straight. I can tell you this now, you are the best man I know. And the most handsome. I gave him a look. But it was too late, 
Thunder turned to me with his whole body and, taking me by the chin, leaned toward my face. I felt his lips again, his kiss full of the tenderness and triumph of a man who is loved. I could not utter a word when thunder broke away from my lips. My feelings were like a storm that swept away everything in its path. I did not know it could be like this pleasure and happiness of being kissed by your favorite man. Thunder looked at me with a gaze that glowed with tenderness and concern. But what does he care about? Everything was fine, and we had said nothing to each other that would change our plans. And then he uttered. Isabella, I love you. And I want you to be my wife for real. Everything in my soul broke off. I felt as if I were flying up and then falling from a great height. We were not supposed to say anything like that to each other, but in my heart, I was triumphant that I had been brave enough to answer my husband. Me too. I love you. I did not understand why my body, which I could give to him right now in its entirety, elicited nothing but tenderness from him. I was ready to love him and give him and myself this greatest pleasure of love, but he did not accept the gift. I could feel his heart beating like crazy when he kissed me. And now he was as if nothing had happened. Did I seem ridiculous to him in showing my feelings? Thunder understood my confusion and added. Isabella, my love, we can't have this. We can't be real husband and wife. Forgive me for saying so. I should have hurt your feelings. It's all useless and dangerous for you. I, completely dumbfounded, felt like I had been doused with water. But what is it about? That pact with the mage. To hell with it. I don't believe anything bad will happen because of our feelings for each other. And even if it did, what then? If I never return to my world, I don't care. I want you to know that I love you. Thunder came over to me, put his arms around me, and as he pulled me into his embrace, he breathed. Yes, my love and darling, I want what I said. But we must not do it. I understand the consequences of such a move more than you do, and they will be cruel. That's why I let's forget what happened and try to fulfill the agreement with the mage. But what Thunder was saying did not matter now. All that mattered was how he said it, held me, and looked into my eyes. And I could feel the warmth of his body warming me in the evening's chill. All of this created a flood of feelings that I could not handle anymore, and they spilled over into tears of joy and tenderness for Thunder. I cried, face buried in his chest, and Thunder hugged me and kissed my hair, never saying another word. Retired but happy, we returned to the castle and dismounted to the stables. When the stablemen led our horses into the stable, Thunder and I strolled to the gate of the castle chambers, which were in the inner courtyard of the building. We walked side by side, both of us in our thoughts. But our hearts were beating in unison, I was sure of it. I looked up upward, and there were two eagles in the rising currents of the evening air. They flew far from each other, and it seemed they had no interest in each other, and their paths did not cross. But if you looked closely, you could see that the direction of their movement was the same. The same, upward, spiraling upward all the time. I thought that Thunder and I were like these two eagles, moving separately as if we did not need each other, but in fact, we could not live without each other anymore. I felt it. I knew it. Thunder walked beside me without touching me. Suddenly, he took my hand and, bowing before me, got down on one knee and kissed my hand. I, in no way expecting such a show of deference to me,
touched his hair with my other hand, striking it, and asked. Thunder, what's the matter? I don't need any honors, you know that. He, still on one knee in front of me, said. You are worthy of the highest honors. You are my queen, and you realize that. I shook my head and even tried to laugh. No, I don't want any of that. But he interrupted me. You don't understand. In expressing reverence for you, I am expressing what my heart feels. I fell silent and replied quietly, taking my hand lightly from his arm. Well, since that's the case, let me pay my respects to you as well. With these words, I bowed as elegantly as I could to him, sitting down in a kneeling position. I was dressed in a riding pantsuit, my hair was mussed. I could not brush it since my bath. My face and hands were covered with tan and road dust. But Thunder looked at me as if he were seeing me for the first time. He had expected none of this from me. He must have thought he was the only one who could show deference to someone he loved. But I also may show him and everyone around me I love my husband. I thought. However, realizing that I loved him was an incredibly poignant feeling for me. After all, until a couple of days ago, I genuinely could not stand him. And now, my latent feelings for thunder came out of my tortured soul, and I leaned over and kissed his hair, unashamed of anyone looking at us. Thunder looked down at me, not saying a word. He realized it was better to let me act the way I wanted than to make me obey his rules. It was my second victory on this long and wonderful day. Thunder realized that we both had the right to express our mutual respect publicly. Thunder rose from his knee and, taking me under his arm, led me solemnly into the castle. I raised my head to look at the eagles once more. They were already far away, but together. They were disappearing together into the distance in the pre-sunset sunlight, the rays of which colored the light puffy clouds on the horizon crimson. I lowered my gaze and noticed a woman's silhouette in one of the castle windows. The woman moved sharply from the window, but I realized it was Morgana. Scene 25. Fighting for Love The evening went as usual, the Fey men gathered in the dining hall, drinking and eating heartily. The Fey women cooked and served them. The musicians played quiet tunes in the corner of the dining hall. I sat next to Thunder. I was in a good mood, I wanted to sing and dance. When we had eaten, I asked Thunder. Do you want to dance? I'm not a good dancer. I usually watch other people dance. He replied. And then Morgana popped up on the platform in front of the tables with feelings. She held out her hand to Thunder, inviting him to dance. I stared at her in surprise and disbelief. What was she up to? Had she not had enough of what Thunder had recently told her? But the woman continued to beckon Thunder to her, wriggling her beautiful body languidly. The eyes of the men were fixed on her. Then the Fey men shouted to Thunder. Hey, go to her. You'll have time to enjoy your wife tonight. Now you can have fun and entertain us. I, 
dumbfounded by this turn of the evening, could not believe my eyes as I watched Thunder, frowning, rise from his throne and walk down to Morgana. With a flick of his hand, he stood beside her and made her spin on her axis so that her thin robes flew apart and exposed her beautiful legs. The men roared with delight. They had been waiting for a show, and Thunder gave it. He made no unnecessary movements, but he was dancing with Morgana. I watched him smoothly embrace her, letting her move away from him, then bringing her so close that her breath mingled with his. Morgana was as if in a trance. Her face was a look of pleasure. She glanced at me occasionally, clearly pleased with the effect I was having. She could not attract thunder by dancing on the lake. She could not bring him back to her by being alone with him in the castle room. But she could get him to touch her body again, in full view of me, Thunder's wife. It was unbearable. The bitch knew precisely how I could feel right now, and she was reveling in her victory. I jumped up and ran out of the room, not knowing how to cope with the doubts that came over me and the rage that I had been so wrong about Thunder, about his words, about loving me. I did not care what others would think of it. I did not watch what Thunder was doing there with his former lover. I did not understand how it was possible, just saying he loved and respected me and then going after his ex-girlfriend. No. I will never tell him anything else. I will not tell him of the pain he is causing me by mindlessly following the traditions of his kingdom. I don't belong to him. I ran through the dark corridors of the castle and cursed everything and everyone in the world. Why did I believe Thunder? I did not trust him from the start, and rightly so. How can a man with his face be straightforward? No. He's a monster. When I got to my bedroom, I fell flat on the bed. I did not want to undress, it would remind me of how Thunder had looked at me and touched and kissed me so recently. Those memories ached in my soul. But I could not get rid of them. Thunder struck me in the heart, first by how ugly he was, then by how adorable he was. Enchanted by his attractiveness behind the curtain of his rough appearance, disfigured by his rival's sword, I fell for him like a gullible goldfish. I lay on the vast bed that he, my so-called husband, had once shared with me and cried helplessly. How can I compete with this fey beauty? She's his ex, and apparently, he still loves her. Or at least he's still attracted to her. And what can he get from me? an ordinary girl. I don't even have magic. I don't own myself, I don't own my feelings for him, for thunder. I buried my face in the pillows and sobbed as hard as possible. Something told me I would cry instead of showing my weakness in front of everyone. It was enough that I had been running since tonight like I had lost the battle for thunder and his attention to Morgana. At that thought, my tears vanished. I sat on the bed, wiped my tears, and clenched my hands into fists. No, Morgana will not win. Me. No. I can fight for what is perhaps my destiny. And my destiny is thunder. That thought made me feel instantly better. I decided I would fight, even if it were against a powerful fey woman like Morgana. I threw off my dress and quickly put on a dark pantsuit. I put on a hat with a feather, like a gamekeeper's hat, tucked my hair into a bundle, and hid it under the hat. Looking at myself in the mirror, I saw I looked more like a young boy than a woman. I was on my way to see the mage. <laughs>
Scene 26. A Wizard's Workshop. I left the castle without being seen, as it seemed to me, and went into the stables and found Mariana's stall. My red horse did not seem surprised that I saw her at this late hour, when usually the stable men, having given the horses their evening rations of food and water, had already gone to the neighboring barn for the night. Mariana placed her muzzle affectionately on my shoulder as if to ask. Well, what's the matter? I stroked her head, ran my hand through her thick mane, and patted her neck. All these were signs of approval and greeting, establishing mutual understanding. Mariana snorted softly and spun her ears, excited that I had come to her at this unusual hour. I bridled the horse, awkwardly piled the saddle on its back, and took it off, figuring I would ride without it. I did not yet know how to put all the harnesses on the horses and decided not to waste time on this futile endeavor. The trainer had taught me to stay on the horse's back without a saddle so I could take my chances and go on my trek the way Thunder did. Yes, he liked to ride his horse without a saddle. And here that Thunder is giving me a hard time. I shook off my thoughts of him with irritation. I jumped up onto Mariana's back with irritation, using the fence of her corral as a foothold. The horse was slightly surprised at my jerk but stood calmly, waiting for me to feel balanced enough to ride. The clever animal knew that an unbalanced rider was a headache for the horse and himself. Seeing that Mariana would not move forward, following my impulsive movements with my legs and shaking her harness, I stopped trying to move the horse and relaxed. And then Mariana went ahead, away from the stable and into the street. The horse entered the square and moved toward the castle gates, quietly clattering its hooves on the sidewalk. The gate was locked. I stared at the massive gate, probably four meters high, made of oak logs. How did I forget that the lock was locked at night? It's all my hysterics about thunder. Now I'll have to return to the stable and put Mariana back in her stall. But then I felt the horse gather in a stance, like before a jump. But horses don't jump high, especially not from a standing position. They need acceleration, I thought but I clutched both hands to Mariana's mane just in case. But the horse suddenly got off the ground and flew upward, rising higher and higher above the castle courtyard. Looking down, I realized that substantial black wings were spread beneath me, Mariana had become a giant black dragon. Mariana and I were flying through the sky amidst the dark clouds, which were getting thicker and thicker. My heart was racing, outpacing our flight. If the McGee did not tell me why Thunder needed this marriage so much, I could not stand a minute with this monster, my gentle monster Thunder. Mariana descended and, carefully touching the ground with all four hooves, stood like a stump before Mage's hut. I knew it was his hut, though I did not understand how the horse knew where I needed to go. He could read my mind or understand my mood. I dismounted, patted Mariana on the withers, and watched as her vast black wings turned to smoke and disappeared. An average brown horse stood in front of me. I, still not ceased to marvel at Mariana's transformation into a dragon, left her standing in front of the hut without tying her up. Why tie her up when she knows what to do and when? Then she won't leave alone, and no one will take her away from here against her will. Cautiously, stepping carefully up the mossy steps of the hut, I went to the front door and, taking hold of the heavy brass ring on the door handle, lifted it and let it go. There was a thud. No movement was heard outside the door. I peered through the window next to the front porch and saw a lamp burning in the room. So the mage was here, after all. I lifted the knob ring again and forcefully banged it on the door. 
The knocking was much louder now. The door opened, but there was no one behind it. Okay, the mage is playing with me or scaring me. But I'll go into his lair and find him anyway, I decided and stepped inside the hut. I looked around at the room I already knew, which was filled with test tubes and retorts. The image was of an alchemist as well. But I understood nothing about chemistry, much less alchemy. So, I looked at the complex arrangements of retorts, tubes, and bubbled and evaporated substances. It all seemed like it had nothing to do with my life here. But I needed the mage, and I would have to find him. At that moment, the image of the mage appeared in front of me as if created from smoke. He was flowing and swaying in front of me, his hands outstretched toward me but unable to touch me. But it was not scary, it was funny. I laughed, and that ghost disappeared. Voldemar came out from behind a screen in the room's corner and, satisfied with the effect he had produced, laughed. Well, there you are, my beautiful. His skinny hands peeked out from under the sleeves of his chemical-stained lab coat. The mage rubbed his hands together contentedly. I replied, looking at him slyly. And here I thought you were disappearing forever. Dissolved in one of these tubes, I pointed to one of them, the largest. Voldemar replied. Well, no, I'm not going anywhere from here. I belong here, in this hut. Castles don't suit me, there's too much fuss and too many curious people. Kind of like me, I added, looking around at his retorts. And I asked. And what are you doing here? Not just your ghost, I suppose. The mage replied. Someday, I'll tell you, my girl, what I'm doing here. But for now, let me guess why you are here and alone at this late hour. The mage said the word, alone, in such a tone that I understood perfectly well that he meant my obligation to appear everywhere only in the company of my powerful husband. I shook my head and hesitated to ask my question. The mage continued his speculation. I guess you fought with thunder. I nodded my head in relief. Yeah, I don't understand why he's, accepting his ex, girlfriend's attention marks. They said I smoothed out my feelings by choosing a more decent expression. I did not want to call Morgana my lover because, in my eyes, that would have directly shown the mage the real reason for my visit jealousy. The mage looked intently into my eyes, speaking. If you're honoring our pact, you shouldn't care who Thunder has socialized with before and who he may socialize with, even though you're technically his wife. And then something exploded in my chest. I realized I had to tell Thunder everything. All my despair came out in that phrase. I am not a formal wife. Thunder should respect me and not accept signs of attention from his mistress. It's humiliation and in front of everyone. I cried out, and tears spurted from my eyes. Voldemar took me by the shoulder and turned my face toward the lamp's light. He stared into my eyes for a while. Then he sighed, lowered his gaze, and said, My girl, Isabella. You've fallen in love with thunder, haven't you? What? I shrieked, bouncing backward away from him. Never. I will never love that monstrously insensitive freak. Never. But my voice and tears said otherwise. Yes, I loved Thunder. Yes, I loved this monster, this was such an unfeeling monster. And the mage knew it now. I had broken my pact with him, and now dire consequences awaited me. I can never go back to my world, 
never. And I'll never get thunder and his true love, never. His skinny hands peeked out from under the sleeves of his chemical-stained lab coat. The mage rubbed his hands together contentedly. I replied, looking at him slyly. And here I thought you were disappearing forever. Dissolved in one of these tubes, I pointed to one of them, the largest. Voldemar replied. Well, no, I'm not going anywhere from here. I belong here, in this hut. Castles don't suit me, there's too much fuss and too many curious people. Kind of like me, I added, looking around at his retorts. And I asked. And what are you doing here? Not just your ghost, I suppose. The mage replied. Someday, I'll tell you, my girl, what I'm doing here. But for now, let me guess why you are here and alone at this late hour. The mage said the word, alone, in such a tone that I understood perfectly well that he meant my obligation to appear everywhere only in the company of my powerful husband. I shook my head and hesitated to ask my question. The mage continued his speculation. I guess you fought with thunder. I nodded my head in relief. Yeah, I don't understand why he's accepting his ex-girlfriend's attention marks. They said I smoothed out my feelings by choosing a more decent expression. I did not want to call Morgana my lover because, in my eyes, that would have directly shown the mage the real reason for my visit jealousy. The mage looked intently into my eyes, speaking. If you're honoring our pact, you shouldn't care who Thunder has socialized with before and who he may socialize with, even though you're technically his wife. And then something exploded in my chest. I realized I had to tell Thunder everything. All my despair came out in that phrase. I am not a formal wife. Thunder should respect me and not accept signs of attention from his mistress. It's humiliation and in front of everyone. I cried out, and tears spurted from my eyes. Voldemar took me by the shoulder and turned my face toward the lamp's light. He stared into my eyes for a while. Then he sighed, lowered his gaze, and said, My girl, Isabella. You've fallen in love with thunder, haven't you? What? I shrieked, bouncing backward away from him. Never. I will never love that monstrously insensitive freak. Never. But my voice and tears said otherwise. Yes, I loved Thunder. Yes, I loved this monster, this was such an unfeeling monster. And the mage knew it now. I had broken my pact with him, and now dire consequences awaited me. I can never go back to my world, never. And I'll never get Thunder and his true love, never. Scene 27. Morgana's Embrace. I left the magician's hut the same way I had entered it. Mariana, spreading her dragon wings, carried me away and took me back to the castle. I led the horse into the stable and left him there, adding hay and water. I wanted to be far from Mariana. I was exhausted by this conversation with the mage. Besides, he still had not told me what was in store for me to break my pact with him. 
I crept to my bedroom, trying to tread softly on the cobblestone sidewalk of the square in front of the castle. Just as I opened her door, my legs just gave out. Thunder slept in my bed. Morgana nestled gently against his powerful, tanned, naked chest. These lovers could not have picked a better place than Thunder and its marital bed. Morgana slowly lifted her head and, without removing her hand from Thunder's chest, whispered. Well, hello there. I hope you don't have anything against sharing your husband's tenderness with me. I rushed over to them, intending to drag her by the hair out of my bed, tear her away from Thunder, and scream and scream and scream to wake him up and face him. I wanted to hear his explanation and excuses for his actions. Why else would he have confessed his love to me a brief time ago? Why? But before I could step toward them, I was stopped by a wall of force that prevented me from taking a step from where I was. I thought I was screaming at the top of my voice, trying to wake thunder, but no sound came out of my open mouth. Morgana used her magic, and I could do nothing about it. This mistress and schemer showed me that thunder still belonged to her and that I was no match for her. When I realized I could not fight Morgana's magic, I staggered backward out of the bedroom, horrified and indignant. I turned and walked away, my hands clinging to the hallway walls to avoid falling. My hopes that Thunder loved me, that he loved me, were shattered. The face of the sleeping Thunder was still before me. Yes, he was sleeping peacefully in the arms of that snake, Morgana and her face was a look of complete satisfaction at the way I was reacting to the scene. But I could not help myself now, I had to come to my senses to decide what to do next. I walked out of the castle, not knowing where to go. I was alone in the night's darkness. Suddenly, Morgana appeared in front of me again. I wanted to smash my fists into her face, but she held her hand out and stopped me again. The woman said, looking at me even with sympathy. There's no need for you to fight me. You saw that Thunder chose me after all. You can consider that you've already gotten a divorce from him. I'm surprised at how spunky he was with me just minutes ago just fire. Morgana enjoyed watching the look on my face, which changed from despair to hatred for her and Thunder. That was the reaction she had expected from me. Yes, I had not let her down. She continued in a perfectly honeyed voice. You may consider your marriage void. Thunder enjoyed me so much that now I will be the only one spending time in his bed, and of course, I will soon be his lawful wife. And that is why I will do you a favor, I will bring you home to your world. I did not know what to say to Morgana. That thunder had betrayed me, what I had thought was a newly born fondness for each other was killing me. I did not want to see his disfigured face anymore, I did not want to hear his voice anymore. I hated him. I wanted to go home now more than anything. But how do I know if that snake Morgana is setting a trap for me? Morgana again reading all the thoughts on my face, continued. Fear not, I will indeed bring you home. Thunder, though he loves me, as you have just seen, he will not allow you to die. And I certainly won't risk my future with him to take the life of a worthless person like you, a mere woman. I'm going to bring you back home. And I'll do it right now. Before I could open my mouth to contradict her, Morgana waved her hand, which held a scroll, rolled up in a tube and sealed with a red sealing wax. Sparks flashed around me, my feet lifted off the ground, and I was whirled in a whirlwind of sparks and multicolored stripes. I was disappearing in space, being carried upward and around some axis, I flew higher and higher in the whirl of sparks. Morgana remained somewhere down there 
far below. Her hand was still up, pointing at me with the scroll. I closed my eyes a moment later, unable to cope with the flood of blue light that seemed to pierce through me. My arms flew apart, and I floated in this swirl of light and sparks. Suddenly, everything went dark, and I realized I was lying on something hard. I opened my eyes. At first, I understood nothing. Then, as my eyes adjusted to the darkness, I saw a hallway, then the door of a transparent elevator, and a man I did not know, who came running toward me, exclaiming, Where did you come from here, Ella? I stared dumbfounded at this stranger and suddenly realized I knew his name. It was the lobby attendant, Matthew. I was lying upright on the floor in the foyer of my oceanfront home, the noise of which faintly filtered in through the glass panes of the room's huge windows. Scene 28. The Good Witch and the Great Magician. I got up from the floor, shook off my clothes, which were just carnivalesque in this super-modern interior, and said, Good evening, Matthew. I'm fine, I'm just back home. Accustomed to the extravagant antics of the occupants of this house, Matthew, trying to hide his surprise, replied, well, I'll help you up. And he did, giving me his hand. I got off the floor with his help and strolled to the elevator, glancing around the lobby of my house as I went. Nothing had changed here. And it felt like I had been in that world forever, and I was never returning. I pressed the elevator button, and its transparent doors opened silently in front of me, Something reminded me that this elevator had brought me to Thunder's world. But Morgana had not brought me back to the elevator but to the seat next to it. I did not know whether that meant something in the magic, but something here had not happened quite right. But I was home. And I remembered and understood everything now, my past and my present. If only I knew the future but that would be too much for my frayed nerves. I stepped out of the elevator and tiptoed to my apartment door. There was the sound of a key turning softly in the keyhole, and my apartment door opened. Grandma Lily stood in front of me. And then my nerves broke out, and I fell into her arms, sobbing with relief and happiness at seeing her, someone so dear to me here, in her place, in a world I knew well. Everything in that world was just a dream. Now I remember what dreams I had had before I was transported to the Fey world. With a gentle hug around my waist, Grandma Lily led me into the living room, and my favorite dogs, Maddie and Tommy, rushed toward me. The tiny balls of fluff bounced around me, trying to get me to pat each of them on their thick fur. Their joyful barking was so loud that I had to take them both in my arms a. Andy sit with them on the living room couch for them to calm down a bit. My grandmother was in the kitchen, bringing me hot cocoa. Its aroma, mixed with cinnamon and vanilla, brought me back to my childhood, and I felt exhausted and safe. I drank my cocoa, sat on the living room couch again, lifted the dogs onto it, and lay down. Almost asleep, I felt my grandmother carefully cover me with a warm blanket and, stroking my shoulder, kiss me gently on the forehead. After a moment, everything fell into darkness, and the world disappeared. I was asleep. I woke up with a clear head. I thought everything that happened to me was just a strange and sometimes scary dream. 
I got up from the couch, let the dogs down, and went to the bathroom to clean myself up. The aroma of scrambled eggs and coffee wafted from the kitchen. It turned out that I had slept through the night, and now Grandma Lily was making us breakfast in the morning. When we had eaten, Grandma pushed her glasses down on her nose, looked at me carefully, and said in a heartfelt voice, Well, my dear, now tell me, how did you get here? I looked at her in surprise. How so? She talks to me like that, like she knows all about my adventures. But that can't be. My grandmother looked at me a little mockingly but with understanding. Ella, I know you were in another, the Fey world. My jaw dropped, and I stared at her with my mouth open, not understanding how this was possible. Grandmother continued. I'll explain it all to you someday, not now. There's no time for that now. Just accept what I know about the Fey world. Now tell me everything that happened to you there. You remember everything, don't you? Tell me every detail of how you came back to this world. I noticed my grandmother did not say, home. She called my home and my reality simply, this world. Well, with her life experience, she must be used to it, but everything that happened to me seemed like a nightmare. There were moments in it that warmed my soul, even now, when I hated thunder with all my soul. I remembered his kisses, his hands, his gentleness. Everything in me swirled with many feelings I could not handle, and I cried again. Grandma sat across from me and looked at me sympathetically. Yes, my dear girl, this is how growing up happens, through new experiences and worries. But you'll get through this, I assure you of that, she said, pouring coffee into my cup. I sipped my coffee and, wiping away my tears, answered her in a nasal voice. Yes, maybe it's easy for you to say that from the height of your life experience. But for me, it's a torment to see someone who told me he loved me to end up in bed with his former lover. As soon as that was to my grandmother, I felt better. I dumped my pain on her, I waited for her sympathy and words of comfort. But there were none. My grandmother looked carefully into my eyes and asked. Do you believe what you saw? Are you sure Thunder doesn't love you? Why did you believe Morgana? After all, you know she hates you and would do anything to get Thunder back into her arms and more. Can you believe that a woman like her even loves him? Those words just crushed me. How is my grandmother accusing me of giving up and running away from hardship by taking Morgana's offer? But I wanted to get home all the time, and this was the perfect opportunity to fulfill my plan. Grandma realized she had hurt my feelings too much and said conciliatingly. Nothing, nothing, everything will work out, Ella. We have to find Voldemar and figure out what can be done with him. I stared at Grandma Lily in surprise. Find Voldemar. Do, what? She continued firmly, ignoring my incoherent mumbling. Find out what Thunder has to say for himself. I don't trust Morgana or you, but you don't want to admit it to yourself. So Voldemar and I will help you go back to find out whether Thunder loves you or Morgana. While I was sitting there trying to understand everything my grandmother had told me, the intercom buzzer rang. Grandma Lily came to the door of the apartment, pressed the intercom button, and asked. Who's there? Our doorman, Matthew, answered the intercom. You have a visitor. He said his name was Mr. Voldemar. I can't tell you anything more about him. Then Matthew added. Yeah, he was here a while ago and was talking to Ella. Matthew was attentive to his work and remembered everyone who came to our home. 
Voldemar showed up at my apartment a few minutes later. Grandma Lily opened the door for him. The magician bowed gallantly to Grandma Lily and, chasing away the barking dogs with a dragon-shaped stick, entered the apartment. My grandmother led him into the living room, where I was sitting on my favorite couch. Voldemar just nodded instead of greeting me and sat down at the table. He was silent, waiting for Grandma Lily to brew and bring us coffee and pastries. I was quiet, too. Finally, Grandma Lily brought us freshly brewed coffee, and we drank it, praising her hospitality and pastries slightly exaggeratedly. My patience broke, and I sat across from Voldemar, resting my elbows on the table and my chin on my hands, supporting my head so that my gaze was directed only into Voldemar's eyes. The mage noticed my slightly unconventional behavior, giving away my expectation of explaining everything that had happened to me, but he did not show it. Finally, he and my grandmother finished exchanging pleasantries about the taste of the coffee. The mage turned to me and said, Well then, my dear Ella, tell it like it was. What did you see there in the castle that you took the opportunity offered to escape from the Fey world? He told me I had to spend my entire life in that fey world. If Thunder loved me, perhaps I might have considered it. But now, after what I saw in my bedroom of the castle, Thunder sleeping peacefully in Morgana's arms, after that, I never want to go back to that world again. I never want to see Thunder again. I thought. Voldemar looked me straight in the eye and seemed to read my mind. Or, he was reading my mind, the way he said it. Something happened between you and Thunder. What? I, realizing that I would have to reveal the truth to him, replied in a voice muffled by barely suppressed sobs. Thunder, they were in bed with Morgana when I returned to the castle. Then Morgana offered to take me back to my old world. And here I am. The mage shook his head understandingly. I understand you, my girl, I do. But Morgana would rather part with her life than do anything good for you. I'm afraid she had good reason to get you out of the way, one way or another. I raised my head indignantly, answering him in a ringing voice. No one got me out of the way. It was my choice. To which the mage, shaking his head lamentably, replied. My dear, I understand everything, but... I interrupted him. I broke our pact, anyway. Thunder, he and I talked about love, and this, you said it was forbidden. The mage stared at me in surprise. Who told you it was forbidden? Who? I just wanted you to help Thunder play that part of his wife in front of everyone. And I tearfully kept repeating and repeating. But what is the reason for fulfilling such a treaty? What is the reason? Tell me that at last. I stared absently at Voldemar, waiting for his answer. He fidgeted a little in his chair, getting comfortable, and began his story. I think it's time for you to know why your husband needs marriage. And why is your marriage the way you see it, he said, folding his hands in front of him on the table and interlocking the fingers of his hands. Voldemar continued. The high fay in the world where Thunder lives have a law that their men can only marry before leaving this world. My face seemed to stretch with surprise and a terrible guess. I opened my mouth, not knowing what to say, and closed it in confusion. Fey women who pass to the status of wives of the High Fey also become virtually immortal, but they cannot have children. Therefore, they act only as girlfriends, but not as wives. Voldemar looked at me, I thought, even with some satisfaction. Despite the tragedy of the situation, he was enjoying the effect of his words. 
Yes, my dear, yes. Male high fae are practically immortal, unlike their subjects, mere fae. The high fae's possess powerful magic. Death catches up with them. You realize you can't be immortal and have countless children with different women. After all, every normal woman wants to have a child, and more than one. And it works the same way in the fey world. Voldemar took a deep breath and continued. Imagine that the entire balance of this world would be disrupted if the high fey were born uncontrollably. They would have to fight each other actively for a place to live, upsetting the world order. And then, how many high fey can each kingdom sustain? 1. What if each kingdom simultaneously has three, five, or more supreme fey? They would just kill each other. Or most of them will be banished from their home kingdom and wander around other kingdoms, challenging the next high fey in each of them to fight. Then, the high fey will have no time to rule their kingdoms, and their subjects will no longer obey them. Ultimately, an uncontrolled number of supreme fey would lead to chaos and infighting. That is why this law was established, and everyone followed it. Voldemar noticed I needed to listen to him. I was drawn to my feelings, flaring like a wind-blown forest fire. Voldemar emphasized the word, practical, when he spoke of the immortality of the high fays. But what did that mean? Would thunder die soon? My insides clenched as if someone had grabbed my heart with a cold hand and squeezed it as hard as possible. It was fear, fear for thunder's life. How does he know? I turned to the mage, waking from my musings. How does he know his days are numbered? Voldemar turned his whole body toward me, leaned toward me, and whispered into my ear. He knows. There was a prediction, and they always come true. Centuries ago, it was predicted by the Dark Oracle that Thunder would die this season by the end of this summer. You know this fey world has only two seasons, summer and winter, right? No, I don't. But what does it matter if thunder dies? We prevent that from happening. I exclaimed. The mage continued his story, although I was almost sick. Yes, death finds them, after all. It happens when our higher powers decide that one of the high fey must end his life's journey. Only under that condition can he marry and have children. I found my voice again. Get married. Have children. But you told me, and Thunder confirmed it in our conversations, that this marriage is just a sham marriage, and while he would need heirs in principle, there will be none of that between you and me. What children could we be talking about? Voldemar replied, looking at me with a gentle smirk. Thunder took pity on you. He decided that an innocent creature like you, brought to us from a world unknown to him, should not suffer for following the traditions of his kind. He took pity on you. Your husband-to-be did not even want to be just like you. He did not want to force you into anything that would lead to children. That's why he arranged with me to present his marriage so that those around him would think it was real, but you would be free of any obligation to him. He decided that when his death hour came, you should not be there to suffer because your beloved man had left you. You should return to your world. Thunder knew it was I who brought you here. No fey woman would agree to such a sham marriage, as it would be a huge accomplishment for each of them, for themselves, but even more so for their children, who would also get the chance to become practically immortal and rule in this kingdom. As you have realized, Thunder had remarkable success with the women of the Fae, and each of them would like to be his wife. That's why he chose you, who came to our world from outside. You didn't recognize his worth. You did not want to be there and rule his world. You had pure thoughts and were sincere toward him. 
The mage shook his head contritely and continued. Unfortunately, I see you fell for the love fishing rod, and you have developed feelings for thunder. Believe me, girl, you need to break up with him. You have no future with him. It's a good thing Morgana had you wrapped around her finger and out of her way. After all, she must have discovered your secret, I don't know how, but it's a fact. Otherwise, why would she not kill you a second time but force you to become disillusioned with Thunder? Thunder will soon be her husband, once he goes through the rites of divorce from you, as she could not stand living with him. My senses flared up like fire flying over a volcano. I grabbed the mage by the sleeve of his jacket and pulled him toward the exit, screaming in his face. So, what are we waiting for? Hurry, bring me back. I need to see Thunder and explain myself to him. I love him. The mage did not give in to my impulse and answered quietly, looking into my eyes questioningly. But even if you return to him, Thunder will still die. And once you're alone, his subjects will tear you apart if they discover that your marriage was a sham and that you won't have a child for their kingdom, an heir to Thunder. This means that another supreme fay will take over their kingdom. This will bring suffering to many of Thunder's subjects and his opponent, the High Fay. I stopped and stared dumbfounded at Voldemar. A storm of feelings and memories of how Thunder had spoken to me, what he had done, how he had looked at me. Has Thunder been interested in me the whole time he's acted so since I met him? I thought no man in the world was more unpleasant than him, I thought, staring into the void, past the wizard. The thought flashed through my mind that perhaps I had become indifferent to Thunder much sooner than I realized. Everything in his behavior said that Thunder was trying to protect me from mistakes and the terrible consequences of our fake marriage. I had to deal with this mountain of terror that pressed down on my heart like a rock crashing into a mountain stream and blocking its course. But what happens when a landslide blocks the bed of a humble mountain stream? The stream turns into an uncontrollable storm of water, a mudslide, a mixture of soil, rocks, and water. This mass rushes into the valley, sweeping away everything in its path, huge layers of earth from the mountainsides, boulders, trees, and houses. The mud flow is practically uncontrollable and so formidable that it is feared much more than snow avalanches. It is almost impossible for animals and humans to escape a mud flow alive. That was the flood of feelings building up in my soul. I had to get Thunder to confess what the mage had just revealed. I wanted to hear it all from Thunder himself and right away. I stopped, turned to the mage, and said in a completely calm and decisive manner, Voldemar, bring me back. I must see Thunder. I will not let him die. And if I can't prevent it, I will be by his side in his final hours, no matter what comes my way afterward. Bring me back, and at once. The mage was silent, and my heart sank, fearing losing my only opportunity to see Thunder again. I need to fix everything I left undone out there and see Thunder one last time. Just once to see him and ask for his forgiveness, not how I did it, just run away, leaving him alone to face his terrible fate. The mage was still silent. He looked at me as if calculating every move in my decision to return to their world, to Etheris. Finally, Voldemar broke the silence. I can see that you've decided for real, seriously. I can see it in your eyes. I can feel it in the beating of your heart. But before I decide, you and I must get information from the fortune teller. What, from a fortune teller? I interrogated him, not expecting such a turn of events. What can some fortune tell me about my fate? Fortune-telling is all nonsense. I was torn with conflicting feelings. 
Why is this old man dragging me to some fortune teller? I knew enough that there was a world of fairy and magic outside my world, but it was different. This was fortune telling. There was a reason, they say, when unsure of the outcome, that it would be coffee grounds fortune telling, true and false in equal measure. Voldemar pulled me with the arm of my sweater. Come, come, we must not delay. He exclaimed. What about Grandma? I did not have time to finish saying I wanted to say goodbye to her before the mage grabbed my hand tighter and led me to the elevator without answering, then led me outside from my entryway and, with a wave of his hand, stopped a yellow cab. We got into the car and drove to the address the magician had given us. The talk was strangely familiar, but I could not hear Voldemar's words to the cab driver. I sat in the cab's back seat, and I thought about thunder. He needed me, but I left him. What a fool I am. Voldemar sat in front, next to the driver, and showed him the best way to get through the traffic. Finally, we reached the neighborhood where Voldemar wanted to go. The car stopped, Voldemar paid for the ride, and we went outside. Is this here? I asked. Certainly not here, the mage replied seriously and strode toward this neighborhood I was familiar with. My grandmother lived that way. But it meant nothing now. But we kept walking and walking and walking toward my grandma's house. I had some suspicion of another surprise, making me feel a tickle inside, like butterflies fluttering in my stomach. The magician came to the back door of my grandmother's house. Well, here we are. I stood with my mouth open, staring at him and the door of the house so dear to me. They came. There was no way I wanted to realize reality. Yes, we're here. The magician replied once more and determinately pressed the button of the antique front doorbell of my grandmother's house. The door opened, and Grandma Lily herself appeared before us. Her face expressed no surprise, only joy at the sight of such guests. Hello. I've been expecting you, she said in her melodious voice of a born opera singer. Voldemar gave me a fatherly pat on the shoulder, adding. Look, Lily, your granddaughter still can't believe her eyes. Grandma came over to me and hugged me tightly. Ella, don't be afraid of anything now. I'll tell you what lies ahead, she whispered. My grandmother led us into her living room, where every object was familiar to me from my earliest childhood. On the floor was an ancient Chinese vase of some old dynasty, near which my childhood friends and I could not play. And here on the wall was a painting of the ruins of some castle or fortress. Around the ruins of this castle, I always tried to see something else, what was the time when this castle flourished, and who lived there. But I could understand nothing then, and my grandmother would guffaw at my questions and say that it was not people who lived there but Fay and all these are just fairy tales. And then I had a lightning flash in my head. Why, it's Thunder Castle. Only in a state, I could not imagine it in. What does that mean? What does it all mean? I said aloud, confused, waiting for Grandma Lily's answer. My grandmother came to me, frozen before the painting, and put her arm around my shoulder. She looked at me with love and sympathy. Ella, my dear. Everything in this life is for a reason, and everyone has a destiny. Someday, I'll tell you why this painting is here and how it came to me. But for now, believe me, we have no moment to lose if you want to see thunder again. I turned to Voldemar and said in my old, determined tone. Well then, let's do what you wanted to do. 
I don't think there's anything else you can impress me with. But I was wrong. Oh, how wrong I was. Scene 29. A fortune telling on a coffee grounds. Grandma Lily waited quietly on the sidelines while Voldemar and I explained ourselves. She did not interfere, though her face showed impatience. I turned to her and asked. Grandma, so what? Will you tell my fortune? She nodded and gestured for me and the magician to sit at the dining room table. Her favorite tablecloth, hand embroidered with roses, was on the table as usual. Grandma brought three coffee cups and poured thickly brewed coffee with sediment. She served them to us, putting no other food on the table. We drank this coffee without milk, and Grandma said, well, it's time to see what's in store for you, my dear. Then she added. Drink the coffee down to the bottom and whatever sediment remains on its bottom without shaking it. Then gently turn the cup to the away side and leave it tipped on a saucer for a few minutes. I obediently did as she asked. A thin trickle of coffee dripped from under the cup, forming a semicircle on the saucer. I don't believe in fortune telling. If Grandma Lily is an experienced fortune teller, something I never suspected, what's in store for me? My grandmother certainly won't hide anything from me. I thought. Still, my heart sank with anticipation of the future, waiting for her prediction based on the coffee grounds from the coffee I drank. My mind was spinning with the almost laughable thought that the words, guessing on coffee grounds, were usually applied in my life as an analogy of empty hopes. The minutes of languid waiting I dragged on. I did not dare to break the silence at the table. Voldemar was also silent, leaning on the table and staring at my cup as if he had already seen what Grandma Lily would tell us about my future. Grandma finally reached out for my cup and, carefully turning it over to its normal position again, gave me a testing look. Now look at the coffee grounds track on the wall of the cup. What do you see there? At first, I did not realize what there was to see. The coffee grounds were just coffee grounds, nothing special. Then, I suddenly saw a road, a river, or a vast waterfall. I also noticed a lot of lines, like human figures, scattered here and there in the field and many other images that I could not understand. Grandma took the cup from my hands and looked at something I could not explain. Her face first darkened, then brightened, and then became impenetrable again. She furrowed her brow and said, Voldemar, you need to bring Ella back to the Aetheris and it would be best if you did it as soon as possible. She will have a tough time, but my granddaughter can handle it. I can see her future but cannot tell you about it. It is veiled in mystery until Ella passes the first test. But you, Ella, can now see something of your future on this table. Grandma quickly removed my cup from the table and, with a sudden movement, pulled the tablecloth off the dining room tabletop. And then I took a fresh look at the massive, Chippendale-style dining table. Before, I had thought that only the legs, which should have been called columns because they were so huge, were decorated with elaborate carvings. Now that all my senses were heightened, I saw it differently. 
Now that the table was not covered with a tablecloth, I noticed that the polished black surface of its tabletop was covered with patterns carved into the surface of the wood. The patterns depicted a battle with dragons in the valley between the mountains. There were many marvelous creatures, winged dragons spewing from open mouths and nostrils, swimming crocodile-headed monsters, and giant snakes crawling on the ground. The fays were fighting with them. How did I know they were fay? Because all the men were dressed like thunder. And they all had pointy ears the kind I had seen on the face in their world. Looking more closely at this picture, I found a woman among the fighting fay. Dressed in men's hunting clothes, this young woman held a dagger with an unusually curved hilt and a guard in front of the blade. The woman's waist was tightened by a belt from which the dagger's sheath hung. A hood concealed the warrior's face. Suddenly, a sense of deja vu struck me. Though I could not see the woman's facial features, I suddenly realized that the painting, carved into the top of a table my grandmother said was at least a couple hundred years old, was of me. I was there, in Etheris, someone in the past. But now it was my future. I touched my carved image and ran my palm over it. It was as if I could feel the tension of that little figure and its desire to protect someone. But who was I watching? I looked even more closely at the whole picture and suddenly realized that there was thunder fighting right next to me. He was alive there, and he was directly next to me. But this had never happened to me before. I had never been in a battle with monsters. The one time I had seen a battle with them was when Thunder protected me from a terrible dungeon serpent. The second time was when he fought vampires. I had no dagger in both cases and could not fight alongside Thunder. I jumped up from the table, raked Voldemar by the sleeve of his jacket, and exclaimed. You can't delay a moment. Send me back to Thunder. I choose his world and need to see my husband again and tell him how much I love him. The magician looked at me, shook his head contritely, and said. My girl, you don't know what awaits you there. But now that divination has shown you that the road to the waterfall awaits you, and now that you have seen this carving on the tabletop and are not frightened by its meaning, I will return you to the thunder, whatever awaits you there. Scene 30. Awakening. This time, Voldemar did not need an elevator. He did not even need a magic wand. He waved his hand, swirled his palm over my head twice as if starting a whirlpool, and stepped away from me. I felt the familiar sensation of everything spinning around me. I surrendered to the flow of feelings this time and was carried along toward my destiny. After a couple more moments, I stopped seeing anything around me and stopped hearing. I was flying, arms out to the sides and eyes closed, in a swirl of light or I thought it was light. It was some energy flow, and I was part of it. I came to my senses in the familiar bedroom of Castle Thunder. I knew it was the same place I had been when Voldemort had first brought me from my world to the Fey world. But now I just knew it, for everything around me was plunged into darkness. I got up from my bed and walked over to the bedroom window that led to the castle square. I looked out and looked down. Down there, there was a seemingly endless stream of Fey carrying torches. Their heads were covered with hoods. The crowd of Fey was marching toward the temple where Thunder and I were to be crowned. The temple doors opened, and a yellow light streamed into the night square from the temple hall. The Fey made their way inside. 
An acute sense of loss pierced me. I only knew some of the Fey rituals, but this one. It evoked a sense of loss. Perhaps it could be a ritual related to the death of someone of the High Fey. I thought. They would not be without their leader at such a ceremony. This is his kingdom. Then I will find thunder there. I went back to bed and fumbled in the darkness for a cloak. It had a hood just like the others in the procession down the square. No one will recognize me like this, I decided. Throwing on my cloak and covering my face with my hood, I ran out into the castle corridor. When I opened the inconspicuous door of the castle, which the servants usually used, I could slip out into the square and join the crowd of Fay who kept coming and going toward the temple. Squeezed from all sides, I was almost pushed into the temple by the crowd, and I could no longer move forward. I stopped with my feet on the floor, struggling against the force of the crowd struggling to flow around me. The yellow light of the torches in the night's darkness and of this temple made the faces of the Fae, visible from beneath the hoods of their cloaks, look like masks. Fae pushed at me from all sides, but I stayed in the middle of the center aisle of the temple and did not move. I stared at the altar where, seemingly so recently, Voldemar had wedded Thunder and me. I had so little time with Thunder that I had no time to question him about anything about the life of his people. I had only tried to escape from his world and had no interest in anything. I'm so sorry about that. But now I won't waste another minute. Thunder and I will have plenty of time to talk because that's what I came back here for, I thought. Suddenly, there was a low roar as if some colossal animals were issuing a call to battle. But it was the sound made by the massive horn of some creature. One end of this horn, three meters long, was lying on the temple floor, and it looked like the screw horn of a giant bull. At the other end of this horn, a fay was blowing and extracting sounds from his instrument that were unusually low, vibrating and penetrating the very essence of my body. The crowd parted, and I found myself in the center of the temple aisle leading to the altar. I was standing there alone and did not know what was happening. Several fays came out onto the platform beside the altar. They threw back the hoods of their cloaks, and I saw that among them was the handsome Amos, Thunder's friend and associate. He looked around the hall and proclaimed loudly, clearly satisfied with what he had seen, raising both hands above the crowd. Peace be with you, my subjects. From this moment on, Morgana, who will soon give you an heir to the throne, is your lord. My feet seemed to be stuck to the floor of the temple. I looked at Amos, and suddenly, the meaning of his words came to me, she is their mistress, so Thunder is, her husband. But where is Thunder? This is his kingdom. My heart froze and dropped as if it had fallen into an abyss. Panic and despair enveloped me in their iron embrace. Thunder. Where is he? He's the only one who can explain everything to me, I thought, stretching my arms out in front of me as if trying to grab the image of my lover out of the darkness and recreate him right there in front of me. The hood fell over my shoulders, making my face visible to everyone. A ring of fey formed around me. They stared at me. There was a gasp and a shout of anger through the crowd. How? Is she here? How dare she? I heard, but I did not care. The thought alone tore at my heart. Where's Thunder? What's wrong with him? I'm such an idiot. Am I too late to help him, after all? And then Morgana appeared in front of me. She was dressed in a long tunic dress that encased her still small but visible belly, that of a woman expecting a child. 
She walked smoothly toward me, folding her hands over her stomach in the timeless feminine gesture emphasizing its roundness. Morgana stared blankly at me as she uttered her tirade. There you are back. But it's getting late. But you can see thunder, just once, one last time. I looked at Morgana hatefully, the tears in my eyes making her image ugly. But I did not cry. They just swallowed convulsively and answered. Where is he? What's wrong with him? Morgana led her hand majestically away from the altar, saying. There he is, there. Look. I glanced in the direction she was pointing. A sarcophagus stood in front of the altar, now well lit by torches. It was ornately carved and appeared to be made of marble and painted. On its massive lid was a bar-relief depiction of some enormous figure. My heart froze. I could not breathe in or out. The lid of the sarcophagus featured a bar-relief depicting. Thunder. The fay around me fell utterly silent. I did not want to listen to Morgana anymore, and I ignored the look on her face. I did not care whether she thought she was triumphant or grieving. I was only interested in why they had a sarcophagus ready for Thunder. I took a few steps toward Thunder's sarcophagus as if pulling the puddle of metal that bound my legs from the floor. When I got near the sarcophagus, I was confronted with a sight that horrified me. Indeed, a full-length depiction of thunder was on the stone bar leaf of the sarcophagus lid. His face was calm, and, it was free of the scars that had disfigured my lover. Only now, when I could no longer see thunder alive, did I see him as beautiful. Oh, God, I'm too late. I was too late to tell him how much I loved him. I was too late to hug and cuddle with him and expressing my feelings. I was too late to stroke his face and kiss his eyes and lips. I can no longer feel his heart beating when he touches me. I've lost my love. I'm too late. My thoughts raced with the speed of an avalanche, but my body was motionless. My feet were stuck to the cold stone floor of the temple. I stood there, hesitant to touch the bar leaf of thunder. No, it's not him. No, it can't be. My whole being denied the possibility of my beloved's death. The thought that I handled his death stung like a fire. Did he really, really sacrifice his life to give me my freedom? I thought, looking at his sarcophagus. Suddenly, Thunder's face came to life, his lips trembled, his eyelids twitched a little to open his eyes, and the fingers on his arms, the hands of which were crossed on the chest of the bar leaf, moved a little. The giant's mighty chest seemed to rise, sighing. But tears of unfulfilled hope sputtered from my eyes. Of course, the flames of the torches fancifully changed the expression of the face on the bar leaf. The reflections of the torch's light gave the appearance of movement to the image of the mighty fey warrior resting here beneath this stone slab. And then a thought struck me. But why is he here, in the temple? Did not Voldemar tell me that the high fey should be buried among the forests and fields so that nature would accept their remains and allow them to be reborn someday as another fey? Why were Thunder's remains locked up here in the temple, as knights and kings did in the Middle Ages in my world? Fays have a quite different idea of eternity, they need to be one with nature, to dissolve into it. I turned around and finally looked at the crowd of fey. Their faces expressed sorrow and sympathy. Only now did I see that Thunder's subjects were grieving his death. Yes, the Fays were mortal. Those who say they are eternal are wrong. Nothing is endless in this world, and the passing of my beloved proved it. But what does death mean to a loving heart? 
Eternity. Eternity, for me now, was an opportunity to connect with thunder. But not as desperate souls would think of it, no. I would not leave my life before its natural end date. No. I was to see thunder, his body, his machines, and live with that. His untimely passing from life is my fault, and I must see him, the way even his body, already disfigured by death. I lifted my hands, which weighed what seemed like a pound each, and placed them on the stone slab of the bar relief. An icy cold seeped into my palms, flowing and freezing my blood, arms, and heart. The cold seized me, seeping into every cell of my body. But I did not give up. Remembering how I had dealt with the swamp scum Morgana had unleashed on me, I imagined the red lotus fire burning above me again and felt its heat flowing down my body again, chasing away that chill of death. I strained all my strength and tried to move the lid of the sarcophagus to no avail. The slab seemed to pull me into itself, into the world of the dead. I pressed my feet once more against the stones of the floor and my whole body against the sarcophagus lid. Suddenly, something rustled, dust sprinkled from beneath the stone slab of the sarcophagus, and finally, the lid slid open. My strength left me when I realized I had moved the sarcophagus lid out of place. I was terrified of what awaited me when I saw the remains of Thunder's body. After all, it had been a long time, judging because Morgana was already expecting a child. Here in the Fey world, time flows at its rhythm. And the moment I could return was much later than when I left their world when I gave in to Morgana's offer. But if I had not returned to myself, I may never have realized that I loved Thunder. I would not have learned that I loved him so much that I would go back to his world of horrible creatures and laws I did not understand, to his world of magic and rituals I did not know. I could not take my eyes off the gap between the lid and the body of the sarcophagus. It was just darkness. I could see nothing through that narrow slit. I decided and pushed the lid off the sarcophagus with a single motion. The stone slab crashed to the temple floor on the opposite side of the sarcophagus, shattering into many small pieces. The stone dust rose into the air and glowed all shades of gray, yellow, and maroon in the dancing torchlight. Coughing, I turned away, brushing the dust from my face with the sleeve of my cloak. I was almost nauseous from the anticipation of the horrible picture. My stomach twisted, and it felt like it was rising to my throat and squeezing it. I had seen in movies what the body of a creature that had died quite some time ago might look like, and my imagination painted a horrible picture. The dust settled along with the guttural cries of the fae, who hesitated to approach either me or the sarcophagus. Morgana and Amos also stood back, amazed at what I had done. No one moved. I realized no one was opposing what I wanted to do. And I wanted to see Thunder, his body. I had to ensure that what was preserved in that sarcophagus was Thunder's remains, which gave me the strength to act. I looked into the sarcophagus. Thunder's body lay in a sarcophagus, dressed in the most luxurious robes of the High Fae. His favorite sword was strapped to his belt. And in the sarcophagus was a dagger, the same dagger that Thunder had given me. My hands shook as I touched his face. Thunder's face was as cold and complex as the marble of a sarcophagus. There was no sign of decomposition. My lover seemed to sleep a righteous sleep after some heavy battle. Death had spread my lover's features, and his calm face was so beautiful. The scars on the mutilated half of Thunder's face were almost invisible. Suddenly, I shuddered. The dancing torchlight brought my lover's face to life again, and I thought I saw his eyelids flutter open. 
His thick black eyelashes seemed as long as a girl's now, I had not noticed that when he was beside me, alive. I felt like his lips were trying to tell me something but could not. But maybe I saw in his face what I wanted to say to him. I love you, I would do anything for you. Please wake up and live. I sobbed and cradled Thunder's head with both hands. I did not care that it was a dead body. I did not care that he could feel nothing. I only needed to express my feelings to him one time, one last time, and for real. Without taking my hands off his face, I leaned over and touched my lips first to Thunder's forehead. Then, looking close and close at his face with its long, long black lashes, proud nose, and luscious lips, I touched his lips with mine. My lover's lips were as cold as the stone of his final shelter, the sarcophagus. Tears kept rolling down my cheeks and dripping onto Thunder's face. I did not want to cry in front of all these fays, I did not want to show anyone my weakness. But my feelings were more robust than I expected. I cried as I kissed the icy lips of my lover, who had sacrificed his life for me to return to my world. I did not realize what happened to me the moment my lips touched Thunder's icy lips. A river of heat flowed from my heart, igniting my body. It felt like a torrent of red-hot lava flowing through me, sweeping away all obstacles, my fears, my old, empty hopes, and my future. The fire flowed from my heart and poured through my lips into Thunder's body. Suddenly, I felt Thunder's face warm and pink. Once again, I felt his eyelids trying to flutter open. But this time, it was not a trick of the light. They were beating, and a tear rolled down from the corner of one of his eyes. Thunder's cheeks turned pink, and his lips returned to their former color. Thunder's chest heaved in a shaky sigh, and he opened his eyes. They were his eyes, the purple ones I remembered. Thunder was looking straight at me, his face expressionless. His right hand showed from the sarcophagus. Gripping the edge of his sarcophagus, Thunder pulled himself up sharply and sat down in that damned box where Morgana had wanted to hide him from life, from his happiness and love. A sigh rippled through the Fae crowd, first of horror, then of admiration. Fae's rushed toward the sarcophagus, helping Thunder out of that cursed box of death. I stood aside, pushed farther away from my beloved by the Fae crowd. I could not move or cry or scream with happiness. I had no more strength for that. I was happy that Thunder could return to this world, and perhaps now I should leave it. He would never forgive me for leaving him, choosing my world then so familiar to me. I turned and, stumbling over the extinguished torches on the stone floor of the temple, strolled into the darkness of the temple, trying to get out. I put on my hood and was indistinguishable in the crowd of cheering Fay blocking Thunder's path. I only saw Thunder looking in my direction when I turned around. But his face was still as impassive as if he were looking at something that meant nothing to him. When I left the temple, I walked down the empty, narrow castle street to the stables, to my Mariana. I did not know where else I should go alone, or at least among beings who did not hate me as much for my betrayal as that Fay and Thunder did. Scene 31 Flames of Love As I approached the stable, I smelled the familiar odor of horses. The hay smelled so cozy that I could not stand it any longer, and I rushed inside and called out to Mariana. The horse immediately responded to my call and tapped his hoof on his stall door. 
I ran down the stable aisle to Mariana's stall and, recognizing in the darkness the silhouette of her head poking out of the doorway of her stall, I hugged the horse's neck. All my misery finally came out. I cried myself to tears, regretting what I had done before. My past hopes were inherently wrong. I should have gotten to know my husband better, not run away from him. I had brought him so much grief that he would never look in my direction. Never. The horse stood perfectly still, with an occasional flick of his ears and a snort. His peaceful breathing soothed me, but my tears kept flowing. I was finally alone with my feelings and regrets. And Mariana was the best partner for having someone to sympathize with me but without a word of comfort or condemnation. Suddenly, a rustle of hay was on the stable floor behind me. I froze, trying to guess who might be here at this hour. A faint air movement brought a familiar scent to me, fresh, reminiscent of pine needles in the damp air of a pine grove, mixed with the tart smell of dressed leather. I turned around, letting go of Mariana's neck. Thunder was standing in front of me. I stepped aside, instinctively extending my arm to defend myself from someone's attack. Thunder uttered in his low, husky voice. Are you still afraid of me, my Isabella? I was silent. My hands were no longer obeying me and sank helplessly along my body. I stared at Thunder, trying to understand his expression. It was so dark in the stable that I could see nothing. I could only smell his scent, hear his voice, and see his silhouette in the faint light from the stable gate. Thunder stepped toward me, and I realized his hand was resting on my shoulder, light and gentle as usual. I wrapped one arm around his neck, and with the other, I stroked the scarred face the face of the man I loved, my high fay and my husband. Thunder brought me to the castle and, meeting no one in his way, made his way to my bedroom and mine. As he approached her door, he opened the heavy door with the push of his foot and entered the room so familiar to me, where I had spent so much time looking for ways to leave him and his world. I bitterly regretted my past delusions. But I did not need to think about them now. All I had to think about was that my man laid me gently on the bed and began removing my clothes after removing my sword and dagger belt. I lay on the bed under its gorgeous canopy and looked at my lover. His body was as beautiful as it had been when he had left me alone on my first wedding night with him. But now, I did not see his scars. I only saw the handsome man who desired me, and I could feel the passion rising in me, filling my heart with the heat of love. I knew now was the one true wedding night when both spouses could express their adoration for each other, and it would not require words. It would be passion and nothing more. All the words would come later when the strength to talk would return. Afterward, we lay next to each other for a long time, embraced, and I realized that these people who love each other strive to bring absolute pleasure to each other. But this is only one form of true love. The main thing in love is the desire to make the loved one feel good. And I realized that besides being ready to sacrifice myself for my beloved, I could also be a worthy beloved of this extraordinary man, my God, the High Lord of Etheris.
Scene 32. Epilogue. The following day, Thunder and I woke up late. No one had disturbed us, and we lay in bed, completely relaxed and tired from lovemaking. It was not until noon that Thunder emerged from our bedroom and, wearing only pants and a shirt unbuttoned across his chest, shouted angrily into the castle hallway. Hey, you, over there. Bring us food and drink and lots of it. I intend to spend a lot more time alone with my wife. In half an hour, we had everything in our room, the finest viands of the fay, the drinks that stirred the blood and all the sensations of the tongue, the mint and vanilla fragrances that were smoked in the smokestacks, creating an atmosphere of tenderness. That was all we needed because the important thing was that we had each other, and we were together, and forever. I knew that for sure. And Thunder knew it, too, as he told me between the caresses he gave me after our meal in bed. Isabella, so you will be my true wife. I, laughing, replied. I am your real wife. But then, doubt darkened my forehead, and I decided to ask. But what about Morgana? Amos announced yesterday that she's expecting a child with you. My voice dropped to a whisper as that memory returned me to reality. There is no child of hers, much less of mine. As you have already noticed, it must all be her intrigues, for which she has a special passion. That woman could not forgive me for leaving her feelings unanswered since, falling in love with you. Thunder replied. He sighed, not wanting to continue the topic. But I kept up with him. But I saw her belly. Even Amos believed her. Thunder sighed and replied. Don't you know it's easy to act pregnant in front of others? Put a pillow on your stomach, that's all. I think Morgana had a hand in my defeat in the battle with the vampires, and this time, the master vampire struck me down. That's how I ended up in the sarcophagus. I remember everything but could do nothing, as his magic spell was strong. If you had not come to my aid, they would have buried me alive, and for many hundreds of years, I would have suffered in my tomb, unable to get out of the sarcophagus. Your love broke that spell and brought me back to life. You saved my life, my Isabella. Thunder's voice trembled unaccustomedly as he spoke those words. There was still some feeling in me that something was left unaccounted for by me in defeating Thunder. Still, I just touched my hand to his hair and replied. I'm with you forever now, my love. Forever. I thought, looking at him. I can't change the past. But from now on, I will do everything I can to make my and Thunder's future bright, full of love, good friends, and family. Yes, family, I needed to introduce Thunder to my family, and I was going to do it with the help of magician Voldemar. I was already excited to imagine what it would be like to introduce the High Fae to people's lives, even in the metropolis where I lived. But it was still only in my plans. Now I was here, in the Fae world, with my beloved by my side. What else does a woman need from life? At this stage of life, nothing. Another thought flashed through my mind, still leaving a disturbing trail. What happens when Thunder and I have a child or even children? After all, it was prophesied that Thunder should marry and have children before he died. But I was sure that would not happen now because I had already dealt with his death once through the power of my love. Which meant I could handle the threat next time. I was sure of that. There was a cautious knock on the door. 
Thunder came from behind the screen, and I shouted without getting out of bed. Come in. Arsenia appeared in the doorway, and I was glad to see her again. She looked very well, a fresh, sturdy, and sensible girl who was always there for me when I needed the support of someone or a fay who was not involved in the Throne of Flames games. Arsenia was wearing a festive tunic that emphasized her figure. I had noticed even earlier that many of the fay men were looking at her. I knew nothing about whether there was love in her life. But I felt she was now the center of attention for many fay men, and perhaps, no longer just a servant but more my friend, she could find happiness and start a family. Even if I, a simple woman, even if with the heart of a salamander, by the power of my love, had coped with the oracle's prediction of Thunder's death and had achieved our happiness and love with him, Arsenia was worthy of the love not just of a fey man, but of a high fey. And I intended to do something in this direction, to make my friend's life take a different course. I wanted Arsenia to stop working as a maid and become my closest court lady if you can say that in the fey world. Now that my memory had returned, I was making direct correlations between the Fey world and the world of myths and tales of the pagans of medieval Europe and Britain. And it gave me confidence that I was realizing what kind of world I had fallen into. I promised myself that as soon as I was back in my world, I would go to the library and read everything I could find about the world of the so-called pagans. But that was all just in my mind. I talked to Arsenia for a while, and after asking her to take care of my clothes for tomorrow's celebration, which Thunder had thrown in honor of our reunion, I let her rest. The sunset and its parting rays streamed into our bedroom, illuminating it with multicolored specks of rays through the stained glass window. I stood up and walked to the window, unashamed that I was not wearing anything. Thunder got out of bed, too and came over to me and hugged me from behind, kissing the top of my head and stroking my hair. We stood like that, not saying a word, watching the sunset. The sun was setting, its disc hiding behind the slopes of the rocky mountains, in the direction where my favorite supreme fay and I had once bathed in a lake with a waterfall and confessed our first love to each other. We did not need to talk about anything. Our love spoke for us, our hearts pounding in unison, and our senses heightened to the limit. Everything about the other predictions, like our battle with the monsters, did not matter now. All that mattered was that we loved each other, loved each other so much that not even death could keep us apart. Whether it was my salamander heart or some different magic, I did not know. But the main thing was that thunder was with me that was all I wanted. We were alive and unharmed after the incredible ordeal we had been through. We, Thunder and I, were finally happy, and Aetheris had a future. The End The next book is Souls Release in 2024 and the next book is Hearts Release in 2024 Bonus Content Follow the new release updates and get your bonus content by subscribing to Misha's newsletter on the author's website. http colon slash slash www.mishaquin.com Welcome to Misha Quinn's world. Hi, this is Ella, or Isabella in the Fey world. My dear listener, my love adventures in the Fey world continue. I searched for traces of my past but found a new love. Our souls draw closer together, and the journey to love begins. Once, 
there was said to me. You expect too little from your life, my queen. You should know that your life is no less important than the lives of Thunder or Alaris. Will external and internal obstacles hinder me and Alaris, and will a burning guilt over a former love ruin our newly born mutual affection? If you want to know more, listen to the Throne of Flame series next story. Souls. Yeah. <laughs>